morning. Good morning, everyone. It's really a pleasure to see everyone here for this extraordinary gathering of talent and celebration of the great poet's work. You know, uh, when we think about what it means to be a land-grant university, very often people think about practical things like agriculture or computer science. But to me, what it means to be part of a land-grant university is to be part of the fabric of the society we live in and to contribute all of the talent and extraordinary insight that can be gathered to think about major issues of our day, of our time, of our past, and of our present. And I can't think of any more appropriate moment than this to be celebrating a great poet and the legacy that she left both for feminists, for people of color, for queer theory, in all these different dimensions, because these are the issues that very much are with us today. I was talking earlier this morning with colleagues about the great blow that was suffered in North Carolina yesterday and thinking about how all over the country we are seeing forms of intolerance grow and flourish in a very ugly soil that must continuously be exposed to the air and must continuously be examined from every conceivable angle, whether it's literary, political, social commentary, Whatever dimensions our colleagues here in the audience bring to this kind of critical inquiry, uh, there may well never have been a moment like the moment we're in uh, for reviving the concerns of our distinguished sisters from the past, from the 60s and 70s, because that past isn't really past. It is a present set of concerns in civil rights, in freedom, in all the things that I think of as absolutely inextricably linked to this valley, to this university, to its heritage, and to its present. One of the things that makes me most proud to be a leader in this university is the extraordinary quality of work done by all of my colleagues on the faculty, among the graduate students, among the undergraduates, among the staff, who are truly devoted to examining these issues and keeping them at the forefront of all of our thinking. I wish I had the opportunity to stay all day because I would much rather be here than where I have to go uh, in two minutes. Um, but I'm gonna try and come back at lunchtime at least to spend a little bit more time watching the film and hearing more from the filmmakers and, and getting a short chance to hear some of the panels. So please uh, excuse me for having to leave, but I do wanna welcome all of you and thank you for coming and thank all of the panelists and the organizers who put so much work into making this a success. I'm sure this is going to be an extraordinary edited volume at some point to commemorate uh, what has been gathered here today. So welcome, enjoy yourselves, and I look forward to seeing you later on today. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. Now please join me in welcoming Julie Hayes, Dean of the College of Humanities and Fire. Good morning. It's great to see so many people here, and I know there are going to be more and more as the day goes on. What, what a great event this is. Um, I'd like to start with the great word of Julie Jordan's poem for South African women. And who will join this standing up? And the ones who stood without sweet company will sing and sing back into the mountains and, if necessary, even under the sea. We are the ones we were waiting for. What an extraordinary poem, extraordinary words, and what a legacy. It is an incredible honor to be asked to come here and welcome you on behalf of the College of Humanities and Fine Arts and to reflect for just a moment on what this represents in the ongoing collaboration between two of our most vibrant departments, 
the W.D. Du Bois Department of African American Studies and the Department of Women's and Intersexuality Studies. These departments have a relationship that goes back to their founding over 40 years ago. They have actively supported each other from the beginning. One high point was a two-year development project in the early 1980s called Black Studies and Women's Studies, an overdue partnership, supported by the Fund for the Improvement of Post-Secondary Education, and from which came a number of new courses and more structured interaction between these two units. The second achievement was a two-day conference in 1987 on African American Women and the Vote, 1837 to 1965, which brought leading scholars of the history of black women to UMass. Now, June Jordan played a role in this history. She was a colleague and a comrade of many on this campus. In February 1985, she delivered what would become an extremely famous text, The Difficult Miracle of Black Poetry in America, which uh, was given to celebrate the Du Bois Library's acquisition of its two millionth volume a rare first edition of Phyllis Wheatley's poems on various subjects, religious and moral. And I, I'm told we had a close call in trying to hire her. Boy, I wish I'd been dean then. Uh, I would have worked on that one. Um, so that came close in the 1990s, but then she went on to establish the Poetry for the People program at UC Berkeley. She remained a good friend. After her passing in 2002, UMass hosts the tributes in 2002 and in 2004. She lives on in our hearts and our collective endeavor. Um, what a great day before us. Like Catherine, I have to express my regrets. I can't stay for it, and I too would rather be here than where I've got to go. Uh, but I will try to make it back during the day. And meanwhile, I, I wish you uh, wonderful interactions, great papers, great conversation with colleagues. So welcome to you next. John Bracey, good morning. Uh, with all the planning that goes on, and sometimes in the planning stage, you realize that you miss something. And that uh, in the rush to put together a program, sometimes you overlook the obvious. And this hit me with great force last night when Adrian Torf came to me. Adrian, please stand up. Uh, this was the first person that you should have asked to be on the table. Uh, Adrian, you two, better than everybody else in that room. Uh, Adrian's collaboration with you, in fact, it was called Collaboration. It's an amazing album. I think it's still available on Amazon and M3 and all those complicated things. Uh, but I was, I was feeling bad all night. As great as this program is, it would have been uh, much, much, much uh, enhanced with the presence of Adrian Torr. And so I think we should, you know, pay tribute to her. And she's here. She came to be here. She's among us. Uh, and we we'll hope she will participate in the discussions and bring her great insights about the life of uh, June Jordan. And I apologize for not having you on the program. Poetry is not a shopping list, a casual disquisition on the colors on the sky, a soporific daydream, or bumper sticker sloganeering. Poetry is a political action for the sake of information that truth-telling makes possible. Poetry means taking control of the language of your life. Good poems can interdict a suicide, rescue a love affair, and build a revolution in which speaking and listening to somebody becomes the first and last purpose to every social encounter. June Jordan, Poetry for the People, Movement. Good morning and welcome. My name is Mecca Jamila Sullivan, and I'm Assistant Professor of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies here at UMass Amherst. On behalf of the WGSS 
and Dobin E. B. Du Bois Department of Afro American Studies here at UMass. I am delighted to welcome you to Feminist Poetics Legacies of Jim Jordan. We are so, so happy to have you here. We're looking forward to a rich day of thought, art, information, exchange, and action, inspired by the legacies of poet, educator, and activist Jim Jordan. Today we bring together a group of Sajos artists and activists from across genres and generations, all joined by shared commitments to what the Kambahi River Collective calls the quote, integrated analysis and practice of black feminist thought and world making. There are many, many people to thank for their roles in making this day possible. Listening to this long list of groups and individuals who brought us here gives a sense of the scope of this event, the reach of Jordan's work, and the range of voices invested in the work we're doing today. We are grateful to our co-sponsors here at UMass, UMass Advocacy, Inclusion and Support Programs, Center for Multi Multicultural Advancement and Student Success, the Center for Latin American, Caribbean, and Latino Studies, the Chancellor's Office, the College of Humanities and Fine Arts, the Department of Anthropology, the Department of Communication, the Department of English, the Department of History, the Department of Journalism, the Department of Theater, the Interdisciplinary Studies Institute, Social Thought and Political, Political Economy Program, University Relations, and Women for UMass Amherst. We are also, we are also extremely grateful to our co-sponsors in the five colleges, Africana Studies at Mount Holyoke College, Black Studies at Amherst College, the Dean of Students at Mount Holyoke College, Feminist Studies at Hampshire College, the Five College Women's Studies Resource Center, Five Colleges Incorporated, Gender Studies Mount Holyoke College, the Office of the Provost and Dean of the Faculty at Smith College, the Gender Sexuality, the Sexuality Women's and Gender Studies at Amherst College, and the Center of the Study of Women and Gender at Smith College. We offer special thanks to our fantastic graduate and undergraduate student volunteers, our photographer, Nidia Castro, and all others who have offered their time and energy to make this happen. We want to take this opportunity to remind you that this event is being streamed and your attendance here confirms your consent to be recorded. The streaming recording will be available at our symposium website, which is feministpoetics.blogspot.com, which is also linked to the Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies and Afro American Studies website. We encourage you to tweet throughout the day using hashtag feministpoeticsunite. Now, I'd like to invite our first round of panelists to, to come up to the stage as we get started and stay on time, miraculously. As the first set of panelists comes up, I'll go ahead and, and introduce the panelists themselves. This panel is titled, Long Is Not My Name, Writing Feminist Activism in 2016. I'll introduce the panel's moderator, Jennifer Dupree. Jennifer is assistant professor in her first year Program for the Study of Women and Gender at Smith College. Professor Dupree's research focuses on queer study, black feminism, and visual culture. She serves as Smith's representative on the five college queer and sexuality studies in the Her research of representations of black queer sexuality in HBO's and Wire has been published in Spectator. Her analysis of DBC's film Pariah is forthcoming in Sisters in Pariah, 25 Years of Out African American Lesbian Media. Edited by Yvonne Morgan and Alex Schwartz. For discussion of Black Queer Erotica, with special attention paid to Cheryl Dumier's poem, Megan's Mommy is Coming, appears in No Tea, No Shade, New Writers in Black Queer Studies, edited by E. Patrick Johnson. In addition to her academic work, Professor Dupree has worked as a film photographer for the Outfest Film Festival in Los Angeles. Please join me in welcoming Jennifer Dupree, and thank you so much for Garza is an organizer, writer, and freedom dreamer living and working in Oakland, California, 
She is the Special Projects Director for the National Domestic Workers Alliance, the, the nation's leading voice for dignity and fairness for the millions of domestic workers in the United States, most of whom are women. She's also the co-creator of Black Lives Matter, a national organizing project focused on combating anti-black state sanctioned violence. Alicia's work challenges us to celebrate the contributions of Black queer women's work within popular narratives of Black women and reminds us that the Black radical tradition is long, complex, and international. Her activism reflects organizational strategies and visions that connect emerging social movements without diminishing the specificity of the structural violence facing Black lives. She's been working, she's been the recipient of numerous awards for her organizing work, including the Reef 100 2015, List of African American Achievers and Influencers between the ages of 25 and 45, and was featured in the Political 50 Guide to the, to the Thinkers, Doers, and Visionaries Transforming American Politics in 2015. Samia Bashir's books of poetry, Field Theories, which is forthcoming, Gospel and Where the Apple Falls, and Anthologies, Roll Call, A Generational Anthology of Social and Political Black Literature and Art, and Black Women's Erotica II, exist. Sometimes she makes poems of dirt, sometimes zeros and ones, sometimes variously rendered text, sometimes light. While studying with June Jordan and Poetry for the People, Bashir was named University of California Poet Laureate. She's a founding organizer of Fire and Ink, an advocacy organization and festival for LGBT writers of African descent, and has received numerous awards, grants, fellowships, and residencies, including the Aquarius Press Legacy Award, given recognition of women writers of color who acted in the creative opportunities for others. She lives in Portland, Oregon, with a magic cat who shares her obsessions with trees and blackberries and occasionally crafts to cats. What's the word for that last year? Nadia Ahmed is a Palestinian community academic writer. She holds a master's degree in creative literature from Rutgers University. She is currently a PhD student at the WEB Du Bois Department of Afro American Studies at UMass. Her research is on history, politics, culture, and literature of Black America and Palestine, and the connections between them. She's also interested in Slavic and Soviet Russian history and literature how it impacted African American literature and radical thought. Jackson is on the faculty of the College of Education at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Central to her work are arts informed socio cultural approaches that examine issues of literacy and equity from a racially, culturally, and linguistically minoritized view. She's the author of Youth Poets, Empowering Literacies in and Out of Schools, and editor of Cultural Transformations, Youth pedagogies of possibility. Other publications are Creative Curriculum Inquiry, Creative Communication, and Data Data Dayless. Dr. Jackson received her PhD in education with an emphasis on language, literacy, and culture from the University of California, Berkeley, and completed a postdoctoral fellowship at Stanford University School of Education. She served in June Jordan's Poetry for the People program at the university and across school community programs for several years. And our Panelist Lisa Seymour is the founder and editor of Redbone Press, which publishes work that celebrates the culture of black lesbians and gay men and further promotes understanding between black gays and lesbians and the black mainstream. Moore has two bachelor's degrees in accounting from Louisiana State University and journalism from Georgia State University, and she has a master's in anthropology from the University of Texas at Austin. A former editor of Lambda Book Report. Moore has judged numerous literary awards and speaks at conferences, colleges, and universities about okay. black gay lesbian publishing. Moore is board president of Fire and Ink, an advocacy organization for GLBTQ writers of African descent. This is our panel. So when I learned that these phenomenal women were coming together to comprise this panel today, June Jordan's poem, Moving Towards Home, came to mind, especially Jordan's invocation of living room in that piece in which she declares that I need, I need to speak about living room or my children will grow without horror. And she says, I need to talk sure about living room where I can sit without grief, without wailing aloud for my loved okay. ones. So the work, the words, the vulnerability, the strength of each of the visionaries on this panel 
living room for us, living room for us to contribute to the space-making project of loving and protecting and bringing into being black life. The living room that is made through the unwavering commitment to demanding that the vitality of black life be recognized, understood, and respected. That black life is life that matters. That black thought is thought worth writing, citing, printing, and reading. That from this space and position, black women and women of color produce a politics, a force that is unstoppable, that is uncomfortable, that exposes, that agitates, that revolutionizes, that is present in this room, that is part of a legacy that issues forth with absolute certainty that wrong will be named and that wrong is not our name. The title of our panel comes from Jim Jordan's poem entitled, Poem About My Rights. And after consulting with the group, this is um, suggested um, that a poem, that this poem should be brought into our, our panel. So as a way to bring June Jordan's voice into the space and as a way to open up the panel this morning, I'd like to play a recording of June Jordan reading poem about my rights. Alone not being the point. The point being that I can't do what I want to do with my own body because I am my rights. Even tonight, when I need to take a walk and clear my head about this poem about why I can't go out without changing my clothes, my shoes, my body posture, my gender identity, my age, my status as a woman alone in the evening, alone on the streets, alone not being the point. The point being that I can't do what I want to do with my own body. Because I am the wrong sex, the wrong age, the wrong skin. And suppose it was not here in the city, but down on the beach, or far into the woods, and I wanted to go there by myself, thinking about God, or thinking about children, or thinking about the world, all of it disclosed by the stars and the silence. I could not go, and I could not think, and I could not stay there alone, as I need to be alone, because I can't do what I want to do with my own body, and who in the hell set things up like this? And at first they said, if the guy penetrates but does not ejaculate, then he did not rape me. And if after stabbing him, if after screams, if after begging the bastard, and if even after smashing a hammer to his head, if even after that, if he and his buddies fucked me after that, then I consented and there was no rape, because finally you understand. Finally they fucked me only because I was wrong. I was wrong again to be me being me where I was, wrong to be who I am, which is exactly like South Africa penetrating into Namibia, penetrating into Angola. And does that mean, I mean, how do you know if Pretoria ejaculates? What will the evidence look like? The proof of the monster jackboot ejaculation on black line? And if after Namibia, and if after Angola, and if after Zimbabwe, and if after all of my kinsmen and women resist, even to self-immolation of the villages, and if after that we lose nevertheless, what will the big boys say? Will they claim my consent? Do you follow me? We are the wrong people of the wrong skin on the wrong continent, and what in the hell is everybody being reasonable about? <clears throat> and according to the Times this week, the CIA decided that they had this problem, and the problem was, a man named Nkrumah, so they killed him. And before that, it was Patrice Lumumba. And before that, it was my father on the campus of my Ivy League school, and my father afraid to walk into the cafeteria because he said he was wrong. The wrong age, the wrong skin, the wrong gender identity, and he was paying my tuition. And before that, it was my father saying I was wrong. 
saying that I should have been a boy because he wanted one, a boy. And that I should have been lighter skin, and that I should have had straighter hair, and that I should not be so boy crazy, but instead I should just be one, a boy. And before that, it was my mother pleading plastic surgery for my nose and braces for my teeth, and telling me to let the books loose, to let them loose, in other words, I am very familiar with the problems of the CIA and the problems of South Africa and the problems of Exxon Corporation and the problems of white America in general and the problems of the teachers and the preachers and the FBI and the social workers and my particular mom and dad. I am very familiar with the problems because the problems turn out to be me. I am the history of rape. I am the history of the rejection of who I am. I am the history of the terrorized incarceration of myself. I am the history of battery assaults and limitless armies against whatever I want to do with my mind and my body and my soul. And whether it's about walking out at night, or whether it's about the love that I feel, or whether it's about the sanctity of my vagina, or the sanctity of my national boundaries, or the sanctity of my leaders, or the sanctity of each and every desire that I know from my personal and idiosyncratic and indisputably single and singular heart, I have been raped because I have been wrong. The wrong sex, the wrong age, the wrong skin, the wrong nose, the wrong hair, the wrong need, the wrong dream, the wrong geographic, the wrong sartorial. I, I have been the meaning of rape. I have been the problem everyone seeks to eliminate by forced penetration with or without the evidence of slime. And but let this be unmistakable, this poem is not consent. I do not consent to my mother, to my father, to the teachers, to the FBI, to South Africa, to Bedford Stuyvesant, to Park Avenue, to American Airlines, to the hard-on idlers on the corners, to the sneaky creeps in cars. I am not wrong. Wrong is not my name. My name is my own. My own, my own. And I can't tell you who the hell set things up like this, but I can tell you that from now on, my resistance, my simple and daily and nightly self-determination may very well cost you your life. Somebody blew up a mirror. so much I want to say, and I got 10 minutes on the self-regulate. Uh, it was incredible to hear that poem this morning. It is one that I actually have the last nine lines of tattooed on my chest because that idea that wrong is not my name is really integral to uh, the, the conception and the practice of what we call Black Lives Matter. Oftentimes, what we hear about Black Lives Matter is that it is a movement to save the lives of Black men. And while that is in part true, it is very much more so a movement to save all of our lives. And it is a movement that aims to expand the notion of whose life is valuable inside and outside of Black communities. It has forced a conversation in our own community about whose life is valuable. Is it simply the lives of cisgender black men? Or are black women, black queer people, black trans people, black gender non-conforming people essential and integral to a vision for freedom that is finally transformative? A vision for freedom that acknowledges that there is no freedom without black women, without black trans people, without black gender non-conforming people, without the allowance of black people to be exactly who we are and who we want to be 
whenever we want to be it. We start from an assumption that black women have given us life and that it is black women over and over again who have continuously saved our lives. And when we see the activity that's happening around us, not just here in the United States, but all over the world, we understand that it is very much spearheaded by black women, black queer people, black trans people, black people who have been left out of popular narratives of what it means to get free. In preparing my comments for this morning, I was thinking about the role that art and culture and literature and poetry in particular have played in my own life and how that may have shaped the moment when we articulated that black life deserved to be protected. One of my earliest memories is asking my mother about a poster that was in my home that was a poster for Ntozake Shange's For Colored Girls who have considered suicide when the rainbow is enough. I remember asking my mother, Mom, what is that? I understand, what is this? What is this? And she said, this is what it means to be a black woman in this world. And I didn't understand that, I was four. And I think I'm starting to get to understand it a little bit more. <coughs> It is art, it is culture, it is poetry that allows us to articulate, to be bold and courageous in our practice of what freedom can look like every single day of our lives. It is the marriage, the non-patriarchal marriage. <laughs> It is the marriage of art and culture to activism and organizing and resistance and struggle that allows us to re-engage, to reprioritize, to reimagine what a new transformative vision for freedom can look like every single day of our lives. It is the ability for us to be able to live in our skins unapologetically. What we know about Black Lives Matter, what we know about the relationship between art and culture and movement is that it politicizes us. It engages us and educates us in ways that we don't find in history books or textbooks, at least not immediately. It is June Jordan's work and her work with Poetry for the People that has engaged and inspired generations, not just young people, but of everyone, to understand the relationship between Black people all over this world. It was her work that introduced me to the idea, the practice of internationalism. When I first read that poem, I thought, what does she mean about South Africa? What are these connections that she's making? And what does that mean for my own life? When I first read that piece, it encouraged me to look at feminism in a different way. So the feminism that I was taught, that I learned, was a feminism that didn't look like me. It was a feminism that didn't include me. It was a feminism that merely uh, advocated, and sometimes continues to advocate for more women at the top, more CEOs who are women, more women in positions of power without transforming power itself. And it is art and culture and it's non-patriarchal marriage to activism and organizing 
that allows us to continue to articulate through our practice an anti-capitalist, pro-internationalist, anti-imperialist vision for who we can be today. When Jun says, wrong is not my name, we reply, we agree, wrong is not our names. Black Lives Matter is a living embodiment of how we can expand the sanctity of Black life and Black humanity, not just to all Black people, but to all of us. And when we hear those familiar retorts that begin with all lives matter, or blue lives matter, or I just don't see color at all, I just don't mind if you're purple or green or polka dotted, it just doesn't matter. Then the contours of the struggle that we're engaged in become much clearer, don't they? If we actually believe that all lives matter, what is the problem with asserting that black lives matter too? And if we shift and are uncomfortable in that principle, then what we remember is that we still live in a world that we see through the gaze of the most powerful. If we are able to say that blue lives matter in response to a cry for the sanctity and dignity of our lives, then it shows us that we have lots of work to do to reimagine safety, security, relationship, and interconnectedness beyond punishment and retribution. And if we start to get uncomfortable even seeing each other by responding to the demand that Black Lives Matter, well, I just don't see color. And we recognize there are no purple people, there are no green people, there are no polka dotted people, there's just us. And we want to be seen. We demand to be seen. And it has been the relationship of various methods of communicating that vision, that demand, those principles that have allowed this movement to saturate into the very fabric of our nation. That nation that was built off the backs of enslaved black labor, genocide of indigenous peoples, and the theft of their land and culture. I'll end my comments. I wasn't totally sure that there would be a, a reading this morning, but I will end my comments with June's last nine lines. Because they were repeated. I am not wrong. Wrong is not my name. My name is my own, my own, my own. And I can't tell you who the hell set things up like this, but I can tell you that from now on, my resistance, my simple and daily and nightly self-determination may very well cost you your life. Two deep breaths. Okay. 
start the code indication. Get fever name. And skip left home. Skip left. Smiled. 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 Yeah. Yeah. I realized recently that I haven't written the real bit about June since her death. I had a lot of thoughts about why this piece wrote me a talk, a poem, a book, a mixtape. It was tough for me to get a handle on. I had my first assaultive answer. And then finally, my second embodied truth of an answer. First answer, shame and guilt. Diving back in and through June's work, not a poem here or an essay there, but bathing myself in it. Book after book after book, then video after video, getting her voice back into my head, her smile, that laugh that honestly has never left me, can never leave me. It's been healing and opening as ever and again. A reminder. So, yeah, naturally, my egotistical mind, trained so exhaustively by this brutal culture, left to where I must be found wanting. Sitting in this horrid electoral landscape. And what shame-faced mirror have I held up to the devil of it all? Well, I am discovering my own shameful functions, Jude wrote, as part of the problem, at least. I no longer think they are this or that, but rather we or I am not doing enough, for instance, or I have not done my homework, and so on. And it's true. And it will likely always be true, and yet, don't be so hard on yourself, too. Right? The Kambahi River Collective Statement, thank you, Rebecca, for sliding this right hand that I can write. Reminds us, too, that the psychological toll of being a black woman and the difficulties this work presents in reaching political consciousness and doing political work can never be underestimated. There is a very low value placed upon black women's psyches in this society. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then also recognize I do work. On good days, I trust my work. And rarely do I question its necessity. Finally. We realize the mind of the collective that the only people who care enough about us to work consistency for our liberation are us. Us. As I say. Now, what are you waiting for? Bath drawn, coffee warm, eggs scrambled, poached, and fried over easy. The baby has been fed, changed, oiled, Powder, sung to, read to, put to bed, lawn mowed, homework done, living room tidy, floors mopped, tabletops dusted. Second answer. Good. It's been nearly 14 years since we lost June Gordon's body and her mommy her laughter on this earth, and I had to contend here with the fact that I had not yet fully processed my grief, fully moved through my life. For 14 years, every time I speak of her, teach her work, and hear a mistyped touch and mean it, see her, picture. I do so through a hurt in my solar plexus, through a film of fought back tears, even before a class full of students. But many of us here, it just is. It just hurts. In 
give her introduction to some of us did not die, she wrote. But we have choices. And capitulation is only one of them. She wrote, what kind of savagery blurred or blocked or buried alive? She asks, what about women? What about women? What about women? And it becomes clear that this has become a mixtape of mourning and movement. What about women? From the revolution. Generations of river folk and rain travelers make do with what I have now. No high coax, packing animals to sit, wait, share their load, bring mud, bring clay from place to place, we build, we rest, we stay at home. Five thousand aunties keep love, five uncles teach a world of kin, tuck rifles and gin into belts strapped tight for flight, but when we leave, we don't. Flight. Part of sitting in my grief even now is contending with that 21-year-old girl who popped her life clutch and screeched them into the new direction to find Jim of Barry Murphy, to learn from her, to hope to become a woman worthy of being her apprentice, that woman who couldn't, that woman who couldn't be making this work now without the life Jim provided, but also the hard grip she erected against which all these feelings could had to resist. In an interview about her family, I can mention the freakish. Yes, it never ceases to shock me, and then I must pinch myself because the verb feels on my tongue the same as when white neighbors and colleagues express their shock, their disbelief at yet another police killing of one of me. So, no, not shock. Reminder of this brutal culture. Invisibility imposed upon June and her work. This insistence on her erasure. For weeks now, random people have somehow gotten out of me. Not exactly in chatty to me. But I was coming here to Amherst soon, and for what? And for who? Blank faces of, oh yeah, I have a little bit of work somewhere. I've written her name on napkins and receipts and legalized weed stickers over and over for strangers these last weeks who, having heard who she is, why we are gathering, insist they want to dig around and learn more. Yes, do the homework. And here, I scratch the letter, scratch the letter, scratch the letter. In an essay about the Chinese poetic form, Tong, Zhu referred to herself as a captive of the English language. Uh, what we captives do, what we alter, what we build. But I digress into blackness as often as. Um, is a poetic form whose language allows it no gender, no pronoun, no past, no future tense, no inflections or verbs, no plural case, no prepositions, no definite or indefinite articles, a fixed end rhyme scheme, a fixed number of lines for all stressed syllables. Again, here's the language. It's similar to the chazal, another Eastern form of Americans love to butcher throughout our rules of higher education. It's a cooperative experience intended to be heard and sung aloud, never simply written in silently absorbed an event to quote him. A captain with the English language. One thing I recall so warmly about my time as a student, the student teacher poet, she held her power surely and also taught us what it meant and then shared it with poetry for the people. It was just this kind of excitement around exploring what language, what form, what the sound and music of poetry can do. In a recent interview for a publication edited by yet another old friend of Jim's, and someday I may tell you about the deep gift she gave me, sometimes knowing, sometimes not, of her friends and loved ones who have become my friends, my loved ones, my family. What gifts? What forever gifts? I was called to speak on a series of poems in one reprint that recast the legend of John Henry. It shifts the light, the focus onto his wife, Polly Ann, who legend tells us after he died, picked up the hammer and swung it like a man. The poems, 15 sonnets linked together in an interwoven dialect of dramatic monologue are called pornography. The form itself masters raw tools set with the finger flip, the fire and beaten and blacksmith that to the implement I needed serves as a coronavirus. 
John Henry's perspective, even his poems is overwhelmed, overpowering, close up, hot and large compared to Pollyanne, at least in the beginning. He is legend in the common imagination. And she is the But the photograph I've made set itself to the task of progressively eclipsing the direct, blinding light of that legend so you may see all that stands alongside it, <coughs> it, in front of it, beside the glare of tall tale, real lives are at stake. Pollyanne's life is real. Her concerns are real, pedestrian seeming even at first. But that's life. One finds fewer songs written about the moments after the batch. After life, about life after loss, about not shall overcome, but overcoming. In this final sonnet in the series, broken into bits as it is, each of the previous working opening lines become hers. Pollyanne comes back. I can tell our futures too. Listen. We weren't born to cry, I swear. But we'll still stand hungry when we're dead while the man says, lift and go. Lift. And maybe if it feels like shaking and sounds like stones, hit it. We'll steal away, stone quick from the sticks to whatever it is we're meant for. We'll swing too long. Fear too much, too long. Let loose them germs blowing past like me here, living. And it'll be in a trip, the best year. And when the call is crazy, but we'll fly through all their dusty screens and we'll drill our last bits. They'll watch, but they won't see. Not us. Climbing <coughs> this pitch. Black. Yeah. In general, June writes in her essay for my American family, the very word immigrant connotes somebody white, while alien connotes everybody else. Who are you? Yes, you. Who are you? Mm-hmm. An empire will have us going around and around in that loop until we forgot where we started. Again, we have choices. The capitulation is only one of them. What about me? What about remembering the spirit of resistance, as June points out? One, it feels terrific. Two, it knows it will prevail. Three, it's immune to enemy assessment. Four, it advocates for one's life, one's soul. Five, it's basically an ultimately collective. Six and seven, it feels terrific. So now it's clear that this mixtape has whittled itself down to a conversation with her essays. Full disclosure, the poems still bring me to tears. Wonderful black women, luminescent and homely. <laughs> In the context of tragedy, she wrote in Civil Wars, all polite behavior is a form of self-denial. In denying my access to grief, my ability to mourn, what have I protested? In politely wiping my tears and turning the page, reading on, stealing myself for the day, well, then what? What is this arms-length relationship to grief, this allergy to the vulnerability of it, blurred or blocked or buried or laid in a We don't have time for all that. But I will say, but this takes us to the work I'm trying to do. Some of it, including the poem I just shared, and the one which I'll close here, goes from my forthcoming book, Field Theories. And I say with just that question, both aggressively and patiently, directly and directly. I guess. It was my destiny to live. June quotes Auschwitz survivor and goods. But life itself compels an optimism. Still later, she asked the question that led me to the beginning, to where I could somehow sit down and begin. And what shall we do? We who did not die. What shall we do? How shall we grieve and cry out loud and face down despair? What is Bruce to do when Naomi finally must be 
Keep going. Keep going. You don't have to pump the brakes. Keep it close. You don't have to do this place and we exist for a moment, minute or two with our classic hits stations and our marshmallows on roars and flags and television and shit. Coke bottles falling from the sky to an old man's village and the white people just laugh and laugh and line up to pay and laugh and get paid and laugh. That's what they make. Don't clean it up. This is the world spinning. It's circled in the vast dark and this is us arguing the same shit on a new machine. Faster. The world stays unstable and <coughs> We work all day to excess and for what? What will we make of it? Try to recall the red crest of a robin's breast in springtime. Springtime. When we fight our machines with our machines through our machines. It's the thought that hurts. When we stand one hand airborne, one finger on play. When we pump the volume up against the goddamn bird song. She even got a breast production, my friend said. That's how stupid she was, my friend said. And then brought the scene of one of the upcats wanting to be. But this is the world spinning in a vast dark. Not any of the million spots we see in the night sky, but the one we can't. Russell rushing to the serenity shop and fighting and hiding and crying and eating in our cars with our volume pumped against the bird song. We are animals. We need orgasm regularly. Now, even that lies just out of reach, hostage to the ding of our nearby cells, a poke, a text, a like, a love, a comment. Well done. Ah! 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 Egg for the unfettered journey. Well, yeah. Namaste, the map says. Kill people, kill people, it says. Chop, disbelief, wildly darting eyes, seeing the child. Look steady with me. Trust me. Really take it. Um, I'd like to start with thank yous and being humbled to be here today. Um, I had an opportunity to sit among these outstanding women and talk to you. Um, I think the first and most important point that I would like to emphasize is that the history of black activism for Palestine is over half a century long. And that history has been silenced in very multiple ways, and I've been working really hard, and I'm not the only one to resurrect and to acknowledge that history, because um, black people paid a really, really high price for being one of the first mar marginalized groups in the world to speak out for Palestinians and Palestine. For example, Andrew Young, who was the first African-American ambassador to the UN, was fired for a mere 20-minute meeting with a PLO representative and incited outrage in African-American community. Um, Black World or Negro Digest, which was a really prolific, extremely important publication, um, Black Arts and Black Power publication, was shut down. Funding was completely withdrawn because of one pro-Palestinian um, article written by Hope Hoyt Fuller. Uh, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee lost um, almost all of their uh, Jewish supporters and Jewish activists during the civil rights um, and lost all of the funding after publishing um, an article exposing Israeli war crimes and human rights violations. Um, a lot of activists and a lot of historians of the era actually cite that uh, SNCC publication as one of the crucial reasons why um, uh, Jewish community and Jewish members of civil rights withdrew um, 
from the civil rights movement, thus propelling the civil rights movement into the black power era. Um, June Jordan herself got introduced, um, she was always aware and to one extent or the other, but she was really kind of awakened to the plight of Palestinian people, ironically, or not so ironically, by an Israeli friend and a fellow poet in a really pivotal moment um, in 1982 in the wake of uh, the Sabra and Shatila massacre. Um, in 1982, where over 2,000 Palestinian refugees were um, slaughtered um, in cold blood. And she was really shaken by the event and she even, um, she organized a poetry reading. Um, she organized a space similar possibly to this one where um, Israeli and Palestinian poets and allies and supporters could come together and read poetry to try to heal the trauma that was brought on by that event. Um, you know, reading her essays, different collections of essays, has been really interesting because I basically read every essay that mentioned the word Palestine in it. And not one collection of essay of hers um, excludes an essay dedicated to Palestinian people or Palestinian refugees in Lebanon. It's really interesting, it was really interesting reading because Palestine and Palestinians became, if you may, um, a prism through which she viewed the world. So even when she talked about the violation of human rights in South African apartheid, there was always Palestine. When June Jordan talked about um, Cuba or um, Salvador, there was always Palestine right next to it. Um, the word intifada, interestingly, which, which is the Arabic word for uprising, the Palestinian uprising, um, entered her vocabulary really extensively. And even when she wrote her essay titled Intifada USA, she used that kind of um, the kind of prism, the history of Palestinian resistance and Palestinian struggle to talk about social change in the United States. Um, interestingly, when um, in her essays, even um, her essay about um, her reflection on um, Jesse Jackson's famous or infamous presidential campaign, when she evaluates the significance of um, his potential presidency and significance of uh, his campaign itself, she um, praises him highly, not even for, for being the first African-American person to run for presidency, to run a presidential campaign. She praises him for acknowledging um, Palestinians and Palestinian plight and for urging for Palestinian statehood and Palestinian determination. Um, a few, kind of a few of her poems that are dedicated to Palestine, which are kind of scattered over her different, it's, it's really hard to make a whole list because it kind of Palestine and Palestinian, Palestinian refugees, those matters come up. In most of her po poetry, um, social change and historical change and political change and empowerment, but some of them are um, Intifada, Incantation Number 8, to sing a song of, on Palestine, and of course, um, Moving Towards Home. Um, one of her most, I believe, one of her most kind of prominent poems that was read today briefly. And I would like to read the last stanza of this poem. Uh, and this is, once again, this is written as her kind of, I want to say, awakening to Palestine, and the plight of Palestinians happens in the wake of um, Sabra and Chitila massacre. She says, I was born a black woman, and now I am become a Palestinian. Against the relentless laughter, laughter of evil, there is less and less living room. And where are my loved ones? Is it time to make our way home? It's a really, it's a really, really striking, extraordinarily striking poem written with really kind of blunt imagery, really cool imagery. And somebody mentioned before the idea of um, poetry as a, a source of information. And it was really significant because the facts and the images of that poem are actually not just a mere aesthetic creation, it's a reflection of the actual events of the massacre. 
and that information was not found in most, absolute majority of um, Western um, media outlets. And she even writes an essay um, called uh, Live After Lebanon, talking about specifically about the Southern Chitila massacre. And while, like I mentioned, most um, media outlets, especially in the United States, completely marginalized the event, or it was mentioned in passing, June Jordan actually puts, puts it on the forefront of world politics and kind of positions it as a, as a stepping stone, as an important part um, of world history and world politics and urges for um, world change internationally. Um, and, but to go back to the poem, it's extremely significant to me because I believe that, you know, these lines, I was born a black woman and now I have become a Palestinian. I believe that June Jordan should be credited with the introduction of discourse that racialized Palestinians, that began recognizing Palestinians as people of color, as a mar marginalized group. Um, and only in the past few years, people started theorizing coming and coming out with ideas, thoughts, and books on this matter. But I believe, you know, that June Jordan in 1982 kind of professed that and recognized that before anybody else. And that is ex extremely important. She recognized it two decades before 9-11 happened, before the, you know, prison industrial um, complex started and kind of began to be widely discussed in academia. This poem was also a pivotal point for a Palestinian-American poet named Tamer Hamad, who I believe should be recognized as the most kind of prolific living Palestinian, not just Palestinian-American, Palestinian poet. And she, she wrote in 1996, her first, her very first book was titled One Palestinian, One Black. And she always cites June Jordan, along with Malcolm X, along with Palestinian poets like Mahmoud Darwish and Fadwa Tukhan, as her political and poetic inspirations. Uh, she wrote, in fact, um, Tuer Hamad wrote um, about her experience reading um, moving towards home for the first time. And she says, the last time stanza in June Jordan moving towards home changed my life. I remember feeling validated by her statement. She dares speak of transformation, of rebirth, of a deep understanding of humanity, the essence of being spirit, something no label could touch. And I offer no conclusions, but I would like to read just two lines of concluding lines um, from her essay from um, Affirmative Acts, where she says, June Jordan says, at night, I go to bed afraid to close my eyes or sleep. I ask my soul these questions aching on my consciousness. What will happen to that little girl, that child of Palestine? What is happening to you and me? Thank you. So what is feminist poetics without poems and more poems? So from orgasmic poetry revolution to uh, what I would like to present today, uh, I'd like to begin with a love poem and end with one. There is no chance that we will fall apart. There is no chance. There are no parts. This is a poem from the 1994 poem called Love Good morning, my name is Karina Moksan. I am Kinai, a Filipino American in the Philippine Islands. I've um, lived in California for some time. As I do in public events, I would like to first acknowledge that as a land grant institution, we are in uh, indigenous Moritok lands, and I uh, speak with you today as a guest on these lands. It's really an honor and a privilege to be here with such a few um, I'd like to 
like to thank Dr. Gracie and Dr. Shabazz for the invitation to participate. Um, of course, the, the a lot of names in the region, particularly the Department of um, African American Studies and the Department of Women and Gender and Sexuality Studies for this amazing event. Isn't this amazing? Of course, to Mecca Sullivan for all the weeks and years of organizing this event. Um, so now in remembering and celebrating the legacies of June Jordan, uh, I was thinking, you know, as I prepared for today's panel, I thought it's appropriate to go back to an earlier piece of writing that really captured a significant moment for me. And the experience, uh, really that moment, continues to shape the very thing that I do today, the ways in which I engage um, in what I think is valuable work um, in education and, and, and in particular um, K-12 uh, and, and in higher education. And I, I think some of my students are here. Um, so I'd like to share that moment with you. For years, I have looked to prominent poets such as Langston Hughes, Maya Angelou, Adrian Rich, Pablo Neruda, Jessica Hagedorn, and Sandra Cisneros for inspiration. Who knew that what began as an experimental outlet in my adolescent years would transform my whole perspective on poetry and thus my outlook on life? My passion for poetry became a resource for the kinds of teaching um, and teaching arts that I proceeded to engage in later years. I was very much influenced by critical pedagogues poets and writers and artists uh, in doing this work. And my praxis focused on the needs of, of young people, particularly high school students. So I pushed myself as a novice teacher to actively bring about change in my classroom through pedagogy and social actions. Though the list was short of being comprehensive, I used multicultural works by various poets and other writers to form the basis of critical discussion and production of student work. I noticed that in these high school English classes, students and I were able to tease apart themes and related to our histories, cultures, and experiences. And soon after my arrival at UC Berkeley, <laughs> as a graduate student, I was easily drawn to the Poetry for the People program and its mission to serve historically marginalized populations. Even though the poets mentioned above had already had effects on me, it was another poet who helped me to envision different possibilities of poetry in young people's lives. Her name was June Jordan. For many, June Jordan was a walking political act. Someone with an air of brilliance to whom poetry for the people on the university campus is credited. She was a professor in the African American Studies Department and the leading force in fighting for human rights. Jordan lived and breathed for the people. She imagined, demanded, and fought for equality like no other petite, she called herself, slim lady, you know, actors. Um, could. So she spoke against hate, censorship, and acts of counterintelligence in renowned newspapers and journals such as York Times, The Nation, and The Progressive. Though at times censored herself, Jordan authored numerous books from poetry to essays and other far too many to mention here. And in 1999, I had the chance to meet her beyond text. I became first a student and later a student teacher poet, teaching and facilitating writing workshops at different locations with a cadre of other activists in the poetry program. Those locations included uh, not just the university, but also a nearby high school, um, San Francisco's Glide Memorial Church, and also San Quentin um, State Penitentiary. So over the course of three years, through my involvement with P4P, P, I learned from Jordan herself what it meant to write, to use words as weapons, to use words as a form of action in changing the world, or at least in 
I also learned how to be a more conscious human being by giving back and investing in the fight for justice. The irony in the story, however, is that never once did I imagine such a warrior would grace my life. In June 2003, Jordan passed away without my personally acknowledging the strength her presence had in my life. I was in Los Angeles visiting my family when I received that devastating phone call. So for weeks, I couldn't stop thinking about the times of not letting June know what and how much she meant in my life. And so I realized that I had to do something. I wanted to have a chance to impress upon her symbolically the kind of woman, soldier, revolutionary and humanitarian she was. In a sense, I wanted to use this moment of vulnerability as a form of motivation to craft a second chance. And so I started to write this poem that became um, a much longer poem. And eventually, uh, in 2003, I, uh, I based a video poem on that, and the video poem was, was featured at the Women of Color Film Festival at Berkeley. And so today, I revisit this poem and actually have revised it since. And I remember sitting in, in class, and you know, she has such an infectious laugh. Do you remember that laugh? And we were talking about love poems. And we all just stopped when she started to speak about what love is. In short, she noted the endless fight, the necessary fight, and continued struggle alongside people to gain rights, equal rights, and justice. She said, I remember this vividly. Love is about revolution, and revolution is about love. So I went on and wrote 14 reasons, and this is a revised version. One, you enchant me with simple words that form complex actions, because actions have meaning, and meaning saves lives, like you have saved mine. Two, you inspire me with everyday passion to change the world as if you own it and have no intentions of selling out to the highest spirit. Three, you galvanize me to explore every thought of every child every time she, they ask a question, pick up a pen, or read a book. Four, you paint me selfless visions of a raceless and classless society all genders, languages, across generations. You got me speaking in tongues. I am a home, Baha, Gandana, Baha, Nagin. We have beautiful house. Five, you embrace me with your tattooed arms so, so tight, never wanting to, not ever wanting to let go, like the murdered bodies and the memory you carry so that they and we can move on. Six, you. Balance me with your sometimes endless days because you are always the first to arrive and the last to leave the battlefield. Seven, you ravish me with silky whispers to my ear about the perfect Baldwin quote or Sanchez, Angela poem, phenomenal. You bolster you me to straighten up, never slouch and stand tall. So fellow sisters understand, we are not alone in our struggle. Nine, you incapacitate me with symphonic soundtracks like you incapacitate yourself. At night, when you lay almost sleepless, worrying, always worrying about tomorrow's events. Ten, you tickle me with the use of fingers or hands. I'm sorry, you tickle me without the use of fingers and hands because you let them to an officer so they forget to clutch and accidentally squeeze. 11. You hypnotize me with brown eyes that gaze at the homeless with humility, only to reach in your pocket, your wallet, pull out a $20 bill, and smile without hesitation. 12. You calibrate me 
with vicious overtones like pit bulls barking at strangers just to illustrate how attacks and kills happen to students daily in schools. 13. You fascinate me with every piece of advice you give and offer to every young person because you know that if you don't, no one will. 14. You enthrall me with every bit of gesture you make, every word you utter, because without you, there is no me, and without me, there is no you, and without us, there is no me. This question about the water was a business in the Um, making sure this is right. I've been told to speak up. Um, so, yes, I'm Mrs. Seymour. Hi. Um, I'm nervous. I haven't done this in a minute. Um, so, the title of this panel, Wrong is Not My Name, Writing Feminist Activism in 2016, uh, was to address the place of arts and contemporary activism. And one thing that I kind of teased out last night at dinner was that there is no activism without the arts. It just, it's just, all right for the snaps, yes. <laughs> the new clap. Um, there is no activism without the arts. So in recent memory, um, my recent memory, maybe not some of y'all's, the civil rights movement. I grew up with that. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a 60s baby. Um, there are numerous examples of the arts advancing civil rights. Uh, one thing that will surely pop into your mind is the I am a man poster, okay? Example of the arts, it's visual arts. There are other examples of uh, written arts like Negro Diaper slash Black World that um, Nadia just mentioned, uh, Harlem Writers Guild, Ombra Magazine, um, the Black Arts Movement, hello. <laughs> which was real big in my house because my mom was a panther at one time. Um, and then also other movements in my lifetime, the women's rights movement, uh, Judy Chicago, the literature, you know, the women in print movement in particular is near and dear to my heart because that's kind of what started me, running Redbone Press. Um, women setting up presses, learning how to print themselves because they couldn't get their work published, the poetry that was out also, gay rights movement in my lifetime, the literature, gay men setting up presses. Notice I haven't racialized any of that yet. The visual art, Keith Haring, <laughs> you know, the whole silence equals death, that's part of the arts. The uh, if kissing doesn't kill you, great and indifference will, the people kissing, more examples of art and activism. Even, you know, poetry and people with work in the prisons, there's also work, theater work, another example of the arts. Um, so you can't really have activism, you can't really advance activism without the arts. Even one of my poets, Marvin K. White, said, there's all this stuff about marriage equality. We were complaining because all the grant money was going to the marriage equality movement. And he said, but who do you think writes the vows? Hello? <laughs> the arts. So, um, I have this long list, you know, Afro-Cobra movement, you know, one of my aunts is um, a curator at a museum, black visual arts, so I'm kind of steeped in it, me personally. Um, my dad's a musician, more evidence of the arts, but you know, we got like 20 minutes, so I'm gonna move on. So, I think my question is, why do I do what I do? I publish black gay and letter lesbian literature, and in order to reach people with this arts, to advance activism, you have to tell stories. I remember sitting in an auditorium in Atlanta and listening to Barbara Smith say that you cannot get through a day without a story. You cannot do it. Try it. Think about it. Try going a whole day without saying something like, that reminds me of the time. I don't think you can do it. Try going the whole day without music. Some of y'all get your earbuds in all the time. You can't get through the day without some story about what music is usually about. Lost love, trying to get love, trying to get sex. 
So we live and thrive on stories, and we understand each other through our stories. I didn't start out to create a press, Redbone Press. I was really just collecting stories, black lesbian coming out stories to be specific. It was a personal challenge. Um, I had been, well, my sister, younger sister, was living with me going to uh, college, getting an associate's degree. And one day I picked her up from school and a classmate of hers tagged along. Little did I know she'd seen the pink triangle on my bumper sticker, <laughs> on my bumper, and found a way to get to my house where she perused all my bookshelves and then turned to me and said, do you have a book about black lesbian coming out stories? And I was like, Somewhere in here didn't exist. So I set about as a personal challenge. I said, I'm going to do this. And in the process, researched all these feminist presses, uh, not knowing that I would one day be one of these feminist presses. So, you know, as a personal challenge, and you see this happened because of a story, looking for all those stories. So that was Shameless Blood. Does your mama know? <laughs> this is the first book, and some of y'all know it. Um, <laughs> and doing this, I kind of fell in love with publishing and having done the research of how presses start. Fell in love with collecting the stories, and it made me fall in love with midwifing, which is something that you know about revolutionary mothering over there. I was pointing at Alexis Pauline Dunn's. Um, <laughs> shameless plug for her book. <laughs> we'll talk about it later. We in the book business, we tend to do shameless plugs. Um, because midwifing is what the business of publishing is. It's making sure that someone's story gets into the hands of other people. That's the definition of publishing. Not just printing a book, but getting it into the hands of other people. And Does Your Mama Know has gotten into the hands of a lot of people. I know because there's over 6,000 of them in print. I know because, well, the second edition published in 2009, people are still responding to that. I got a Facebook message last week from a woman that was introduced to it in Detroit in October, and she like waxed eloquent on Facebook <laughs> about how much that book meant to her. It's changed people's lives, and that is why I do what I do. So the story of women like Alexis Pauline Dunn, like Samantha Bashir, like Becky Barbara, like Alexis Dubow, like Jill Bowman, like Terry Jewell, like Letta Neely, Sharon Bridgeport, like Naomi Jackson, like Laura Hyde Wayne, like Renita Walita, all this in Desert Mama, like Ekwa Omosupe, like Makeda Silvera, like Linnell Moise. They have helped change people's lives, and that ripple effect takes action. So that is my aspect of big white things, publishing books that change people's lives. Um, I've done it. Um, but also how 
that very vision of hers reshaped um, what we learn about feminism and what we can learn about feminism to this day. Thank you. So I think, uh, so we can get louder. Uh, so I thought that Nadia's um, points were really important in this vein uh, and served as a really <coughs> solid example of what June's work looked like both on paper and in practice around this question of internationalism. Um, what I want to comment on a little bit, since I opened that, I did open that can, didn't I? Uh, what I think is important about June and her ongoing, persistent legacy um, is that I personally think that what she was able to do was to infuse a politic that opened up our imaginations about what was possible. So it's, it's, as you said, it was not just about making sure that the internationalist feminist struggle was inside of everything that she wrote. That wasn't just it. It was about exposing, right, the multiple threads that connect us across borders. And I think that, um, you know, when I think about some of the work that she did um, around Palestine and South Africa, and I think about this um, project that one of her students, her former students, Maria Poblet, uh, is working on right now, a project called Reclaiming Feminisms through the Grassroots Global Justice Alliance. Um, I can't help but notice that that is June's legacy today where we're discussing how to reclaim feminism at the grassroots when so much of the conversation about feminism right now is not that, right? Just to keep it 100. Um, we have all these narratives around leaning in and all this stuff, right? You can be anything you want to be if you just try hard enough. I'm like, I thought we got rid of that a long time ago. Um, but it's also about acknowledging that the conditions of women and girls, the conditions of non-cishet <laughs> people right, around the globe are connected intricately and, the and need to be the foundation for any waging of struggle in this period. So when we lift up the names of um, uh, folks who have been murdered for their activism, those are often women. When we lift up the names of people who are being disappeared in the name of globalization and capitalism, those are women. When we lift up the names of the thousands of indigenous women who have been disappeared and murdered, yeah. Um, so I, I think we could spend more time like teasing that out, but I just want to keep kind of pushing that her legacy is very present in current struggles, and not just on paper, but in on-the-ground movements that are trying to connect us across borders, that are attempting to lift up in practice a new politic, and expose the poisonous nature of capitalism in its current form. Expose the poisonous nature of imperialism and then force us to re-articulate what a vision for a new world can and should look like and implore us to try and live that world now in real time, not in theories, 
but to be brave enough to try and so many different people into the conversation, whether that's students who found poetry for the people and found a space where someone um, not only understood uh, you know, their background as a Palestinian or understood, you know, I know so nobody knows what Somali is, that's my, you know, my father, my name, all of that, and she was like, oh yes, come, I'll tell you a story about a Somali woman, and, and we have an access and a conversation, and, and, and what does that mean for the language that you grew up hearing and how that enters your work, et cetera. Um, the dance on your tongue when I brought up the, the tongue poetry and actually kind of pushing um, pushing yourself to understand, not, not really to mimic necessarily or, you know, take and, uh, you know, kind of take from, but to understand what language is doing and, and how it's helping people, how people are experiencing the world differently and what you might even be missing out on because of being a captive to your own linguistic experience. Um, I think, I don't want to talk uh, around your question, I want to answer it. So, um, I think thinking about the, and I guess I think about Natanya is, is kind of the dance partner, really. Um, it's, it, I do think about this work, at least for, my, for me and my work, it is a very physical experience. It's about, you said, uh, women's stories kind of liberating them. I, I think about that. Um, pushing into an embodied space as a bit as a liberation as well because we're forced to kind of cut ourselves off from our body culturally so regularly and kind of live in the cerebral space that divorces us from each other from our own kind of felt experience that allowing that da -da 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 -da, allowing that back into my physical presence uh, I, I think is very important to me and that's why I also think it's important uh, when we, when I talked about the tongue, for instance, thinking about poetry, I tell my students this is an oral art. This is that yes, make the form look beautiful, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But if if it's not doing anything musically in the sound, so that I hear it, that's what that's where the life is, and this is how we get there too. I just want to add to that too that um, it's about bodies, voices and languages, um, central to, I know the way to, within the Poetry for the People program, central to um, the approach is really making the, I remember doing this right, making the invisible visible and the inaudible audible. And we cannot do either one without voice and language and tongue. And I, I think that it, it is about writing selves, writing ourselves and making our words our voices, um, you know, audible and visible. Um, so I hope that sort of absolutely. If anyone want to add, um, want to add anything about storytelling as Dr. Lee can do, that would be really helpful. But please comment to both of you. Can you she say it? Yes. I can speak. Yes. Up, I can speak up louder. Can you hear me? <laughs> storytelling as activism, in addition to the talk. Well, I guess. First thing that comes to mind is the idea that 
for most people, especially in the United States, it's really often really difficult to hear about what is going on in the world. And there's this kind of discourse that I've been encountering over and over again when poetry becomes a new source because you can't hear or access the truth anywhere else and where you know poems become historical documents. And I think June Jordan is a brilliant example of that, of poetry being kind of the last resort, the last source where people all, all around the world can you know, read any translation of June Jordan's poem and say, somebody knows I'm hurting, or somebody knows I'm suffering. I think she's an epitome of that in many ways. Thank you all so much. Yeah. We have one minute left, and I wonder if the panelists want to say anything to each other. We have more questions. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it's actually a comment. My name is Lynn Brand, and I want to make something audible and visible, which is Shirley Chisholm's 1972 campaign for the presidency. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you to our panelists. Um, we look forward to a day filled with stories and connection, and um, it's just a beautiful, a beautiful day ahead of us. So thank you. Certainly, um, it'll be lunch will be served. This is a great opportunity to visit our book table. So many of the people you've just heard from and those to come have copies available for sale, and I'm sure they'd be willing and happy to talk with you and sign copies of their works. Um, and if you haven't registered for lunch, there's food available for purchase in the campus center, and you'll certainly be able to talk to any of our volunteers at the desk outside who will be happy to direct you to the campus center where you might purchase lunch. And if you're registered, as I said, 15 minutes or so in our lunch will be And right, so it will be convened at noon for our film screening and discussion, which we'll have in during lunch. Thanks again. Let's have another round of applause for you. for the discussion, who will lead us uh, in introducing the filmmakers and beginning a discussion on the films. Dr. Anika Henderson is Assistant Professor of Sexuality, Women's, and Gender Studies at Amherst College. Professor Henderson is currently a Duke University Mellon May Summer Institute on Tenure and Professional Advancement Scholar, a Five College Crossroads in the Study of America's Fellow, and an Amherst College Center for Humanistic Inquiry Fellow. Her book project analyzes fiction, film, music, and book covers, moving between 1989 to 2000. Central to the project's focus is disrupting the notion that popular fiction and its depiction of romance and marriage are unconnected to social and political discourse, while challenging the romanticization of marriage and celebration of popular fiction as a very similar text. She has published an article about the politicization of marriage in Souls and a chapter on Jeeves' film, Pariah, in African American Cultural and Society after Rodney King, Provocations, Protest, Progression, and Post-Racialism. Join me in welcoming Dr. Nathan Henderson. Thank you, Mecca. Um, can we just take a moment and um, to Mecca and all the yeah. 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 This is a fabulous job. Um, <clears throat> so I'm really excited to moderate this panel where Aisha Shahida Simmons and Kai M. Green will deliver talks about how their, their um, works on visual, sonic, and written text linked to the work and legacy of June Jordan. So before I tell you more about the speakers, I want to read the poem that inspired this amazing group of scholars and the title of this panel, 
I train my eyes to see. Now the poem I will read is published in several places, but if you want to revisit it later and live in the words a little bit longer, you can find it on page 496, I believe the page numbers, and um, in Directed by Desire, the Collected Poems of June Jordan, published in 20, um, 2007, is also for sale on the book table. <clears throat> I train my eyes to see what I am suffering not to touch. Late afternoon and the air dissolves to luminous and elongated molecules, a heartfelt mer mercury as delicate, as compelling, as the melted movements of your lips. This must be the longitudinal anatomy of rain. This cosmic commotion, twice bestirred by the exact infinitesimal assertions of your body's dance. These must be the subterranean beginnings of all light. These shimmer surfaces that glow arterial below the frosted rooftops and the thick surrender of the open, trusted trees, and like the stars above the dark, far streets, between us, heat develops into liquid, documents of fire, and there and here, moving through these beautiful waters, you and I become the river. Um, so now let me tell you about the speakers we have for our lunchtime discussion. Aisha Shahida Simmons is an award-winning black feminist, lesbian documentary filmmaker, activist, cultural worker, writer, and international lecturer. An incest and rape survivor, she is the creator of the Ford Foundation funded, internationally acclaimed and award-winning feature-length film, No, The Rape Documentary. Alice Walker, yes. <clears throat> Alice Walker, the Pulitzer Prize winning author of The Color Purple says, if the black community in the Americas and in the world would save itself, it must complete the work that no begins. Aisha is the 2015 to 2016 Sterling Brown Professor of Africana Studies at Williams College. She is also the 2016 to 2018 Just Beginnings Collaborative Fellow Previously, she was an adjunct professor in the Women's and LGBT Studies program at Temple University, an O'Brien Distinguished Visiting Professor in the Feminist, Gender, and Sexuality Studies Department at Scripps College, an artist in residence at the Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture, a visiting lecturer in the Department of Cinema and Media Studies at the University of Chicago, and an artist in residence at Spelman College's Digital Moving Image Salon. Her essays and articles have been published in several anthologies, including the recently released Dear Sister, Letters from Survivor, Survivors of Sexual Violence anthology, edited by Lisa Factora Bershers, and the forthcoming Queering Sexual Violence, Radical Voices Within the from within the anti-sexual violence movement anthology edited by Jennifer Patterson. <clears throat> Committed to archiving, documenting, and telling black women's her stories and contemporary realities, Aisha curated and lead edited the Feminist Wires Global Forum on Audre Lorde. She also co-curated and co-edited with Heidi R. Lewis, the Feminist Wires Tony K. Bambara 75th Birthday Anniversary Forum. She has screened her work, guest lectured, and facilitated workshops and dialogues throughout the North American continent and in many countries in Europe, Af Africa, Asia, and the Caribbean. An, associ an associate editor of The Feminist Wire, Aisha's cultural work and activism has, have been documented extensively in a wide range of media outlets, including The Root, Crisis, Forbes, Left of Black, In These Times, Miss Magazine, Alternet, Cop, Color Lines, The Philadelphia Weekly, National Public Radio, Pacifica Radio Network, and Black Entertainment Television, also known as BET. You can follow her on Twitter at AfroLez, L-E-Z.
Dr. Kai M. Green earned his PhD in American Studies and Ethnicity from the University of Sub Southern California in 2014 and is currently a fellow in the Sexualities Project at Northwestern University of Span in Chicago. His work in thinking on queer and trans issues within communities of color has been published widely in prominent journals and anthologies such as TSQ, Transgender Studies Quarterly, GLQ, a journal of lesbian and gay studies, No Tea, No Shade, New Writings in Black Queer Studies, and many others. Dr. Green is a regular contributor to activist and grassroots publications such as The Feminist Wire, EverydayFeminism.com, just to name a few. He is also a member of the Black Youth Project 100, an activist member based organization in Chicago. He is a poet, filmmaker, scholar, and organizer dedicated to making the world a more livable place for those who are most disenfranchised. Please join me in welcoming Aisha Shahida Simmons and Kai M. Green. Good afternoon, and I'm really, really honored uh, to be here, and I'm just gonna continue thanking Mecca Jamila Sullivan, who definitely did not work alone. She worked in concert with many, and it always takes a village to make things happen, but just know that it, a lot of this is uh, Mecca's brainchild, that, and then she called forth, and people answered the call. So thank you, Sister Mecca. I wanna just open um, with um, the, to set a context for what we're gonna see, and I always believe in word libation, so I want to lay um, some words in the name of June Jordan down, and it's, um, and it's from her essay called Requiem for the Champ. It was originally written in 1992, and she wrote, and I'm excerpting, and so I write this Requiem for Mike Tyson, international celebrity, millionaire, former heavyweight boxing champion of the world, a big time winner, a big time loser, an African American male in his 20s, and now a convicted rapist. Do I believe he is guilty of rape? Yes, I do. And what would I propose as appropriate punishment? Whatever will force him to fear the justice of exact retribution, and whatever will force him for the rest of his damned life to regret and to detest the fact that he defiled, he subjugated, and he wounded somebody helpless into his power. And do I therefore rejoice in the jury's finding? I do not. Well, would I like to see Mike Tyson a free man again? He was never free. And I do not excuse or condone or forget or minimize or forgive the crime of his violation of the young black woman he raped. So those words I read in 1992 when I was 23 years old um, played a pivotal role in a journey that I began in 1994 and that culminated in 2006 to make a film called No, The Rape Documentary. And I never met June Jordan, but I experienced her through her writings, um, her books were on both of my parents' shelves. One of my parents is here, Dr. Gwendolyn Sahara Simmons. Um, so she was always in my life. I encountered her, which is so powerful that we are here on this panel. I'm here on this panel with Kai as a filmmaker because I encountered her through Pratiba Pramar's timeless film, A Place of Rage. It was in that film that I was like, who is this woman and how can I find her and follow her for the rest of my life? Um, and so, that, in many ways, those words, she articulated a lot of the feelings that I had around the Mike Tyson trial, but couldn't articulate them. And so while she is not in the film, no, I would offer that she's very much a part of the film, no. I have to, because I cannot um, move forward, I have to acknowledge several people, one of whom is a poet extraordinaire, Sister Sonia Sanchez, who was the first person, oh, I'm feeling emotional, to give me a major contribution, me, a young, 20-something out black lesbian filmmaker who was a rape and incest survivor. She gave me money, significant after I was getting a lot of um, grant rejections to support the making of No. That money helped, that money along with uh, the Australian Lesbian Foundation as well as two other sister friends, Pat Clark and I know Cox Bagwell. That money allowed me to film poet Essex Hemphill, black gay poet five months before he transitioned and became an ancestor. So it's so important that we support the arts. 
Barbara Smith, who is here with us, was, is featured in No. Samia Bashir, who is here, is featured in No. There are so many people who played pivotal roles, Ashara Ekundayo in the audience, Cheryl Clark, behind the scenes, it took a village. And I just have to just call out that village. For those who are Christian, this is Good Friday. For me, this is a sacred day, not only because it is a symposium, but it is because it is the 75th anniversary of Tony K. Babar's birthday. So it is cosmic and karmic that as we celebrate June, that Tony's birthday is today. And how can we not also call the name of Audre Lorde, who we will also talk about this evening. So just thinking about these powerful black feminist ancestral spirits in this room with us and so many others, but I just want to call those three because they impacted my life. So what we're going to see is a clip from No. We will hear one survivor's testimony. So as a survivor, I think it's important to do a trigger warning. Um, I do believe that we never do trigger warnings about Trump, about police brutality. So I don't know why I need to do a trigger warning. Rape happens. Let's not hide it. Let's work to end it. This is the 10th anniversary year of No since its completion. Got my little 10th anniversary DVD. I'm just so honored to be here to talk about No in the context of celebrating June Jordan's legacy. Ashe. Imagine if all of us thought that it was unthinkable mm -hmm. to assault women, mm -hmm. what might happen if the judge thought that, if the pastor thought yes. that. So these are, these are individuals, for example, who we often refer to as reality definers, and they have the power to yes. shape norm. You bring in a hawk in a chicken yard. Man can go out with a woman, can 
spend all this money, can can it be uh, be she can promise to get it to me. They can go to a room, house, apartment, hotel, whatever, and take a shower together and start playing around together and start actually doing it. She never loses her right to say no, even in the act. This guy raped her. Who could fight Mike Tyson? Grown men who are trained to fight can't beat this man up. But you on Desiree watching somehow show have have been beaten up. I just came in here to pray. Bitch, 
if she doesn't answer your, hey baby, what you gonna say to a man? You judge a woman by the job she holds, by the number of children she's had, by the number of digits on her check, by the many men she may have lain with, and wonder what job, Murphy, you'll run on her this time. You tell a woman, Every poetic love line your narrow mind can think of. Then like the desperate needle of a strung out junkie, you plunge into her veins, travel wildly through her blood, confuse her mind, make her hate, and be cold to the men to come, destroying the thread of calm she held. You judge a woman by impressions you think you've made. Ask and she gives, take without asking, beat on her and she'll obey, throw her name up and down the streets like some loose whistle, knowing her neighbors will talk, her friends will chew her name, her family's blood will run loose like a broken creed. And when you're gone, a woman is left healing her wounds alone. But we, so called, Men. We so-called brothers wonder why it's so hard to love our women when we're about loving them the way America loves us. Good afternoon. So, wrong is not my name. Wrong is not your name. Wrong is not our name. Those are some incredible words because it gave, those, those kinds of words from black feminists gave me the power to say that my name is Kai. My name is Kai and I am a black trans man and I am so glad and so honored and so grateful to be here and to be part of this conversation. Um, I think it is necessary and it is needed that we have these conversations, particularly between trans folk and lesbian identified folk. Um, a lot of what I learned in terms of how I embody my masculinity is through Feminism, um, I honor that. I honor that journey. I honor those lessons and I give such gratitude really to be in this space uh, and with my teachers, with my friends like Aisha, with, with Sister Sonia, um, with Alexis, with Trevor, all of y'all people give me so much love and give me so much light. And um, you know, I just, I just wanted to share for a second, uh, some of the work that I do is around black men, mostly cisgender men, and masculinity, and how do we deal with uh, 
sexual assault? How do we deal with uh, inter interpartner uh, violence within my organization that I'm a part of, which is the Black Youth Project 100? Um, and a lot of sort of movement work is healing work. Um, the work that Aisha do, is doing is about healing. Um, the work, the conversations that we need to have between black trans folk and black cis folk who are lesbian identified or gay identified, that is healing work. And we really need to do that work. And so um, part of that is, you know, creating art is being creative and thinking about new ways of being and understanding and connecting with one another. Um, there are ways that uh, we need to support each other and understand that we are family because without you, without these writings, there actually would be no me. Um, and so I, I just want to say that. I'm going to share a piece with you. It is, uh, I'm not going to give you a trigger warning because it's called Triggers. Um, so you go, you can, you can take that. Um, yeah, so honestly, I would like a lot of feedback. I just put this together last night. It's a film that I've been working on for a long time. Um, so, but the editing part I just worked on last night. Uh, anyways, triggers. Thanks. <laughs> fired shots up to the heavens and the ground you stood upon would not hold you. The court, these laws, unable to recognize you and the justice you do deserve. But I, I will fight for you. I will write for you. I am with you. I know what it means, see. It was just the other day, the day before Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Just outside my old house, we heard a couple yelling. She had been cheating on him. He held her phone, and I imagined he was going over the evidence. I imagined it hurt. He wanted control. Trigger! We looked outside, but there were no bodies, only voices. We couldn't tell where they were coming from, so we went back inside. I can't believe you punched me in my mouth. We made eye contact in the house. What do we do? We don't want to call the cops. We don't want to call the cops. We know what cops do. Trigger! We look outside. The screaming voices become visible black bodies. He is short and hulking, chest out, handsome jeans hugging. She is taller, pretty brown, eyes too hot for tears, hair short, shines fresh, a beautiful smile she did possess, but now, mouth blood filled, she spacked and screamed back, how you gonna do me like that? Her eyes met his, she backed away, she said she was calling the cops, he begged, he already had two strikes, she threatened and declared, phone in hand, you going to jail today? about their daughter. He pleaded, don't take me away. She held the phone up but never hit sin. The phone was her weapon held up to the heavens, but she didn't pull trigger. <laughs> we were on the porch now. She knew we were watching. He knew we were watching. We backed off. She came forward and with her two fingers struck him between the eyes. He walked back to his car and that's when I saw the other her. She was in her mother's car. She watched. She was angry. Black baby girl, I watched her watch him. She gave him a look. She stuck her tongue out. Trigger!
I was triggered. I prayed for that woman. I prayed for that man. I prayed for that baby. I cried for that baby. I was that baby. Protesting the abuse of a father and a mother. Shock. Frozen. I went back. Watch. Witness. War. In home. Home. In war. Protest. Still, I feel weak. Small. Triggered. returned after having been gone for so long, three weeks, four weeks, mom called, maybe he had gotten locked up, she was stressed, she was mom, I was stressed, maybe he was dead, I hoped for prison, I prayed for prison, at least then we know he was somewhere alive, we could write at least, but in his absence I wrote letters to the wind, waiting for a response. She let him in. He was different this time. Unapologetic. He came in like this was his house. But this was my house. No, this was my mother's house and I would protect her. She was silent. I wanted her to fight. She was silent. They were both in bed. He turned off the light. Mom didn't like the lights off. This was her house. He took the remote control and changed the channel. Cowboy, action. Mom liked game shows and sitcoms. She looked blue. He looked red. Silent. I watched. This is my house. This is my mother's house. I went down the stairs and I grabbed the knife. Mom couldn't do it. I thought I could take this man's life. Power. I would take it by force. I stood in the doorway. Television glared through the darkness. I held the knife up so he could see. I hate you, I declared. Mom, mom, I'm here. Don't be scared. He got out the bed, took my knife, made me feel weak. You little, just like your mother. He left. I cried, alone. Mom lay in the dark room still. I recovered the knife and put it under my pillow. If he returned, trigger. I believe you should be free. I believe that the relationship we have to the state is an abusive one. We are not protected. We are not loved. We are police. We are told fighting for our own lives is criminal. What is justice, Marissa? I don't believe in trapping people in cages. I believe in freedom. I still feel guilty that the prayer I prayed for my father was prison, trapped. I want to be free. I want to see you free. We are forced to take it, take it, take it, and we do. But sometimes we talk back, we boil over, and the blood coming from our busted lips pours out onto the concrete. For some, those stains are our only tears. We fight, we are told to be quiet, we are forced to live with these contradictions. Complicated. 
When that mother held that phone and threatened to call the cops but didn't. When I held that knife and imagined killing my father but didn't. When you shot bullets in the air and not in his chest. When the only option is 911 but you know they will not protect. Serve your time, punishments, your crime, saving your own black life. What justice look like? 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 And she answers back, I love you. A little black girl dreams and prayers to her father, and he answers back, I love you too. from the audience. 
of transgender is much more complex than that, so I'm really interested in the things that we don't see or the names that we don't know and the people that we don't account for that are uh, not necessarily represented in those major images that you see on TV, whether it be uh, people who are of different races, whether it be people who don't necessarily look like the kind of, uh, who, who don't necessarily pass for a cisgender type uh, person, right? So uh, that's how I answer your question. Okay, I absolutely do agree with you, but that was just a seed. That's how I saw it. And there are plenty of other seeds too, like uh, June Jordan and uh, Tony K. Babara, who is the person who said, uh, you know, the thing that I learned about gender, I get it a lot from Tony K. Babara when she said in her essay on roles in the Black Women Anthology, she said, let us uh, get rid of manhood and womanhood, and instead, why don't we think about the androgynous black collective self? So I think there's something that she's asking us and that all black feminists have been asking us to do, and it's to think about the ways that the gender binary limits us from being our full and whole self. So uh, next question, thank you. I just, one second, I just also, since we are invoking Tony K. Bar, just really want, and I, te I am, we're all filmmakers, and I teach um, uh, a, a course on, on black women, black cisgender women and uh, filmmakers and writers, and you know, we, we really need to be careful of what, as, uh, as uh, Tony called it, Holly Weird. Um, and so I saw the Danish girl, and I'm not going to talk about the Danish girl, but I think that what's important is that we think, as Kai just said, you know, what are the images that we don't see? What are the narratives that we don't see? Um, and, you know, so Hollywood is a, a machine that, as far as I'm concerned, is more dangerous than the American military because it sells the dream globally. Um, and so what what we're interested in, and there are other filmmakers in this room, one of which I know is here is Kara Lynch, is creating imagery that's telling the stories of the margin. So, and this is a you know kind of a continuum or in tandem with black women writers and poets and black people, just writers, women's poets. Um, and so I think that that's what we really want to focus on, and, and, and particularly in this era of just so much violence and hatred and venom, uh, just kind of just spewed out against all marginalized people uh, at, at, at this time. And definitely black folks in this country are kind of in the, the, the lens, like we're just right in the, the, um, the eye of the, of the storm. Uh, hi, thank you so much, so, so much for your films, um, uh, and uh, I really want to hear, I, I, I saw this commonality in, in these two screenings, um, in this conversation about how uh, racial violence in America, and how white supremacy, and how police brutality have created this obviously 
this overarching problem of racial violence and uh, but also the secondary problem which was addressed in both in both screenings just now um, of the fact that they this this white supremacy and police brutality prevents us from being able to properly address domestic violence and rape um, and this this intersectional uh, conversation about about that and I really wanted to hear you guys talk about that a little bit because it's addressed in in both of your work from what I can tell and um, I think that that's something that especially in these other conversations about Holly Weird and all of this stuff um, these um, mainstream film um, and this conversation dominated by white feminists we are not talking about um. I would say in terms of, for me, what I always say is that No looks at an international atrocity um, through the experience, the histories and experiences and testimony, scholarship, activism of black people. So rape, sexual violence, incest, this is unfortunately an international atrocity. The problem that happens in um, the United States, in Europe, with communities of color is that we are too, so busy trying to fight against a literal, as well as metaphorical lynching, that we can't even deal with the intra-community issues um, because it's just we know that calling the police is not going to stop violence. In fact, it is going to invoke more violence and create more violence. Um, I'm interested personally in transformative justice and not punitive justice. And again, I speak as somebody whose body was violated as a 10-year-old, 12-year-old, 19-year-old. So this is not some kind of theoretical thing. I would never want the people who caused my body harm to go to jail because I'm very interested in how can we transform. Um, and so I think that the issue is, is that we do have to talk about gender-based violence in our communities. We have to talk about it. And we have to talk about white supremacist violence. That we, we can't do one without the other. So in communities of color, and you know, I feel like we, we, we I always say racism ended right now. I'm not safe, and most of us are not safe. In mainstream white feminist communities, if sexism ended right now, I'm not safe. So we really have to talk about this in tandem. And again, in this context, I have to say that this is not some Aisha thing. I mean, this is part of a continuum that just goes back, back, back. I mean, I think I'm so excited about the Company River Collective discussion that's going to happen, hearing from Elder Sister Sonia and Dr. Gloria Joseph and um, um, Evelyn Mariah Harris uh, later, you know, Paula Giddings. I mean, so this is just, for me, I just feel like I'm one of the, um, I'm, I've inherited this, right? Inherited this powerful legacy and honored to be able to carry it and pass it on. One of my students is here from Williams College, Kaya Gringa, so that I see this as a long distance a relay race. Yes, <laughs> all of that. Um, I would I would only add to that that also these are things that people are doing, people are practicing, right? So the organization that I'm with, and I'm gonna keep shouting it out because I love BYP 100. Um, it is a young black youth organization, black folks doing things and we work from a black queer feminist lens. Um, that means that everything that we do is sort of has that foundation of our freedom is linked to everybody else's freedom. Our freedom, uh, we, we, we wanna be free holistically, right? Our whole selves, which means that the people in our organization who are cisgender heterosexual men have to understand and realize what a black queer feminist lens is for them, right? Not just because some woman or some queer person or somebody else told them, but what that also means is there needs to be people to do that work with them. Right? And so I, I feel honored and blessed to take that position in that role in that organization to work with folks to figure out what does healthy masculinity look like? What does masculinity look like that's not oppressing or oppressive of femininity? And what it looks like for, for the men that I have been working with has been a liberation of themselves in terms of their feeling free freer to be a whole self or a whole person, right? Because we think of these things, masculinity and femininity, as, as extremely um, dichotomous and binary, but the truth of the matter is we all sort of walk with and hold those energies, but we haven't all been able to or have the power to acknowledge the way those energies are working um, in us and how they sort of shape the way we're able to move in the world or not move in the world. Um, and so I, I think we, 
we have to do the work of restorative justice. We have to we have to figure out how to sort of create in our communities something different than we see uh, in terms of how the state sort of uh, criminalizes and polices us as black people. And I'm speaking specifically as black people, right? We don't want to cause that same harm, um, but it's also it's, it's difficult to do when harm is being actively being done in the community, right? So how are you actively trying to heal and you know people are hurting each other, right? Um, but it's work, and I think it's the work that we need to commit ourselves to. And I just, since we're, you know, I think Kai and I are, are members are of the editorial collective of a, a multiracial, intersectionalist, radically feminist uh, publication, online publication called The Feminist Wire. And I think that for us, that this is the work that we also are doing um, collectively, not only in terms of the work that we publish right now, there is a, a big, we're on day six, the final day of an online forum celebrating June Jordan's life and legacy, um, thefeministwire.com. So just a wide range of essays, reflections, tributes um, on, on, on the site. But just in terms of us being um, multiracial, uh, multigender, multisexuality, class levels in terms of that we're not all scholars, cultural workers, it's just a, a wide range of us. For the past six years, I mean, we've been, I mean, what we publish is also representative of what's going on behind the scenes in terms of really struggling in terms of how do we embody that which we are producing for free. You don't have to have a subscription for free. Um, online, and so that this is just something that just that kind of radical, like this is a new way of thinking about feminism. It's not kind of really a new way, it's a continuation of the ways of our, our, our feminist uh, predecessors have done it, but in terms of just, in terms of being online and doing it, um, in engaging in radical feminist dialogue, and struggling because we are self-funded and barely making it, and, but we're still committed to moving forward and not accepting corporate ads and not accepting um, any kind of other sponsorship that will limit the, uh, what we talk about because we're very clear about our radicalism. Hey, so I love you both so much. I love you. you Texas. And I have benefited, I know I'm not the only one, but I have definitely benefited from the poetic approach that you both take to film. I think it very much honors the words from the blueprint that Mecca was invoking earlier about poetry as a vehicle for telling those truths that we don't know how to tell. And I wanted to ask you both, in your process of doing that and also creating a collective space with your films for us to engage these complicated questions, but also to explore some of the deepest aspects of your own experiences, I'm interested if you could share anything about the, um, the interaction about you do that for us, right? And then we live in that space, and you also offer your experiences, and then I know you're also transformed by what it means when it's out in the world, and then you use that in your work again. But it inspires me, and I get to know a little bit about it because I get to know you all, but I think it would be great for folks in here to hear some of your story about how that poetic process of being filmmakers who, who really take that type of approach that Jim Jordan took, of telling the truth relentlessly and not necessarily fearlessly, but not stopped by any of those fears that, um, that are imposed upon us. If you could share with us how that process impacts you back and inspire us more, that would be a blessing. Great question. Thank, Thank you, you for that question. Um, the way that that process works. Um, for me, making film is like making medicine. It's medicine. Um, and you know, I I gotta just say that I, I it's funny that you asked this question. Because now I, all I can do when I look at you is I see a suitcase. Because when I met Alexis, she was walking around with a suitcase, an old, old, dusty suitcase, like from another time. And <laughs> And I was like, what, what, what you got in that suitcase? <laughs> oh, it was my ancestors. I said, like, wow. <laughs> Whoa. And from that moment on, I just been following you. <laughs> so I was like, I need to figure out what you're talking about. So I, I just, I, I want to say one thank you because what, what, what this kind of process has allowed me to do is build community and build family, right? So when you have this sort of courage to share your own stories, it allows people to share their stories. And in that, that is how you build the most fantastical relationships. And that's what this whole thing is about, like coming here and being like family reunion. That is beautiful. 
beautiful. That's a blessing. I'm sorry. I'm here. I'm from church, so <laughs> I might start shouting up here. <laughs> Yes, I shall. Um, I, you know, I and Alexis, you know this. Um, Alexis, um, you all will hear from Alexis later. Also, a member of Film This Wire Collective and just all around living archivist. Um, I, I really, um, it's similar. Just kind of picking up. I feel like it's. Um, I was fortunate to be a student of, of Tony K. Bambara's, and so she is the reason why I am a filmmaker. So I feel like in learning in that in in. in under her tutelage, but also as I, you know, I started out by saying that I grew up with June Jordan's books on my mother and father's um, bookshelves, um, and so like in, like having these books around me, and then being really blessed enough to grow up, like being taken to. I remember hearing like Sweet Honey in the Rock when I, you know, and when it was like not at Carnegie, right? You know, like when it was in a place where we had to get the sound, like what we were doing here, getting the sound system before it was like, before they were sweet money. So, you know, and, and hearing Sister Sonia at the founding of the National Black Independent Political Party meeting, you know, so this is part of, you know, my, my, my personal, like, ancestral legacy, right? And then there's also just the, the spiritual, the, the spirit family as well. So for me, what I wanted to do was put on images what I heard while sitting on parents and aunties and uncles, not, I'm not talking about biological, I'm talking about children, spirit family, laughs, what I read in terms of just, you know, stumbling across books in, you know, both my parents' libraries. So that, that for me was like, how can I put that on screen? You know, thinking about, but some of us are brave, and home girls, and you know, thinking about Cheryl Clark's, I love of um, Althea and Flaxy, you know, just the, you know, this having, you know, like, oh my God, I feel like that's me, you know, seeing myself reflected in these writings and wanting to do that on film. And I don't want to act like there, there weren't filming, there's Michelle Parkerson and Julie Dash and Holly Karima, long before a whole bunch of people who are now being celebrated without even understanding that these now contemporary filmmakers are part of a continuum of folks outside of Hollywood. So we got to lift up those names. Um, and I learned that from Tony, who in 1992 rattled off 100 names of black women filmmakers. I was like, well, how do I see them? I, they're not the movie there. She said, no, 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 sister. You got to go to the community center. center. You got to organize screenings, you know, all that kind of stuff. So for me, like, that was my process. And so, and then through making no, I was able to build community as well, right? Because I didn't initially get that the, the Ford Foundation grant. That happened the last year of no, which enabled me to subtitle and make it accessible in a global um, world. So I wanted it to be accessible to every single, not every single, but people who spoke, people in the diaspora, African diaspora, who spoke the colonial languages of French, Portuguese, and Spanish, and English in this hemisphere. I really saw no as, you know, just kind of, I mean, while it has been, connects with a lot of people all across the world connected with film. For me, I was thinking about the descendants of the Middle Passage. And so, so yes, I share the forward for being able to, you know, come through that way. But it was really those individuals who were like, here's a dollar, here's a euro, and then here was a franc or, a, you know, a peseta, because I was doing it before the euro. I mean, it was like, you know, 12 years of making it. But you know, that I was accountable to. So Tony always said, you want your community to be account, you want to be accountable to the community that named you. So I was not accountable to these foundations. I was accountable to individuals. I was accountable to my black feminist, um, um, big older sisters, aunties, who there's writings who was like, okay, I want to be in tandem with them. And so for me, that's what I, I saw as my responsibility. I felt like I have a responsibility. And for me, my, my because I feel like I'm literally, metaphorically standing in, in, in people's blood, the struggle, right? And, and as the sister earlier was talking about, that we are on occupied land, indigenous land, land that Africans worked for free for centuries to, you know, this building. So for me, I felt like, I believe in entertainment, but I was like, I got, I want to make revolution irresistible. And filmmaking is the way that I want to do it. Thank you guys for, thanks everyone, for continuing, especially for you two, for sharing your work, even if it's in its rough, rough stages. Um, the work of opening up the conversation and the spaces and producing the language in which we can talk about, about things that we know in the sense of on the board and very deep within ourselves. We just don't necessarily have the, the words to articulate them, so thank you for that. Um, 
And I, I was going to ask a question I, I know how to ask and a question I don't. But the question I know how to ask is why film? And I feel like Alexis, your response to Alexis's question kind of covered that. So the question I don't know how to ask is kind of framed in response to a quotation that, that I read recently that resonates with me, but also makes me uneasy at the same time. And it, it says, I do not know a blackness that is not queer. And I feel like in some ways that statement opens up a space for a particular kind of articulation of black identity and black sexuality, but at the same time forecloses potentially or might overshadow or displace some conversations about queerness and queer identification that have been waiting, standing in the shadows for so long. So, I don't know if you guys have been thinking about that or, or how that resonates with your contemplation of this intersection. The intersection is a useful word, but also not a completely sufficient word for how we can think about how all of these things and all these experiences come together. Thank you for that question. Um, I feel like in, in a lot of my work, not necessarily this film, but in a lot of my other sort of writing, I'm really trying to grapple with um, identity categories, um, the, the usefulness of them, right, in terms of the, the, what they allow you to do in terms of building connection and uh, sort of relationship with others based on sameness. Um, but I also think that there is a limit to those things because we believe that those things tell us give us information that's not necessarily all the, all, all, all the way true, right? So if I tell you I'm a transgender person, you assume, oh, I know what that means, blah, 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 blah. And that's not true, right? And so there's something about these categories that I think works and is necessary, especially when you're thinking about like why intersectionality as a term came into being, right? It was so that we, we could get things done in terms of the, Right, um, but when it comes to Black feminism, I feel like people in in the academy sort of want to push it to the side because they say it's old and it's just only interested in Black women. But what I read are people really trying to grapple with what does it mean to yes be and hold this space of Black woman, but also what does it mean to be not free? What does it mean for your unfreedom to be connected to other people's unfreedom? And how do you get people to understand that our unfreedom is connected? Right? And so that's not necessarily uh, encapsulated by a category, um, like, like even black or even queer, right? Those things sort of are, 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 are a little bit messy. Um, but I did want to respond to the other question, which is why film? And that really for me has always come directly from Audre Lorde, who said, you know, there are no new ideas, there are only new ways of making them felt. And so I think about film as a way of giving people something and making you feel something in your body, right? Not necessarily um, to make you think, but what does it make you feel? How does it move you? How does it push you in that way? So, um, but maybe you can speak to the other question. I'm, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm <laughs> So here, here's a good example, and this is not shade, but, no. oh, um, <laughs> so the first question that was asked, those are the kinds of questions that actually will not take us to where we really want to go. They're limiting. Um, and so I think that we must begin to ask questions that are more so, um, how, not necessarily what makes us the same, but what makes us different? And how do we sort of figure out what we want that's the same, right? It's not what, we don't have to be the same to work towards something that we can collectively agree on. And I think that's the problem. People always say, oh, well, I, I can assume that because you are a black woman that this means this. But the truth of the matter is, I don't know. You could, you, could, you could be all kinds of things that are very negative and violent, right? So I can't assume that just because you have this particular identity that you're going to do a particular kind of political work. I need to, we need to figure that out together. We're going to have to work on that. All right, so we are out of time, but I just want to thank you all again. This is a wonderful panel, and then we will. Um...
I don't, I didn't sell, I didn't bring, I, I brought DVDs, but I just gotta do a little because we're on live stream. I'm just so excited. Like, so for more information about No, you can go to knowtheratedocumentary.org. So I just wanted to say that because I'm, I'm, uh, I had an educational distributor. It's, it's like I said, it's in its tenth year, and No has literally kept me alive many a day. Um, but also, it is available for purchase, and you can get it offline. I do have some on me, but I just wanted to just share that. Um, for <laughs> Thank you, Sister Sonia, asking how much. It is, <laughs> it's um, $30 for the home video version, which means that you're watching with your home video. If you're doing something at the institutional and organizational level, then they're different. So a select organizations, limited budget, not including like UMass or, you know, Williams College, no, no, is, 40, <laughs> is, um, is uh, $49. And then if you're an institution, um, and $49 is also for HBCUs. If you're an institution, it's $195. So thank you. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you so much for our panelists and moderators. So we're going to take a quick five minute break while we get set up for our next panel. There's coffee available in the corner over here. So grab some coffee, grab some books from the book table, and uh, we'll convene in five minutes. In a 2000 interview in Essence Magazine, June Jordan says, to tell the truth is to become beautiful, to begin to love yourself, value yourself, and that's political in its most profound way. Two years earlier, in 1998, she says in an interview for Color Lines, poetry is a political act because it involves telling the truth. Thinking of these two quotes together, we see Jordan's clear, career-long investment in particular ways of understanding not only the politics of truth-telling, but also the intellectual and epistemological value of poetry. For her, truth-telling is political because it is personal. The expression of knowledge is meaningful because it involves a profound shifting of self. And as the second quote suggests, this shifting, this truth-telling, happens not only in ostensibly political speech, but also profoundly in poetry. In this sense, Jordan, open, Jordan opens us not only to new ways of conceiving the politics of epistemology, but also to new ways of understanding and valuing the knowledge that artists produce. You know, it's funny, I named each of the panels for today. And uh, you know, I sort of wanted to make sure that I highlighted important moments in Jordan's work as they connected to each of the panel topics. And I was, in the back of my mind, hoping that the poems that each, each of the titles came from would be invoked at some point on the panel. But when I came to our panel, then I was hoping that other people wouldn't do that because then I wouldn't have to. And the reason for that is, On the Paradox and Rhyme is actually one of Jordan's more explicit erotic poems, um, which I know is a two-line poem. I highly encourage you. To check it out. But I, I thought it was a useful title for this, for this panel, a useful line from which to pull the title for this panel as a kind of erotic poem about the, as Cheryl Clark put it in my class yesterday, the parody and paradox of kind of black feminist connection um, and identification. The poem is about the kind of paradoxical complexities of erotic, uh, affective, emotional connections between and among uh, between and among people. Um, and so thinking of that complexity, I really think that kind of speaks to this broader complexity of Jordan's work that we've been talking about today. The ways in which she's able to make multiple meanings from language in multiple ways all at one time. As we've heard today, Jordan stands as one of many black feminist thinkers whose refusal to acquiesce to institutional, generic, or disciplinary divides has been inspiring and instructive for many. As a thinker and an educator who wrote over 25 book-length works in at least four genres, memoir, fiction, poetry, essays, and an opera, she reminds us how multidisciplinarity and genre crossing are key aspects of black feminist intellectual tradition. And as an artist, she offers us lessons in the importance of threading our creative selves throughout our intellectual lives. 
Bringing Jordan's legacy of multidisciplinarity and genre crossing forward, I'm so delighted to talk today with Evie Shapley, Che Gossett, Kevin Kwashi, and Alexis Pauline Gums about the place of creativity in feminist scholarship, theory, and pedagogy. Evie Shapley is the author of two books of poetry, A Half Red Sea, and most recently, The New Black, winner of the 2012 Hurston Wright Legacy Award in Poetry, as well as a critical study, Renegade Poetics, Black Aesthetics, and Formal Innovation in African American Poetry. Her poetry and essays appear widely in journals and anthologies, recently including Boston Review, Pluck, the Journal of Appalachian Arts and Culture, Los Angeles Review of Books, Boundary Two, Poetry, Best American Poetry 2015, and Best American Experimental Writing 2015. Her honors include the 2015 Stephen Henderson Award, the 2012 Holmes National Poetry Prize, and fellowships from the Schomburg Center for Research on Black Culture and the American Council of Learned Societies, ACLS. Currently serving as creative director of feminist studies of the Fem Feminist Studies Editorial Collective, Shackley is associate professor of English at Rutgers University, New Brunswick. Che Gossett is a trans femme writer and archivist at Barnard Center for Research on Women and a PhD candidate in Women and Gender Studies at Rutgers. They are the recipient of the 2014 Gloria E. Anfalua Award from the American Studies Association Women's Committee, a Radcliffe Research Grant from, the Harvard, Univ from Harvard University, and the 2014 Sylvia Rivera Award in Transgender Studies from the Center for Lesbian and Gay Studies at, CUNY at, at the City University of New York, and the 2014 Martin Duberman Research Scholar Award from the New York Public Library. Che was a member of the 2013 Archivists and Librarians Delegation to Palestine. Kevin Kwashi is, professor, is a professor in the Department of Africana Studies at Smith College, where he teaches cultural studies and theory. He is the author or editor of three books, most recently The Sovereignty of Quiet, Beyond Resistance and Black Culture. He is currently working on a project that studies the idiom of black female audaciousness. And finally, Alexis Pauline Gums is a black queer troublemaker, a black feminist practitioner of what June Jordan calls, quote, love as life force, end quote with a PhD in English, African and African American Studies, and, women's, and Women and Gender Studies from Duke University. Alexis is the founder of the Juneteenth Freedom Academy, an intergenerational educational space based on the poetry, letters, teaching, and archive of June Jordan. She was the first scholar to visit the June Jordan archives at Harvard. Alexis has also written about June Jordan in the Imperial University and the Feminist Wire, and is co-editor of Revolutionary Mothering, Love on the Front Line, which I think she has a copy of right here, uh, which includes a never-before-published essay by June Jordan called The Creative Spirit in Children's Literature. Alexis is also the author of Spill, Scenes of Black Feminist Fugitivity, forthcoming from Duke University Press. Is it No. Okay, forthcoming from Duke University Press. Please join me in welcoming these fantastic panelists who will speak for about 10 to 12 minutes before we open for conversation. Thank you, Mecca, and um, thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, I, I'm really grateful to all the organizers um, who have been working to make this event happen. It is, is frankly amazing, um, just the energy in the room and um, the sense of the occasion um, that I'm sure we all feel. Uh, so. It's a great honor to be here and to, to be speaking on panel with these fabulous folks, um, some of whom I'm just meeting, some of whom I'm just meeting. And yeah, you can't hear me? Hello. Okay. All right. Here we go. I have to, I have to work this out. 
Okay, so honored, happy, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we will see. We will see what what I have uh, come up with to say today. Um, I I actually don't remember exactly when or how I was introduced to the writing of June Jordan. Uh, while this may be attributed to my increasingly faulty memory, I like to think, rather, that it says something about how many places her work can be found and how many lips her name might be upon in terms of praise and in a tone of respect. My suspicion is that she was among the feminists whose existence and importance I became aware of during the years when I was in law school, perhaps ironically. Um, thanks to my uh, dear friend Lisa Crooms, now Lisa Crooms Robinson. When we met in the late 1980s, she was already an activist um, and is now a professor of law and associate dean at Howard Law School, um, who had not simply learned about many black feminist thinkers and activists that I would come to admire, but had met and even worked with them. Uh, I can easily imagine June Jordan's name being one that Lisa would have mentioned and then meeting a blank stare, perhaps, from me, recommended with that shake of her head that always meant, how did you get so far without <laughs> knowing this information? <laughs> so that's a shout out to sister friends teaching each other. We will um, let this likely scenario stand in for what I don't precisely recall. In any case, it was surely around that time that I encountered first the essays and then the poetry of June Jordan. Um, and as it turns out, I'm gonna be talking more about her essays, so I'm taking poetics in the, the broader sense. Um, I think of her work, though, in these genres together to this day, in part because of how continuous her voice is across that generic divide. In her essays and her poems, we hear the same resonant urgency and unapologetic outrage the same clearly articulated vision of what a well-functioning world should look like, the same flashes of intelligent wit that strike like lightning, cracking open the darkness into which she sent her brave words. With writers like Alice Walker or James Baldwin, for example, one recognizes that the poetry was written by the same sensibility as the essays, but the voice in their poetry does not for me, come with the same wattage as the voice of their prose. Not so for Jordan, whose essays take the same liberties of polyvocality and explore the same economies of linguistic compression as her poems do. Whose poems, often three, four, or more pages long, unfold with the same analytical complexity and the same kind of carefully structured argumentation that we appreciate in the essays. This is the writing practice of a boundary crosser. Someone who, as Mecca put it in her charge to this panel, refuses to acquiesce to institutional, generic, or disciplinary divides. Sign me up. I signed up, indeed, for life at the crossroads in various ways that have been undoubtedly enabled by Jordan's life and work, as well as consciously or subconsciously inspired by them. In particular, for purposes of this panel, I want to point to the ways her writing has provided um, both a defense and a model of the ways different linguistic registers and discourses can speak through forms they're not supposed to, to use or in contexts where they're not supposed to appear. And I'm using that phrase, um, supposed to, very intentionally, because although we don't always take it into account, the language lays bare the ideology that works to contain some voices or discourses. To say, for instance, that one is not supposed to use black English in writing is to say that someone who doesn't suppose or expect that they will encounter, read, be confronted by, read, be challenged by, black English in their reading. This someone's expectations and suppositions are thus setting the terms for the expression and reading experiences of many others, but not for Jordan and her readers. So I'm thinking here of her essay, White English, Black English, The Politics of Translation, 
written in 1972 and appearing in my copy of Civil Wars, Observations from the Front Lines of America. Though we might not today duplicate the conflation of white English with standard English that runs through this essay, on most other points it remains an incredibly useful analysis of the ways in which, as she states, language is political in racialized terms among others. She grounds her analysis in performance, which is to say she writes a good portion of the discussion of the problem of accepting standard English on its own terms in black English, hipping us to the doublespeak bullshit that would permit Richard Nixon to speak of the Vietnam conflict as one of the most unselfish missions ever undertaken by one nation in defense of another. <coughs> at least until that same unselfish nation flew off in defense of the rights of Afghani women. Check it out, she writes. The problem is that we are saying language, but really dealing with power. Her breakdown of the implications of teaching children that their first language, all caps, the black English of their mothers and homes, is substandard and wrong, is a precursor and companion and brilliance to the work Norbessi Phillip does in her poem, Discourse on the Logic of Language. Phillip's sobering crystallization of the brutal paradox faced by black speakers of English begins, English is my mother tongue. A mother tongue is not, not a foreign land, land, lang, language, language, anguish, a foreign anguish. Jordan's essay similarly addresses, quote, the incalculably destructive consequences for the black lives of first grade, that is, the moment when black children first encounter the punishing force of this white power that is manifested and exercised by demeaning the language of their homes and imposing upon them a language that cancels my name, my history, and the freedom of my future. This essay has made an invaluable contribution, foundational to the point of being half forgotten, to my thinking about the use of black vernacular in poetry, the terms, uh, in terms of the way I teach it, and in terms of my own poetic practice. Jordan's analysis in this essay most certainly informs the work she does in the essay of hers that I hold nearest and dearest to my heart, The Difficult Miracle of Black Poetry in America or something like a sonnet for Phyllis Wheeling. This essay came into my life years later, just as I was preparing to leave the graduate school cocoon and join the professoriate, which was also the moment, though I didn't know it then, when I would begin to transition from being a scholar working primarily on narrative, who also wrote poetry, to becoming a poet scholar whose research focused on poetics and black aesthetics in particular, feeds into and emerges seamlessly out of my own art practice. It would be a long time before I felt grounded and comfortable enough in my experience and understanding to do what Jordan does in this piece, that is to integrate her own poetry into an analysis of another poet's work. But right away, I had my model for that and for so much more. I've never learned a more powerful lesson about the importance and value of historicization and cultural contextualization to writing about black poetry than in this essay. In a point that echoes some of the ideas of her essay on black English, Jordan dismisses the kinds of challenges that we these readers, even perhaps, um, even especially black readers, have brought to her poetry, which exhibits little of the revolutionary anti-slavery fervor that one might have liked to see being critical, as Jordan puts it, from the ease of the 1980s. Um, to the extent that Wheatley's verses rehearse offensive racist ideologies in which Africans are benighted, pagan, unrefined, and even somehow mercifully rescued from all that by enslavement, Jordan argues we have to recognize this as an unsurprising outcome given the circumstances. Wheatley arrived in the US as young as seven years old, at which point she began what we may now call first grade, which was followed by a good many more grades than most girls at that time and place received, let alone African girls on the North American continent. The racist ideologies that make their way into Wheatley's lines then 
Jordan writes, are the regular kinds of iniquitous nonsense found in white literature, the literature that Phyllis Wheatley assimilated with no choice in the matter. What is surprising and radical, Jordan insists, is that Wheatley at 16 had developed a conception of herself as someone, one, who had once existed on other than your white Christian terms, the quote is Jordan, two, who could nonetheless be both black as Cain and become an angel of the Lord, and three, who could write a poem instructing white Christians on how to recognize and treat another Christian. This discussion doesn't even come to aspects of the essay that inevitably make me tear up, even in front of my students, when I reach, uh, read and teach it. The blend of sass and empathy in the language with which Jordan depicts Wheatley as a girl who survived the Middle Passage, but could not for very long survive in the wilds of the newly united states of freedom-loving but not black woman-loving America, is heartbreaking to me over and over again. The clarity Jordan achieves in her analysis of who Phyllis Wheatley was and might have been as a black poet in America is essential to understanding Wheatley's poetry but also Jordan's, mine, and that of many others. Or put differently, June Jordan, you slay. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna close with a short poem of my own, um, sort of taking Meg up on an invitation to do that. Um, this is not a poem about Jordan, but it is in the spirit of her work, in terms of its subject matter, its language, and its tone. Um, it's from my um, newly completed book manuscript, uh, which I hope to be able to say something more definitive about um, very soon. Um, this is called, um, it, it's from a suite of poems that, um, in which I use the figure and take the voice of Topsy from um, uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin, um, take, her, take her back, or take her in the first place, and um, uh, it's dedicated to Sandra Bland, 1987 to 2015. Topsy talks about her role. It's like I'm possessed, as if my body's not my own. I don't mean to get into their heads. I just go. After that, it's all in the timing. If I desert a girl too soon, she'll end up 30 before she's 13 and be dragging around a burden big as a church at an age when some young women ain't weighing anything heavier than which purple they want for their pedicure. But if I hold the sister too long, not a thing on earth can tether her. Now, this Sandra was anything but bland. I was hooked. I do like to ride a tongue that's limber, that can keep up with the flash of my spirit. She had a dancing mouth, the kind that could give you warm, such warmth, or just as easily give you hot if called for. I know where I'm welcome. I was still cutting capers behind her smile the week she died. I overstayed. In Texas, parts of Chicago too, picking any droll, don't come in women's sizes. You can set whatever tone you want with a pair of baby blues. But when I roll black women's brown eyes, they always turn into sapphires. Okay, everybody can hear me now. Great, thank you. Um, it's an honor to be here, um, to be in the space of uh, feminist of color, black feminist, um, magic, 
politics, um, collective brilliance, um, and I've been I've been spending the past several years um, kind of like being with June Jordan um, in her archive, uh, the Schlesinger Library at Harvard, really following Alexis's footsteps. Um, so it's really amazing to be here and be in community with all of you. Um, I wanted to start my remarks with a quote uh, from Fred Moten and Stefano Harney's text, The Undercommons, um, and I'll read it. Call out to it as, it as it calls out to you. But for the subversive intellectual, all this goes on upstairs, in polite company, among the rational men. After all, the subversive intellectual came under false pretenses, with bad documents, out of love. Her labor is as necessary as it is unwelcome. The university needs what she bears, but cannot bear what she brings. On top of all that, she disappears. She disappears into the underground, the down low, low down maroon community of the university, into the undercommons of the enlightenment, where the work gets done, where the work gets subverted, where the revolution is still black, still strong. To me, June Jordan embodies this concept of, you know, she was a subversive intellectual. And today, to continue her legacy and to speak of Palestinian solidarity is to inhabit the realm of the subversive intellectual, especially in our neoliberal university context, in which this can incur censor and joblessness. The subversive intellectual is also deeply anchored in the black radical tradition, in all of its queer, feminist, as always already trans, iterations and capaciousness. So it was through what June Jordan called her embattled baptisms, her black queer poetic struggles against war, militarization, cages and carceral violence, anti-queer violence, apartheid and occupation, really across the globe from Mississippi to Attica, to Nicaragua, to South Africa, to Palestine, and to Lebanon, that she found renewed life. Jordan's legacy stands in sharp contrast to the contemporary moment and hailing of the prison industrial complex by main, mainstream like LGBT and racial justice organizations as an arbiter of social justice. So we can see these, this type of like hailing of the prison industrial complex with support for anti-hate crime legislation, such as the Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Jr. Hate Crime Prevention Act of 2010, which was actually an amendment to the National Defense Authorization Act, which in turn increased the military budget to its highest level in history. Today, the carceral military industrial complexes are figured as necessary institutions safeguarding the American neoliberal scene and providing a safe haven for diversity through the enforcement of hate crime legislation and don't ask, don't tell. Repeat. So it's rather easy in our neoliberal time of so-called transvisibility for our counter histories to be erased. And counter, you know, these are counter like, counter genealogies. So the way that they get erased, institutionalized, depoliticized, or co-opted. So we see these, this moment, uh, you know, stretching from uh, things like the Stonewall film that I'm sure everybody's seen images from to like the Danish girl, which, um, uh, which, which, you know, um, repeat a certain violence of trans visibility, right? And that's the violence of representation, where on the one hand, trans people, especially trans women, um, are not in these films, not starring, you know, trans actors are, are not in, the, in, in these films on the one hand. And the flip side of that is that really like, the biography or, or the narrative that's told, the trans narrative that's told, can account for the ways in which racial violence and settler colonialism produce things like the gender binary, which is what women of, trans women of color, like Sylvia Rivera, Marsha P. Johnson, um, have always pushed back against and tried to show how, like a more liberatory form of trans politics. And at the same time, we also see trans artists who are pushing aesthetics at the edge of this type of visibility. So we see this in everything from um, Eric Stanley and Nat Smith's films, Homotopia, Criminal Queers, and Captive Genders, to uh, my sibling Raina Gossett and Sasha Warshall's film, Happy Birthday, Marsha. Um, and this is a way of 
making uh, kind of our own media as trans uh, and gender non-conforming people of color and a way of taking our stories back from um, and erasing violence of visibility. So June Jordan began going on the Freedom Rides in 1966, and in Mississippi she was mentored by Fannie Lee Hamer, who she considered like another mother. As a professor at Yale, Jordan organized the Yale Attica Defense Committee, and this is like some of the archival material. Um, this is a memorial book that, you know, she was talking with, spent a lot of time talking with survivors of the Attica, the repression of the Attica Rebellion. This is more archival material. Um, in her poem about Attica, Jordan connects the domestic warfare against the black poor and incarcerated to the violence of the US empire. And in Nicaragua, Jordan interviewed the Sandistas and wrote an article about the resistance to US-backed warfare and repression by the Contras against the revolution for Ebony Magazine. She opened an article titled, Nicaragua, Why I Had to Go There with the Sentence. Like a lot of black women, I have always had to invent the power my freedom requires. Jordan visited Lebanon and decried the massacre in the camps at Sabra and Shatila. She contextualized this as part of a global settler logic and militarized state violence rather than like exceptionalizing it. In her poem, Moving Towards Home, which was written in 1980, well, written following the 1982 massacre at Sabra and Shatila, she articulates a black feminist political horizon or what she calls living room. And that phrase, living room, is so powerful. And it really indexes so much, and it really speaks to black feminist political horizons. So it can hold, you know, it holds so much of black feminist knowledge production and infrastructure. So, for instance, like when I think of living room, I think of the Kabahi River Collective Statement, and how powerful that was to speak back against a certain form of um, white separatist discourse that was, um, about like biological determinism. So pushing out cisgender men from the movement and the Kambahi River Collective said that we, you know, um, separatism, biological determinism is actually a reactionary politics. So they talked about hetero, you know, forms of heteropatriarchy versus a biological determinist view that dismisses a person based upon their sign, sex, or their gender. Um, also, I think that the Kambahi River Collective Statement is really powerful for that very reason in terms of holding space for trans politics. Um, that's why I try and think about black feminism as always already trans. Um, and that also living room includes uh, the actions of star street trans uh, transvestite action revolutionaries. So Sylvia Rivera, Marsha P. Johnson, Living Room is about Miss Major. It's about radically reshaping the world into a place that we can all inhabit. Um, so disability justice groups like Sins and Ballad that were started by black queer Leroy Moore and other disabled and or queer and trans activists of color extend the vision of June Jordan by creating Living Room and through abolitionist worlding. So these, this particular group um, offers up a different version and future for the human beyond the ableist and sanest regimes rooted in colonialism, eugenics, and slavery. Disability justice is also an imminent critique of the speed of modernity, which is also the speed of racial capitalism and its attendant, its attendant dis uh, disposability politics. So in the face of premature death and slow violence, Disability justice shows us the politics of slow life and slow organizing. It helps us to consider how slowness, care, tenderness, emotional, emotionality, and affect are all essential to ensuring that we are, that all of our lives are livable. So I think this is like another example of extending the, the living room framework of June Jordan um, and the performative power of, of that past and her legacy. I guess I want to end by briefly talking about animality and abolition um, as part of this living room, what June Jordan articulated as living room, making living room. Abolition emerges out of the black radical tradition, so it's one that's always already trans, queer, and feminist, and it's an ongoing and unfinished project that is both a site of study and a site of political struggle. 
So often, non-human animal life is painted as innocent, while at the same time, black life is seen as evil, troublesome, and disposable. And there's a valuation, a devaluation of black life that um, Black Lives Matter is really calling attention to right now. Um, so Frederick Douglass referred to animals as companions and helpers, and discussed the ways in which violence under slavery flowed from the so-called master to the enslaved person to the animal. And in this way, he dramatized the totalizing violence of slavery and its impact on all forms of life, and also the hope of abolition on the other hand. So in her brilliant book, When Species Meet, feminist science studies philosopher and anthropologist Don Haraway talks about being with as a relation to hu between human and non-human animal life. Abolition, deriving from the black radical tradition, is a social ontology, a type of relation that begins with the recognition that we're always already entangled and enmeshed together. And that the process of what Haraway calls being with and what June Jordan called living room is central to ending disposability and maintaining our collective survival and thriving. So I guess um, thank you so much for having me and being part of this conversation um, and making living room together. Everything I know, I learned in the company of black women, whether they be published artists and writers, world makers, people of everyday use, activists. So this is a humbling moment and a giant situation. I also want to say for Mecca, true to your name, you have made a world that is a home. Yes. Poetry is theory. To me, June Jordan's writing is all ars poetica, all instruction in what writing should do, its function and purpose and utility, a quintessential example of making one's ethics and one's aesthetics the same. My most cherished example of this, the ars poetica, is these poems from her 1977 collection, Things That I Do in the Dark. It reads, these poems, they are things that I do in the dark, reaching for you, whoever you are, and are you ready? These words, they are stones in the water, running away. These skeletal lines, they are desperate arms for my longing and love. I'm a stranger, learning to worship the strangers around me, whoever you are, whoever I may become. What hadn't occurred to me before in caressing this poem is how it is an aesthetic of the subjunctive, the possible impossible, the imagination, as in, we are the ones we have been waiting for, which is twin to Audre Lorde's statement of ordinary audacity. I am who I and the world have never seen before. Both of these phrasings from works published in 1980 are black feminist words to live by, conjured and conjuring syntax, as in some of us are brave. I am who I and the world have never seen before. We are the ones we have been waiting for. So I'm interested in thinking about June Jordan's black feminist poetics, as such poetics are evident in her use of the subjunctive, the wild and the not yet achieved capacity that is in the human being. I'll come back to the subjunctive in a minute. June Jordan's first book was a children's book. Of course it would be that, since her legacy as a writer and activist and archivist and storyteller and architect was always oriented toward the possible, which is what it is to feel called to do for children, the smallest, most daring of us, as if she, Jordan, 
imagined all of us, adult us, through the need and magical tender of a black child. That book is Who Look at Me, published in 1969. The book's history is probably well known. It was supposed to be a Langston Hughes project, though Hughes died before he could begin it. It is a long poem in irregular and differentiated stanzas in conversation with 27 illustrations by painters from the American canon. I knew the poem, but I didn't know the book until a dear friend and young scholar, Amy Fish, introduced it to me. And Fish has done beautiful work to excavate the history of Jordan's tension within the making of this work. So in this small space today, I want to talk about the poem, as well as the book's madeness, its shapeliness, as a way to think about June Jordan's subjunctive acts. This is what she did for children. The book opens, sorry, that's what I want you to look at. The book opens on the cover with the iconic Boy by Simeon Shimin, and then an unattributed portrait of a black gentleman. So two Im images of black male subjects commence things, as well as Jordan's sure declaration in honor of, but also apart from the images of the book. This is the dedication she makes, and because it's not readable, I typed it out so you could see it. She writes, Gratitude is owing to Milton Meltzer in response to a book idea conceived by him, and thanks to his encouragement and respect, I undertook the creation of Who Look at Me. The pictures for the book were chosen from a collection assembled by him." End quote. This noting is differentiation, and it reminds us of the tension between Meltzer, a white Jewish scholar of, among other things, children's literature, and Jordan, a tension that Amy Fish's unpublished works has studied as well. And then next is this dedication, in all capitalized letters, for Christopher, my son. And one might notice the absence of a comma that might indicate a grammatical distance between the proper name, Christopher, and the noun, my son. There is something poetically dynamic in the lack of a comma, so that the name and the noun be compared as one. Then comes the poem. This is how it starts. Who would paint a people black or white? And we notice that there's no image on this interrogative page, nor the next one, which says, for my own I have held, where nothing showed me how, where finally I left alone to trace another destination. I am struck by the reckoning being offered here, for the speaker is imagined to be young, black, even male, this book for a young reader that starts with these poetic moods. For example, the alliteration, paint a, paint a people, eases the heft of the question, which is a bigger question than we might think of normally asking to a child or of a child. And then the broken and philosophical syntax in this quatrain, which I want to spend a little bit of time with. For my own I have held is an inversion of I have held my own. This inversion makes the whole statement vulnerable. And the addition of the preposition for underscores the righteousness of smallness, as in I alone and maybe even lonely the way that for my own is a synonym of on my own behalf. Then she says, I have held where nothing showed me how. And the next line, one wants to read where finally I felt alone, except the word is left, a sonic and ideological anagram, a beautiful and assured poet poetic gesture since left and felt really are nearly the same words. I left alone is also I felt alone, except that the former signals a greater agency. I left alone to trace another destination. I should have said the latter. Notice, too, the white-spaced page. No painting, no conversation between speaker and images, just words in space. And then this next page with this incredibly sturdy text. 
A white stair splits the air by blindness on the subway and department stores. The elevator, that unswerving ride where man ignores the brother by his side. A white stair splits, obliterates the nerve wrung wrist from work, the breaking ankle, or the turning glory of a spine. Good Lord. <laughs> I don't have time to tell you the things that I think about this, except to say that the imagery here is sharp and the ideas are a conundrum, meaning that this is not simple or clean or childlike, but a meditative study of blackness as spectacle. It is an ontological interrogation, this section of Who Look at Me. One might notice, for example, the soundscape of the passage, how stair and splits are twinned, as is stair and air, and later, the stair splits pairing returns with the thunder of obliterates, a word which picks up the sound of both stair and splits, and then there's rung, wrist, work, and breaking an angle, and that long vowel-driven sound that ends um, in the word spine. What I'm trying to suggest is that the diction does what poetry does best, which is to use the heartbeat that is sound to register a different logic. One might not know definitively what this line means, but we hear the echoes and it beats in you. It creates a rhythm of something terrible and harsh and imaginative. The meaning is not only in prose. The meaning of the sentence is in the ineffable vocabulary of rhythm. So this is how the book begins. And I want to say a quick couple things about it. One, one is the ready use of interrogatives. Who, where, terms not only of question, but of the subjunctive. The subjunctive, we know, is the syntax of possibility, that conditional tense that really is a mood of affect, the immaterial, the haptic. It is feeling and urgency and all the incommensurate that lives in every human body. The subjunctive is a term of possibility and impossibility, as in if, could, would, if and when, what if. All these terms expressing futurity, a free state, and a liberated self. Not a citizen bound by recognition, but a free as the air and heat and moisture of breath person. The subjunctive, this practice of syntax that is also an exemplification of what language can do, this is the practice of language as yearning. It is a mature syntax, the subjunctive because it's not only tense, but it's mood. It slides from one condition, from one grammatical formation into another. It can be rendered wildly. The subjunctive is a philosophical syntax, more than it is a grammatical one. So I call it mature, but of course, Judy Jordan shows us that it is the idiom of the young person. Of course, since who else can rupture and suture words? so that they skip past the tedious now or the uninspiring already happened into what may be. Who else but children redeem the past and present by asking, big-eyed, and tomorrow? Of course, the subjunctive is also the syntax of the young, and that's what Julie Jordan tells us. The young who face the threat and the idea of never being, who are irrepressible nonetheless, dancing sunflowers nonetheless. And what was it that Sabia Hartman said about the subjunctive? I'm gonna skip this, I'm gonna skip this slide just because of time. In the essay, Venus in Two Acts, Hartman says, is it possible to exceed or negotiate the constitutive limits of the archive? By advancing a series of speculative arguments and exploiting the capacities of the subjunctive, I intended both to tell an impossible story and to amplify the impossibility of its telling, the conditional temporality of what could have been, what could have been and what was not. 
These subjunctive conditions in the skilled artist's domain are also what is, what will ever be, like breath and desire. I should show you very quickly some other pages from the work, just so you have a sense of what it looks like, so that often there are words next to text, and sometimes the words are intention, because the images would to arrest and defile the black child being, and the speaker interrogates and resists the arresting. In two, this is evident in two instances, both of which I could read as subjunctive. The first one is, I am impossible to explain, remote from old and new interpretations, and, not, and yet not exactly. And if I had time, I would, that comes after a series of, of images that are just really challenging and difficult. And then this next line, I am black, alive, and looking back at you. I can feel myself running out of time, and I would want to notice how the dominant word in the book's title, look, is a word that is a verb and a noun and an imperative. It's an indictment of black subjection. It's a call for the speaker to do the looking back, but also this. It's a call for the reader, young and, ima and imagined, unborn and unaccounted for, to look. The devious and defiling act of looking, as in being looked at, can be displaced by the act of looking and seeing, as if those terms are about wonder, are about doing and deciphering, and this is possible because in the world of the book that June Jordan made, it is the young person who is looking. That is, the subjunctive is in the very way that the book is made and shaped, since the presence of open spaces where images might belong makes the book ripe for the child's imagination, so the child can conjure up looking, a coloring book in every homonymic and suggestive sense of that word, coloring. This is an avant-garde book in the way that the dear, brilliant Evie Shockley means that word to describe renegade poetics of black writers. Renegade, because the book dares to imagine that a black child might want a book, might be the spoken subject in and of a book, that this black reader, in interacting with images and words, might make a book. What a thing to have manifest in 1969. And in the interest of time, I'm just gonna say, in the years between 1967 and 1969, there's some stunning examples of black women writers who are making books about and for and on behalf of black children, including Toni Morrison's The Blue Side, Gwendolyn Brooks in the Mecca, which has that incredible line, how shall, how shall the law allow for littleness? Um, Lucille Clifton's um, Good Times, which are poems that are organized around her young children, Maya Angelou's I Know Why the um, Cage Bird Sings, and Virginia Hamilton's first three books, all in that period, so that there is something that in these terrible years, black women writers are writing to when you think about black children. I would say this thing about Harriet Mullen, but I'm not going to, but it's about the unimagined reader because I want to get to the end, which is to say that the subjunctive is and an ethic, and an aesthetic, and an ontology, at least that's what it is in June Jordan's work. The locating one's capacity, one's capacity in the possibility of reaching across the void, this is the articulation that's in these poems, and it's also what June Jordan did in every word she put into service. What am I doing? I really wanted to talk to Miss Jordan herself inspired by the magical condition of the subjunctive, as if I could speak across time and voice and into the place where she is now with us. Dear Miss Jordan, first of all, thank you. I hope where you are, you are well, since you have made for us the map of wellness and well-being, a map of the righteous way to be alive and to be a mystery. You, dear Miss Jordan, write in the subjunctive everywhere and you do it especially in this first book that reminds us that poetry is not a singular art. It is a theory and architecture and essay. It is prayer and painting and movie. It is dance. My dear, this book of yours moves and moves in genres and mood 
It showcases the possibilities of the creative. This is what you did for us. This is what you do for us. This is what you are doing for us, could and would and will do for us. You are as if. You are if itself. You are who you and the world has and has never seen before. The one we have been waiting and are waiting for, even as you are already here. Thank you, you black woman, human maker of things. June Jordan delivered at Berkeley in 1977 called The Creative Spirit and Children's Literature. The full essay is published for, in book form for the first time in an anthology I co-edited called Revolutionary Mother. <laughs> and I remember holding this essay in my hands for the first time in the archive and I'm so happy that now this brilliant essay on the relationship between love intergenerational accountability, the craft of the writer, and our political imperatives as a species is finally in print because I think it's as necessary now as ever to remember what our most sustainable energy source actually is on this planet and how much we need each other. So, of course, I think you're all going to buy the book immediately and then put it in conversation with Kevin's essay and it's going to be amazing. But if right now you could um, turn to your neighbor and just say, love is life force. <laughs> and if you could turn to another neighbor, look them in the eye and say, love is life force. <laughs> and even a third neighbor, even louder, love is life force. <laughs> <laughs> and then maybe all of us together. When I say love is, you say love is love is all right. I don't think you'll forget. And we could have June Jordan pep rallies in all of our communities after this. But I'll talk a little bit more about the essay. So in her essay on the creative spirit and children's literature, which she offered at a conference at Berkeley in 1977, June Jordan explains that the creative spirit is nothing less than love made manifest. And I like that nothing less. To me, it invokes a standard for our creative work, a feminist poetics that rejects the dependence on ego that might sometimes lead us to create work that is nothing more than wordplay or clever but disconnected. I think of June Jordan daily when I decide what to share and what to deepen and how to honor that there is something moving through all of us as artists and more generally as co-creators of reality that is nothing less than love. What is feminist about that? In the essay, June Jordan describes the way lilies bloom in a field right on time, gracefully in sync with other lilies in other fields, not because of their individual genius, but because of their receptivity to how love causes us to grow right where we are. This is what she reminds us. The creative spirit is as much a process depending on your receptivity 
as it is a process depending on your willful conjuring up a visual or oral or verbal constructs for which you would like to feel proudly responsible. End quote. So, this is humbling and balancing. As important as our conjuring is, our receptivity, our creative practice as a method for receiving the love that will grow us is just as crucial. Are you receiving the love that grows you? Which is to say, are you alive? Because love is, you are alive, <laughs> even after lunch. I believe that right now, at this very moment, in this very room, we are engaged in an intergenerational poetics, which is a rigorous poetics, which requires not only our brilliant expression, but also our brilliant listening, our radiant receptivity, our openness to love. Or as June Jordan says, we can cultivate a relationship to our craft that uses whatever mediums we use as technologies to make love powerful. In my practice, June Jordan's work has opened up spaces of listening for me that have let love through time and time again. In fact, I depend on her for that. And I believe she depended on Fanny Lehmer for that. And part of my commitment to my own poetic practice is that I would love for there to be people, and maybe some of those people are you, who could depend on me to be that too. A space where generations of love come through. Not because I am personally so brilliantly, marketably special and unique, but because I am listening and because I actually love you. So I wrote a series of poems very closely following the rhythms and sounds and metaphors of some of what I think of as some of Jim Jordan's loudest and quietest poems as part of my practice of listening, receiving and displacing my own ego and actually a lot of my own style in the service of a necessary closeness to the priceless gift of the poets who make my own forms of love possible. And so I would like to just share two of these in conversation with the title of this panel, One Does Not Rhyme and One Does. <laughs> the first poem is after what I consider one of June Jordan's most fiercely quiet poems. It is her poem for Angela which she wrote for Angela Davis while Angela was in prison, speaking to a love that prison couldn't break and the accountability of our entire community to generate freedom. The poem that I wrote is dedicated to one of my former students in Durham, Torian. It's called The Heat of Realness for Torian, murdered by a car full of teenage boys while sitting in another car full of teenage boys. Sun is not a metaphor. Behind the night, the sun is real in weight, with brightness to envelop you, where nothing contradicts your face, where life is known as love and cherish. Too many deaths foretold have shocked out useless echoes of your name unlocked, ricocheting cruelly into now, dark speed of your stilled and stalled heart. Apathy rocks you back on every side, and we have failed the brightness of your eyes. We forget the mandate of your voice. How high did we expect for you to jump? How fast to dodge? How many days and nights? But sun is real, and you are not a metaphor. I see your face. In early revelation come too late, you bleed out light, already there to see without your broken skin. You radiate a sacred text ignored. The sun is real, waiting behind the night. I see you in the heat of waking up. So that's for Torian. And also much gratitude for everybody in the world and everybody in this room who is working to value the lives of young black people. Um, and thinking especially of the impact that Barbara Smith has been having in Albany in terms of impacting violence on the systemic ways. It impacts the purveyors, what June Jordan calls the purveyors of our future, our brilliant young black people. And the second poem, after what I consider 
one of Jim Jordan's fiercely loudest poems, which rhymes more. I was like, oh, this does rhyme as I'm reading it. I must become a menace to my enemies, an anti-colonial accountability poem she wrote, inspired by the self-determination of the people of Angola, is dedicated especially today to the North Carolina House of Representatives, <laughs> who you may have heard, and as Provost mentioned earlier, just met in a special session to pass a terrible bill that removes our state protections around discrimination based on gender, sexual orientation, and gender identity, excludes huge categories of people from laws protecting survivors of sexual violence, and as if that weren't already all evil enough, also prevents cities and counties from raising the minimum wage at the same time. All of that, so busy in this special session, and they took five minutes to um, do that without hearing from any members of our community. So I am, um, I'll say that House Bill 2 is an act of political violence against everyone I love. And I would say that I am proud that the action that took place last night where many people get gathered and five people chose to participate in civil disobedience by chaining themselves to each other um, in front of the governor's mansion and who were arrested. Two out of those five people are graduates of the Juneteenth Freedom Academy that I host in my living room. <laughs> Speaking of living room, and um, I think that it is a testament to how June Jordan's legacy is so important in this moment. This is called Become, and I'll close with this. So Become, or Whatever marriage is equal to is not nearly enough. After June Jordan's, I must become a menace to my enemies. One, I will not stop to shield you from my love. My brazen heat of all day lust, fear this. The sudden scandal of my open eyes against your lies, I will not stall the singing of my heart. This is for you who hold for me a hope of eventual conformity, who misread all my melting as a phase, or worse, act as if you can consume this impressive terror I must be for free, with dollar menu fries and normal Cokes, as if I want to follow you happily on your way to hellish heartbreak every day. I plan to explode, ecstatic, on a lawn that everyone thought was straight and safe and sane, spilling self-reflection on the silenced lips of housewives who would rather live in trees, hurtling the hips of husbands into homo throb, you have no idea how contagious truth can be. But I have sat in churches clasping hands with only me to blame, your bland assumption staining up my smile regularly I have let you hold the door or lift my bag as if I didn't know a deeper strength of butch mystique, transgender grit. I live like icing on a layered cake that no one will admit is full of shit. <laughs> no more parades until we all are free. I must act like the queer I claim to be. Two. How many of my sisters will die in the street because their gender exceeds the needs of strangers? How many bathroom bashings before I speak? Should I wait for a round number to sharpen the task? One a day, for example? The prude in me asks, like hate violence is a vitamin. What will it take for me to act like these teeth in my mouth are warrior bones? When will I walk with Nanny and Nzinga more than norms? How much blood? will wash away the waiting until we spit paint cities with the shine of our salvation. I must become the beacon of my love. Three, and if I ever fain forget the slick sludge of your sameness, the poison shaming of the truly shameless, the hard encrusted plainness of the pain we daily eat, then let my mothers break my name and throw it at my feet. Let my ancestors trample me with the weight of their trust. I must enact the living of my lust. And if I ever, ever 
drop this love and pick up something suitable and pink and shove my body into it in order not to think and block the sky with sunglasses as if I am above the dirt I came to do. The dust this windblown spirit is returning to, let love forget my face. I must become a crossroads that is visible from space. I must, I must, I must become. We must, we must, we must become. We must become the action of our fate. Thank you. international feminism and I just wanted to add one more concrete example and she also mentioned about Nicaragua and showed that great picture of when June Jordan went to Nicaragua upon the success of the Sandinista revolution but I just so I just heard this story from Kathy Engel who was also um, also on that journey that as they were leaving there were well two things first of all so June Jordan wrote that piece that, that was in Essence Magazine, Nicaragua, why I had to go there, and in the archive, I'm sure Che has also seen all of these black women writing letters that, because June Jordan wrote about the black women who lived in Bluefield, Nicaragua, and there were all these black women in the United States who read that in Essence for the first time, like, we didn't know there was black women in Nicaragua. You know, like, it was a mind-blowing thing, and they would write into the magazine. Susan Taylor said it was the most, the article that drew the most letters from their readership in that entire period of time. So I want to say that, and part of that came out of the accountability that um, she had for this moment when they were getting ready to leave, where this woman in Nicaragua walked up to her with this huge stack of letters signed and said to her, tell Reagan to stop killing our children. And so this is the origin moment for the founding of the organization Madre, and this idea of this feminist internationalism as a mothering act, as an accountability act of engaging, of ending the violence that um, we're experiencing, but specifically a mandate from the mother saying, tell him, stop killing our children. I wanted that to be a concrete example that we could call back to you, and I love your question. Do we have questions from the audience? While folks are gathering questions, I would love to give you all one another, if there's anything that you'd like to say or ask, we'll come to you. I can start off with a question. One of the things that I noticed, one of the many things that I noticed in bringing all of the, the, the I don't know what I'm going to call them, talks, papers, presentations, but the, the, the offering um, that you all have made. One of the themes that I noticed is a, a focus on, on one hand, the voice, um, which is something you've been talking about, I think, throughout the day. Voice as a political act, voice as a kind of effect of the body, voice as a, uh, a kind of emotional, spiritual, affective, perhaps even erotic um, sort of transaction. Um, and then on the other hand, there's also a really interesting focus on a, a very clear commitment to disturbing voice, disruptions of voice, the voice that's loud, right? What it means to have a loud voice. What it means to have a voice that can be both loud and quiet, as you said, but also consistent, as you said, right? And this is something that I think we see in June, in, in June Jordan's work. And so I'd love to hear you all sort of comment on that multiplicity of voicing, how we see it working in Jordan's work, and also what it means for you all as people who are engaged in multiple forms of voice. I, I actually 
just, um, after the first um, shock of the question, <laughs> I had a thought that, that actually answers your question, and that is that um, the, the Wheatley essay that, that I was talking about actually ends in a way that underscores that consistency of her interest in the subjunctive that Kevin was talking about, um, that idea of, um, I mean, if you know anything about Wheatley, she published her first book while she was still enslaved. Then when, around the time she was 21 and her mistress um, passed, she was free, uh, freed uh, and um, went on to marry, have children, um, but was not able to, in the short time uh, of the rest of her life, to, to publish again for all the obvious reasons that um, Jordan so eloquently Who wants to hear from a grown woman, you know, walking around being free in America on her own? Um, so the, the Wheatley that would have been had we heard those poems, um, that mm -hmm. shows uh, that consistency of, of thought. Well, I mean, the other thing that shows the consistency is for sure the archive. You know, I, th I think like the, um, I mean, just even hearing what you were saying about who look at me and the, and in this essay, her saying the way she thinks about children's literature is as an offering of respect and as a message that you can handle it, right? Because you look at some of those things and it's like, what? You know, these are like children reading these like incredibly nuanced poems and, and yeah, just like you were saying, that was the point. That was part of the communication to say, this is who I know you to be. And this, and this is what is possible. Um, but I, I think it is also beautiful. Some, somebody was mentioning it. Oh, Adrian was mentioning it last night of this question that somebody had asked June Jordan about the different mediums that she worked in and her answer saying, whatever I do, I do it as a poet. And to me, that's important. And it, it resonates with me personally, but it, it says something about that practice. You know, the, the practice of the poet, of being a poet, is what is making everything possible, and it's also the technology for checking in on like really what is that? What is my role? Right? Just asking when it comes to children's literature and everything else, how is it that, that I can be of use over and over again? So to me, that I don't know if that will ever make me consistent or anything like that, but, but um, I think that that's a clue too, also just the actual consistent practice of doing whatever it meant to her to be a poet. I'm gonna ask one more question. <laughs> so I mean, what you just said, Alexis, it really makes me think of uh, Barbara Christian's ideas in the race from theory, right, mm -hmm. about black women writers as constantly engaged in theoretical discourse um, and intervening in theoretical conversations, both through their creative work, right, through their art, and their work in, in multiple genres, right, that may sort of delve into what we think of as sort of academic or scholarly discourse. Um, and there, I mean, so many of the writers that have been involved today fall into some of those categories, right? Robesa Phillip, uh, and Zaki Shange, right? Last night we were talking about Dion Brand, you know, mm -hmm. we're talking about Tony K. Bambara today, right? All of these, these black women writers who are writing in these multiple genres and whose, whose creative work is clearly um, and sort of deliberately and perhaps even disruptively engaged in a kind of theoretical practice. So I'm wondering if that resonates for you all. What does it mean to, as you were saying, to, to make a life sort of across boundaries, right? How can we read that as a subjunctive practice uh, and, a, and a kind of way of making living room for oneself in, you know, in sort of <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I guess something that I'm really interested in, in thinking about is like, um, like the living room that is extended through black feminist literary production um, and the Combined River Collective Statement as an example of that. Um, and I especially feel like it's so resonant right now in our time of like carceral slash white feminism. Um, which, like, has a little long history. Um, and so, uh, 
Yeah, I think like um, the combined river collective of intersectionality speaks to that, but it also holds room um, for the subjunctive practice of um, thinking about a trans politics also. I think the other thing I would say about that is there's a certain, in Barbara Christian's Race for Theory, you have to surrender to the work. And so often there is this idea that there's these theoretical or intellectual frames outside that you can use and apply. Um, when I was uh, working on an earlier project, I contacted Dionne Brand because I wanted to use one of her poems. And initially she was reluctant because I think she thought I said I'm interested in thinking about black women and cultural theory, and I think she felt hesitant as if, what will you do with this work? And it was incumbent upon me, it's incumbent upon anyone who wants to live through the words that black women make to surrender to the work um, and go find yourself there. Audre Lorde tells, told us that. Um, so many people have told us that. And so I think that there's something about I think every black woman maker I've ever encountered is also doing theoretical work. That's why for me, as someone interested in theory, I don't need to go any further than the work. So it looks like we have one question that'll be our last question. <laughs> okay. I wanted to know if, um, Kevin, I know you did, said you didn't have time, if you could talk a little bit about the connection between Harriet Mullen Jordan's work, you kind of, um, you didn't have time to talk about it, so I'm just going to say it. Um, I can, very quickly, um, and I'll just, let me find my text. Um, Mullen has this essay. Thank you for putting me on the spot. <laughs> um, Mullen has this essay that's titled, Imagining the Unimagined Reader. And she just breaks it down in, in this essay. And she starts by saying, I write beyond the range of my voice and the social boundaries of identity, yet within the limits imposed on my work and my imagination by language and its cultural significance. So that's the first thing she says. And then she goes on to talk about, I write for myself and others. And other is anyone who is not me. And this is where I hear an echo with June Jordan's use of stranger, right, uh, in, in the, these poems. And other is anyone who is not me. Anyone who is not me is like me in some ways and unlike me in other ways. And you hear the productive conversation between the filmmakers earlier. Um, I write optimistically for an imagined audience of known and unknown readers. And then she goes on to say, many of my imagined readers have yet to encounter my work. Most of them are not even born yet. Mm. And so there's this radical positioning of imagination. And again, for me, it feels like an expanding of the dominant idea of the way in which we think about black women's work as small. But if you realize that black women are doing the work of the world, through black female experience and black female imagination and come to it to find its intelligence. I think that's part of, I love the way in which she frames this like not even yet, as if like you're not even yet ready for this. So I hear an echo of, and are you ready in June Jordan's um, work. Thank you. Thank you. Let's thank our panelists. down a little bit like I know how it is in church when the spirit comes in and y'all get all fired up and can't can't come down so I'm not gonna need you to help but I
expect me to calm down a little bit so we can move on with the, uh, the program. If you looked at the poster that we sent out and think of it as a pyramid, then you will see that the uh, earlier panels are sitting on the solid rock of the later panel. Right. And that uh, we started at the foundation with June Jordan and Audrey Lord. And then we on top of them we built the Kabahi River Collective. And then all the the young people and everybody young in their fifties younger than me uh, are using the language that was given to them, you know, by this earlier group. You know, language that you think is normal has always been there. Discussions of sexuality is normal now. Discussions of black is normal now. Discussions of the role of women is expected now. That wasn't true 40 years ago. Right? Somebody had to make that the agenda for the academy. And this panel is, is uh, uh, the people that did that. I, uh, as I used to, when we were doing the planning, I'd say, I want the old folks part of the panel. So, well, not that. Uh, but so I'm uh, quite pleased to say that one of the my personal goals for you know honoring June Jordan was in fact to bring back together the Kabahi River Collective. This is their first reunion. who I called first because I said, called Sharon and said, oh, you know, call everybody, we're going to get together and come to your mass. She said, well, I haven't talked to so-and-so in about 30 years. I said, like, whoa, we got, we got to work on this. Uh, and so it, it took a while because unlike other reunions where people are glad to show up and fight their way to be on the program, I had to persuade uh, members of the collective of their importance. They said, why, why, why do you want us to come? I said, you're the most important political entity that black people have put together in the last half of the 20th century. He's like, come on. Yeah. Well, I <laughs> and, and, you know, no, you know, uh, they are. You know, I go to a lot of reunions and we talk about how we got shot at and so forth and so on. Uh, and, uh, well, that's basically what happened. Uh, but nobody wants to do that again. Nobody said, why don't we start that? No, no, we're not doing that no more. Uh, but here you have a, a, a group of women who 40 years ago, uh, not thinking about transforming the world, transformed the world. You know, gave you the language you speak that you think is normal language, everyday language. This is their language in your heads. You don't even know where it came from. You know, they're the ones that gave you the language of, of gender, sexuality, you know importance of black females. And so I thought it would be important uh, to have them you know, in front of you so you can, you can see what you're standing on. You can see the foundation upon which uh, modern day kind of uh, academic life in all areas, in all areas of the academy, you know, black, white, everything else you know, is grounded. You know, and that's what, my, that's what my goal was. And I'm happy that I can be just when they showed up. You know. uh, and Sister Bob, I want to especially uh, thanks because she had had surgery just two weeks ago. No, a week ago. A week ago. <laughs> Last Thursday. Last Thursday. And we, we had the Skype thing all worked out, and we said, okay, she can't, know, she can't get somebody out of the hospital, have to come down and give a talk. So we're going to do the Skype thing. She said, hey, bump the Skype, I'm coming. And so here she is. And, and the other person that, you know, who's going to moderate the panel is uh, Sister Paula Giddies. Yeah. Who, uh, yeah. Who's a, a Smith College teaching the history of black women. Now, believe it or not, I taught the history of black women at Smith College, and they were quite happy. And I said, no, 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 you need a black woman to teach the history of black women at Smith College. And they were very reluctant to think that that was necessary. And they said, well, do you know anybody that can do that? 
<laughs> I said, oh, the kids? I said, oh, okay. So now you have a black woman teaching the history of black women at Smith College. <laughs> no, no, it was a fight because they thought that it was fine to have me tell them about themselves. And I said, y'all don't, y'all ain't getting it. You know, it was like, no, 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 no. Uh, so what you have here is some of the leading, the leading thinkers, you know, in the history of black feminism. Uh, and they will do whatever they want to do because that's what I told them when I told them to come. I said, just come up and sit on the stage and I'll be here. You know, so I'm going to get out the way and let Paula let them do whatever they want to do for as long as they want. And because you owe them. We owe them. Everybody owes them big time. So before they start, one more. Come on, come on. One more. John. Good afternoon. Yeah. Oh, that's what I'd like to hear. <laughs> uh, I am so happy and honored to be the moderator uh, for this panel. I too want to join with all of you to, to thank uh, Mecca for this uh, wonderful conference. To thank John Bracey, the ubiquitous John Bracey, uh, and, the, and the wonderful John Bracey. Um, uh, uh, and so happy to see, you know, uh, these kinds of conferences that attract uh, such brilliant writers like Sonia Sanchez, who's, who's here. And uh, uh, so uh, I'm really pleased to be here on two uh, counts. One, of course, a conference that is uh, dedicated uh, to June Jordan. <coughs> I was just going to say a few words, but, you know, the... Um, Remarks of Dr. Kwashi uh, around writing for children and the remarks also of Paul Lee, who talked about Angela Davis. Um, we, uh, I'm the editor also of Meridians, uh, Feminism, Race, Transnationalism, and we actually um, memorialized uh, June in 2003, uh, soon after her passing. And uh, one of the people who wrote an essay for us was Angela Davis about you. And I'd just like to read one paragraph, uh, really a few sentences that she wrote in a longer essay, but I think it's really apropos to what we've heard today. She said, I know of no one else who was always so fully present in everything she did. As I once told her, the first time I spoke to her by telephone to arrange our first meeting, I did not know I was speaking to an adult until she identified herself as June Jordan. It certainly was not a lack of maturity in her voice that made me think I was talking to a child. Rather, it was a sense that she was holding nothing back. She made everyone she liked, and some she didn't like, to feel as if she was offering them everything she had, because she honed the discipline of reinventing so much of her life and so much of the life of the world. Um, June Jordan was the writer who made me, the black woman writer who made me really imagine being as she was, a citizen of the globe. Uh, and, uh, and who lived uh, in, in, in that way. Uh, and I think it's also, uh, um, we were just doing, uh, with Meridians, we were just getting some statistics uh, together. And uh, June Jordan's essay, A Report from the Bahamas, mm -hmm. uh, 1982, was reprinted in the same memorial uh, edition. And the first three quarters of 2015, uh, that essay, published in 2003, got 800 views, just in the three quarters of 2015. And of course, our readership is very much an international one. 
uh, with, from uh, readers of 43 countries and of course all the 50 states and the 10 provinces of Canada and also Iran and, and, and China. So she is truly uh, an international figure with that kind of, with a sense of, with a, a, a black woman in the world. Um, <clears throat> the second reason, of course, why I'm so honored is this panel. I mean, uh, we are in the midst of royalty, everybody. <laughs> uh, I, I am just going to mention just a few bullet points uh, because first of all, I know I'm talking to the choir. Uh, and secondly, I want to leave uh, time uh, for um, our uh, panelists. And also, I want, and I'm sure you will on the, on the, on the panel here, correct, correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, there's, there's interesting, uh, there's some different um, historical facts and different uh, citations. So, uh, but let me just say just a few points. The collective, the comedy collective, began in 1974 as the Boston chapter of the National Black Feminist Organization, <coughs> excuse me, founded in 1973. Their iconic a Black Feminist Statement of 1977, and this statement is in your packets, uh, written by Barbara Smith, Beverly Smith, and Demita Frazier, uh, documented their activities and articulated their philosophy. Um, just as John was saying, just as, in fact, in e emails going back and forth between us, you know, Margot wrote to me and she said, you know, we did not approach our ways of being, our work, <clears throat> and our ideas as something that would be a part of the historical record. We were just trying to understand ourselves, our respective settings, and all the forces that shape both. Well, what they were doing in that attempt was nothing less than a manifesto that marked the contemporary evolution of black feminism. That talked about intersection before it was codified, that talked about simultaneous oppressions, uh, that was a founding document of post-war feminism, that profoundly, as John also alluded to, profoundly transformed women's studies and black studies, and thus liberal arts in the American Academy. Mm -hmm. Why is it <clears throat> among the most influential texts uh, of black feminism? Uh, because it was one of the first to talk about eradicating homophobia, one of the first to, in the 20th century certainly, to acknowledge the role of black queer women in development of black feminism, both in terms of ideology and practice. This practice of, this process of giving voice showed us that knowledge is grounded in lived experience. Uh, these are all things we take for granted now. Uh, and that the most profound and radical politics come directly out of our own identities. The idea that, and I quote from this statement, black women are inherently valuable, that our liberation is a necessity, not as an adjunct to any, somebody else's, but because of the need <coughs> of human persons for autonomy. <coughs> this was a statement of course personal redemption, but it also launched uh, thousands of texts uh, including when and where I enter, that perspective uh, uh, that uh, we heard from this uh, collective. Um, what we will uh, do uh, for, the, for the panel is everyone is going to speak for five minutes first, and then conversations among themselves or and or I may ask questions. The panelists, and this is just so fitting, this is who they are, they, all, they beg you, please don't read bios. <laughs> please don't honor them, the bios are in your, your, your uh, books there. Um, uh, uh, and um, uh, uh, 
we uh, will then uh, also break in time for uh, for Q and A for the last uh, half hour or so. So with that, let us start uh, with Margot. And please, so please identify yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> you do it. Uh, and let's start. intro. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Paula, for a wonderful intro, and to uh, all the organizers. And I also want to especially name Trisha Loveland, who, Loveland, who has not been mentioned yet by name. She's been the person in charge of all the logistics and getting us the emails and all that stuff. So, Trisha, thank you to you and your crew. Where are you? Hello. Okay. Um, and then I just want to tell a quick story. This is not part of my five minutes. Um, is that I was talking to a woman named Rochelle Allen, who manages this, this whole hotel. And she said to me, you know, that's an amazing event downstairs. She said, I went to one of the sessions and I just was so moved. I've been here 21 years and that kind, this kind of thing doesn't happen often. And we need more of it. So all of you at UMass, it's all on you. We need more of these. So just the voice from outside this room. And just two rhetorical questions. One is, Paula mentioned uh, speaking to the choir. What do you think the non-choir members, non-members of the choir, how would they react to what we're saying here? What would be their reactions? Then the second question is, and you can just write this, or make a mental note, is what are you feeling, what are you hearing from the deepest parts of who you are throughout the day? So I'm gonna, my talk, now this is five minutes. Uh, reflections, my reflections of the Combahee River Collective. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about intersectionality and then I wanna connect both to the work of uh, June Jordan, one of my heroes. So um, you all, you know, clap for us and everything. And I would say that it's you all who have made Combahee River Collective what it is. And in a sense, it's been an intergenerational project, right? We talk a lot about that now. But it's been a really organic intergenerational project that um, has been made possible by students, faculty, you know, everybody who took, who loved us, Right? That is our ideas, our ideology, our perspectives, our analysis, and our vision. And so really, I think it's our job to thank you all, because I think in a way, you have made us what you think we are. <laughs> um, and that is not to say that there's no seriousness in the statement, obviously, or the, serious in the seriousness in the work we did. Um, and all of us have you know, we were really decentralized. All of us worked in different arenas. The other thing is, um, it is absolutely about black feminism and black feminists. Um, the other thing I'm really happy for is that at the time we did the work and the, the statement came out, we had print media, right? Imagine if they had gone out on Twitter. First of all, too many words. Um, and then all these other things is just too fleeting, right? And so I think we really do need to take seriously the power of print medium, right? As, as, as something that's necessary um, and that people can reach back to. Um, so the other thing is about just a reflection is that yes, this is a reunion, but in my humble opinion, this is also a moment of redemption for our membership and people uh, who, you know, we've kind of been together with. You know, we've been, it's 40 years, right? And I think all of us have changed in some way, maybe might not have even liked us at some point, um, because we all had some raggedy edges, right? And I think, because I think we stuck with our politics and we grew our politics, I think 
um, has enabled us to be together on this on this stage. Um, and so it's you know it's it's a moment of it's a reunion and it's a moment of redemption. And I'm really moved by that. I know you wouldn't have liked me very much back then in some ways. Um, so intersectionality, right? Um, we did um, talk about intersectionality. We didn't use that word. And I want to reclaim that. And now I've started saying critical intersectionality because intersectionality has kind of gotten reduced to multiple identities and everybody's everything. Um, and I would say that the way we talk, the way we understood intersectionality is absolutely it's about identities and um, that identities are political, right? But it's also about the material conditions, it's about movements, it's about structural inequalities um, that resulted in deep, deep, deep material results, right? Um, that it was not only about oppression, but it was also about privilege, right? And I think that's sort of gotten lost there. Um, and finally, it was also a deep critique of capitalism, a challenge to capitalism and anti-imperialism. And I think some of those other things have kind of slipped off the edge. And then how does this um, relate to uh, June, June Jordan's work? Well, you know, the, the classic article uh, report from the Bahamas just in the most poetic way talks about race, class, gender, nation, right? And what I appreciate about June's work is that she absolutely lifted up the category of nation, right? So that um, nation in her work and uh, in our work is central to the concept of intersectionality. Well, what does that mean? Um, uh, it, it, her work included talking about other countries, you know, what's happening in Nicaragua, etc. right? But for me, one of the most important things, and I get this from doing a work outside the country, a lot of it, is that she really raised for us the question of what it means to be connected to the United States and the kind of responsibility that we have to take considering so many things are done in, quote, our name, right? And how do we challenge that? The other side of it is, how do we challenge the ways in which we think blackness, right? Uh, the U.S. kind of blackness is a universal blackness, for example. Do you remember watching the uh, Academy Awards? And there was one segment where, I can't remember who was doing it, but there was the map of, the continent of Africa, and then Compton was right in the middle of it. I was with an African person, and she's like, "What?" <laughs> like, you know. So, you know, thinking about part of you know being connected to the U.S. is also progressive people being connected to the U.S., black people being connected to the U.S. is how do our constructions of race, how well do they carry? Should they even carry across to the continent? Right? Um, or do we need to be thinking about um, uh, what theories carry and what theories don't carry and shouldn't be carried? So it's a kind of a, a critical reflection about that. Um, the other thing is she talked about Palestine. She talked about it a lot. She talked about it more than many people we know. Um, and. Um, she did it at a time when it wasn't really, it's not good now, but it's a little bit better now than it was back then when she was talking about Palestine and encouraging us to make the connection. Um, and so um, I just wanna just show a couple of things, because I forgot to do it. Uh, where's my thing? So this is kind of about, and I'm almost done, I'm trying to stay in my five minutes. Okay, oh, oh, get ready. <laughs> well, so this is our first retreat site. The Welfare, Welfley Hotel, you know, down there in Welfley. That little hotel. Yes, it was. And I think we, we had one room and all of us bunched up in one room. We did. Yes, we did. 
Okay, so one of the big questions was Siena or Combahee River? Some, but Helen said we should name ourselves Siena. And Barbara Smith said, what? <laughs> Imagine if we had been named Siena. Do you think we would be having this reunion? Okay. And so we became the Combahee River Collective. And then this was our our picture, there's Barbara, Beverly, Shereen, Benita, Helen, Margo, Mercedes, Margo Sharon, <laughs> uh, 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 and Sharon, who's taking the, the photograph, right? So this is kind of the beginning, and I'm, I'm selling them for $100, <laughs> because I know some organization needs, uh, needs money. Okay. Uh, so anyway, um, the last couple of things I want to say about going back to June, because I forgot this before, is that June was all about making connections, right? Um, the connection to what it means to be a U.S. Yes, I did know it was the money I earned as a poet that paid for the bombs and the planes and the tanks that they used to massacre your family. Born a black woman, but now I'm become Palestinian. And finally, I think even here and even now, I must make the connection real between me and these strangers everywhere before those other clouds unified this ragged bunch of us too late. And that was toward the end of the report from the Bahamas when she's talking about making a connection with all the people on the plane, most of whom were white. And I just want to say that um, I worked on this book called The Palestinian Model Parliament toward legislation based on Palestinian identity, progressive ideals, and just content. And the book ends with her quote about, we are the ones we've been waiting for. So if anybody wants a copy, let me know. Thank you so much. <laughs> because I feel overwhelmed. This is an extremely momentous day that we put together. And Alexis and I were having a conversation two years ago, and I kept saying, Alexis, I said, Alexis, I want to have a conference that brings together current feminists, older feminists, we have an intergenerational conversation, of the confluence of the river and the sea meeting, and how that regenerates and creates, you know all that? And, and she said, look, manifestation can happen. So it's really exciting to be here as a part standing in the stream. And I really do feel that humbly that we are representatives of a long line of black women. We stand where we stand, and you all stand where you do, but we are part of a much larger, longer, powerful stream. I'm going to keep my comments to five minutes because I'm going to talk about the personal dimensions and talk about some of my personal memories of Combahee and how we formed. It's just unbelievable to me that you're sitting here looking at Sharon Page Ritchie, who I met in Chicago Lesbian Liberation in 1971, and we first began having conversations about, you know, black feminism. We're feminists. We know we are. We're lesbians. We know we are. We, why can't we talk about these issues? And in fact, we had just come out of, at least I know I had, come out of a period of extreme frustration and anger at trying to continually, trying to place myself in the center of progressive black movements, Black Panther Party. I didn't stray to the black nationalists because I was like, no. <laughs> Theoretically, feeling good. The people I was encountering, not so much. <laughs> so I had come as a political, a, a, a precocious, political teenager really searching for what I realized even at 16 was understanding power. Where did I fit in the world? I was going to define myself and I was not going to be defined by other people. And that was true of everybody, no matter what color they were, the gender, I just wanted to be self-defining. But I also wanted to make my contribution. Oftentimes when we talk about how we contribute as community members, 
oftentimes I found in my experience, people were talking about people who were from upper classes, you know, contributing, people from the upper classes, people who were educated, and I kept thinking about and not on the bone of, there are so many of us who are not that. There are so many of us who are regular people struggling day in and day out. How do we make the conversation happen between the academy and the street? How do we make that connection real? And it goes to some larger issues that we struggle with in the African American community around how we deal with class, how we deal with levels of achievement, how we deal with all the privileges, whether they be light skin privileges, dark skin privileges, you name it, privileges that we're struggling with in our communities, again, with the notion of getting us to a place where we can have autonomy and be free to live our lives lovingly, freely, fully. Sharon and I had a meeting. Sharon called a meeting at her house. She was making cocoa bath. I remember the, the details are also that to me. But the thing that was really telling about that first meeting of a group of six young black women were that we found ourselves telling each other's stories. And when you talk about the political being personal, it's personal in service to greater analysis and understanding. Not personal just because I need to be able to feel better having told my story. That's important because being able to tell these tales, of which many of them are harrowing, stories of survival within our families, within our communities, stories of our frustrations and attempts to make manifest the political power we know we have within us, instead of being stopped constantly by misogyny, being stopped constantly by, dare we say it, anti-black womanness. And I remember we had this meeting, it was hysterical because one of the most important things that happened at this meeting is a woman came up with a story about how she and her eight-year-old sister were trying to figure out how to kill their abusive and abusing stepfather. And they figured out a really cool story because they thought if they put two knives in the bed next to him, he might roll over on them and then stab himself. That didn't work. They didn't really understand how that worked. But what was most telling was it was the first time I'd had a conversation with somebody else about, sec about internal domestic violence. And it brought back memories of my own experience of that as a child. Telling those stories which should not be told outside of a house, right? Telling those tales and centering our concerns for our own survival in those stories. Critical. We had this meeting, we went on about our merry ways, and finally I moved to Boston, Sharon moved to California, and Margaret Sloan, mm -hmm. who was a mutual friend of ours and a fellow traveler, Margaret had put together with a group of other black women. And does anyone know the name Margaret Sloan, by the way? Some of us here, Margaret Sloan was a critical black feminist thinker and speaker who traveled with Gloria Steinem from 1970 until I think about 1974. Um, critical thinker. She had decided, along with some other women, to put together an organization called the Black National Black Feminist Organization. And from the very beginning, I was concerned because when you start using words like national, and it's 12 people in a small room, you know, with zero <laughs> machine, um, Margaret said, don't worry about it, it'll all be fine in the end. <laughs> Big presence. But the most important thing about the at that early meeting was it began, it surfaced immediately the fractures and differences amongst us. And that was important to remember because when I remember the day that we had the conversation, Barbara, we talked about the fact that this NBFO thing, I don't know. They're not radical, they don't have an they don't have an economic analysis. I don't know. Barbara's eyes were glinting already at that point. Because I could already see the idea of forming of, well, then we don't really need that. Let's do something on our own. Let's start something of our own, which is what we did. One of the things I'll say also about um, our struggles, and this was within our group and also came up over the life of Kambihi and the black feminist <laughs> retreats that we had, is again, we're talking about each person struggling for self-definition to find that power that will make you a useful tool to the larger community. And I'll never forget a woman coming to me at one of the retreats and saying, what does it mean if I'm not a writer? Can I still be a part of this group? And of course, that threw me deep into a moment of, wait a minute, aren't we supposed to be about all black women doing all marvelous and wonderful things? And writers are critical. I'm a bibliomaniac, certifiable. 
and always will be. But there are so many ways to communicate and so many ways in which we want to connect with one another as black women. How can we leave out people who feel that there's no place for them if they're not a writer? That's not good. There were other things also that I want to say that we touched but didn't go deep on because we were in the middle of creating a new world. So I would always think we could have written an entire book about how we dealt with, how privilege is dealt with amongst us in our own community. How class as an issue impacts the way we're able to organize even as we sit here today. I remember sitting and thinking when I got the invitation for the event, which of course makes sense, it's academia on a Friday. And I was thinking, well that means that people who have jobs, the five of them, won't be able to attend this event because they have to be at work. It brings it up again. How do we make ourselves connected beyond the venues that we typically work in? I think my five minutes is almost up, is that right? Okay, good. I'll just finish by saying this. My, the, the, the point of comedy and the point of this work, and to bring this to June, June was one of my favorite poets of the era because she dealt with ambiguity, with conflict, and with paradox. And she did not always operate from a sense of certainty, certainty and complete, except when it related to freedom and related to having access to all the parts of the set. So um, I would just say that one of the things that was really touching to realize about June and to realize about this event is that even poetry, even poetry is not widely held. And I think about all the people who will be listening to and watching this and wonder, I hope they get inspired to go and look up June Jordan and read about June Jordan, but when you think about it, where does poetry live in the lives of everyday people? How do we make the, the, the incredible beauty and the messages and the energy come alive for everyone? Still struggling for freedom, still intent upon making it happen during my lifetime, never gonna change. Thank you. Demita Frazier, in case you didn't hear her and not see her name. Um, <laughs> my name is Sharon Page Ritchie. And I was one of the participants in the retreats who did not live in Boston. I was not part of the Boston core, uh, but I was there for, I think, almost all of the retreats. There might have been one. I moved to California, having had enough of Chicago's winters. I moved to California in 1980, and so it's possible. I, my memory is not what it should be. Um, it's possible there was one after that, but maybe I went to all of them. Um, so I want to talk about the experience of the retreats. Um, I grew up in Chicago in an extremely segregated city, which Boston also was an extremely segregated city. And continues to be. And continues to be. Um, one of the things that, I, when I talk to younger people, when we have a time where, you know, Ellen is on TV and we're all, you know, we can get married and we can be, you know, leaders in the military and all these other things, I want people to understand how dangerous it was to be a lesbian in the 1970s. When I came out as a young lesbian in Chicago Lesbian Liberation, um, where we met in the top floor of a tiny little house um, where the gay men let us meet upstairs in the heat of the summer, you know, a hundred lesbians crammed into a tiny little room. Um, when I came out into that community, I met women who were 10 or 15 or 20 years older than me who had been beaten up, you know, locked up, um, lost their jobs, estranged from their families, who had really suffered a lot of horrible violence for being who they were. This was, you know, women who had suffered from McCarthyism. We had it easy. Um, 
But we still had, it, it was not an easy thing to be a lesbian in those days. We were very much outlaws. It's not that way anymore. And I think this is one of the things about the intergenerational conversation. It's important to remember the things that we take for granted, the things that I took for granted as a 20-year-old were not the experience of the 40-year-olds who I met then. And likewise, you know, the things that I'm, that I, you know, the things you can take for granted are not the things I was able to take for granted at your age. So just to remember, things do change. Um, coming out in Chicago in a very segregated city, I met in this outlaw space women from other neighborhoods, women of other races, women of other cultures who I was never supposed to meet. And we had conversations that we were never supposed to be having. So it was really a, a place of transformation. Um, coming to the Combahee River Collective retreats, I think there was an, a very expansive notion of what it meant to be black. Um, we had a lot of, you know, there were people that I never met. You know, I, I never met, you know, a black woman whose last name was Okazawa Ray. I, I never met, you know, a black woman whose last name was Alfonso. Um, so we had a very, you know, I never met a black woman who had come from the West Indies. Um, so it was a very expansive definition and interrogation, really, of what does it mean to be black? What is black? in the United States. Um, so, you know, talking about the internationalism, um, that was one of the questions that we talked about. And I think the whole question of the different levels of privilege and what, you know, how do we negotiate all those kinds of privilege, the educational privilege, um, the national privilege, the class privilege, the economic privilege, the skin color privilege, all of these different things, we talked about all of them and we're trying to figure them all out. I think we had a sense that we were doing something important. I don't think that we had a sense that we would be historical figures in our 60s, <laughs> and yet here we are. Um, speaking about the, the question of um, writers, there were some incredible writers in that group and I want to take a moment to call the names of some of the people, the, some of the women who are not with us, um, some who are somewhere out in the world doing whatever they're doing and, you know, I haven't been in touch with them but maybe somebody else has, and some who have gone on and uh, are now in the, with the ancestors. Um, of course, Audre Lorde is one of those women, um, an incredible influence, um, and certainly, you know, a colleague of June Jordan's. Linda C. Powell, um, one of our homegirls from Chicago, um, a phenomenal singer and just a beautiful spirit. Um, there are, you know, some of the women we've talked about who I haven't heard from in years, Phyllis Bethel, Lorraine Bethel, Ceci Alfonso, um, Demita mentioned some of the names to me earlier, but I, so I want to make sure to, to name some of those people. Um, as somebody who was not a writer, I mean, I could write, but you know, I'm not a writer. Um, I felt like it was my job. Somebody earlier talked about the idea of cutting off the body at the neck. I'm a dancer, and that's one of the things that Demita and I had in common. And I felt like my particular work in the retreats was to bring uh, the body into the, into the retreats. So I did um, one of my very first dance performances at one of the retreats. Um, I was tremulous about it. It was a new thing for me to be performing my own work in this kind of a setting. And my audience was dead silent completely silent. Um, they eventually gave me a wonderful applause and response, but it was really kind of unnerving to be there dancing for them and they're like. <laughs> so, um, but you know, I've, I've made it a point to come and, and do 
movement and to offer some, you know, exercise and yoga kinds of things and some more physical things to help people kind of get up out of their writing chairs and move around. Um, depending on my time, I may ask you to do that. Um, and, and I would also say, I, I have just a couple of um, other thoughts here. Um, another kind of a physical piece was, uh, Tamita talked about the um, Copa Ben. We had incredible food. Um, and I, that's important. You know, this is the United States of America. We as a nation have a really crappy diet. We made a point to have incredible food. We talked about food. Demita is an amazing cook. We talked about food. We talked about nutrition. We talked about farming. We talked about how coffee, tea, cocoa appeared in the world um, economy as we were going through the Industrial Revolution. So people could have a little coffee, have a little sugar, have a little chocolate, have a little tea, keep working. So what are the connections between what we eat and the work that we do and where the income and the resources go? So we talked about all of those kind of connections. And I think, you know, we're, we didn't continue for many, many years as a single group, but we've been following these threads. I mean, Tamita is still working now on food and, you know, nutrition issues. So uh, there was a lot going on. It was, it was political theorizing and it was also multi-leveled and multi-layered. Um, I think the one other thing that I would want to mention um, is the idea of socially constructed knowledge. Um, what we were doing was we were asking all of these questions of each other. Um, we were trying to figure things out, and, and I think this is one of those examples of how knowledge is constructed by people coming together to ask the questions, um, to resolve, or not even to resolve, but to ask the questions and to kind of figure out what the questions are and which direction to look in for the answers. Um, I think that is probably everything in my, um, oh, we did have parties too. Um, we had a lot of serious discussions and then we had a lot of dancing and, you know, we hung out, we partied, we flirted, we, you know, fooled around. There was a lot of stuff going on. It was a very <laughs> multi layer <laughs> There are documents. <laughs> so I won't go into the details, but I just want to say it was a multi-layered experience. <laughs> and I think that's all I have for you. <laughs> I love chocolate chip cookies and sweet potato pie. I can tell you honestly, say, I almost made it. Too many sweet potato pie to bring to Yeah, don't get all excited. I was going to be fun. I'm joking. But yes, food. After Akasha Hall, after this um, segment where we go through our five minutes each, uh, I'm going to, at some point, get up and just run us through a series of photographs. I kept uh, a scrapbook for all seven of the retreats, and I got an artist photographer to clean them up and digitize some of them. And so, and what made me say that right now is uh, Sharon and Demita talking about what happened there. So you will see some of that. So I'll just run through, through them and I hope that after we all go through and whatever we do, Paula has our next round or whatever, that I'll be able to do that. Okay, so for now, my five, five minutes. As you all were responding to us taking our places up here, 
Uh, I got choked up a little bit. I said, these people are gonna make me cry. And um, I thought to myself, uh, and I've heard people here say, that we helped you become who you became and do what you did. That in some way, what we were able to do was transformative. What that made me realize is that if that were indeed true, I think it is primarily because what we were doing transformed us. Uh, one of the things that Demita used to say is that, hey girls, uh, this is a mixed cake. This is, not, this is not a mixed cake. Like it didn't come out of a box. We're making this up from scratch. So we were making ourselves up. We were transforming ourselves with the idea of transforming the world. So to whatever extent that worked, I think it came full circle in what you were giving back to us. And it was both humbling and gratifying. And so I'm just really happy to be here. Uh, I'm going to uh, pick up on one of the things that John Gracie suggested that we do and talk about how we became associated with the Cumbahee River Collective. Um, like Sharon, I lived in Delaware at the time, my first academic job at the University of Delaware, and so was not a part of the core group, but came to all six out of the seven of the retreats. But my association began in December of 1974, which was right smack dab in the middle of my Saturn return. <laughs> my Saturn cycle at an MLA meeting, walking the uh, corridors. Oh, the Modern Language Association, which is the largest professional association in this country of uh, teachers of English, college, university, some high school. And they have this big annual convention every year during the Christmas holidays. So we're walking around. Oh, and the program for the convention is about as large as phone books of uh, middling sized cities. So we were walking around at the MLA convention looking for sessions that we wanted to go to that had something to do with African-American writing, black women's writing, us, our work, our nothing, looking for other people like us. And Barbara and I ran, in, Barbara and I ran into each other on the hall. And that began my association with all of this. Uh, uh, we ended up, Barbara Beverly and I went and had food at an Afro-Cuba restaurant and we talked. We were in New York City. Yes, we were in New York City and just talked endlessly. And so it was through that and talking about black women writers, why was uh, Zerna Hurston's Their Eyes Were Watching God out of print. We were uh, photocopying it just so that we could have it in classes. And so that was the context. We were, we were wanting to do that work and we were doing that work and I had begun uh, writing about uh, black women poets. The first essay I published, Black Women Poets from Wheatley to Walker, that was the beginning. So we were just beginning to do about that. But, so, um, what I'm trying to say is for me, this work and this work with these women was life changing. It came at that particular time and it was trans transformative. Um, what, so I got invited to the first retreat, which was July of 1977. And from that point on was a steady part of everything that happened. But what really, some things that were pivotal and very key for me from, from the association was the concept of work and life work and doing one's work in the world. And that goes back a lot to Audre Lorde. You know, when she made her statement, I'm a black, lesbian, woman, warrior, poet, doing my work in the world, 
are you doing yours? Mm -hmm. Chills, mm -hmm. you know, and just that, that concept. And so we took it very, very seriously. What is my purpose? What am I here to do? And our purpose was to do all of what we said we were trying to do around saving the lives of black women. You know, starting with ourselves, knowing ourselves, and moving out uh, from that. And so it also became not just what you did. It wasn't just movement organizing, or it wasn't just publishing. It was like it was a spiritual calling. You know, it was an imperative, you know. And I think that sense of everything helped to fuel the purposefulness, the seriousness, the, the uh, just the passion, just everything that we were trying to do. Uh, and uh, I, I, I think about Audrey, I, did, I, I, I called her name, but, um, and so much of it, so much of what we did stayed with me, just in, indelible. Um, I'm thinking about a little moment uh, with Audrey where we were uh, at a retreat and she says, I, I'm, I'm a writer, and she says, Gloria, I was Gloria then, um, uh, you have your work with you? And I said, no, I never. She looked at me and she said, oh, but you must always carry your work with you. You're a writer, that's what you do. So that kind of naming of who we are, that kind of series, is that kind of, so it's so funny how things stick. I'm traveling to this particular meeting, doing it with just my uh, a handbag and a backpack because I don't want to miss my flight to Bradley waiting for gate check bag, so everything I have is in a backpack, and it's heavy enough, but I'm starting to walk out of the door, and I hear Audrey's voice, and I go back and pick up the copy of my latest book, Nisi, and stick in my backpack because I can't not, I have to leave that. But for me, what being a part of the Community River Collective did, uh, number one, it helped to break isolation which was such an issue, we used to talk about that at the retreats. Um, I was the only black person, black woman, in my department. I was trying to write about African-American women, African-American women's literature. I was trying to do black the work on black women writers just by myself. So to connect with Barbara, to connect with all of us, that was important. But even beyond just that connection being important, it was important that it took it beyond the academy. Because I truly do not believe that what I produced would have been as important, as incisive, as meaningful, as useful, had it not emerged out of the chrysalis of all of the differences that we were and out of all of the concerns that we had. You know, because it taught me that I'm just not writing a piece for my career or to add to my CV or, you know, to prove to the people in the department that I can get it published in a journal or anything. I'm writing because the purpose of being here, this goes back to spiritual calling, uh, work in the world, is to try to transform the world. We want to make it a better place for all of us to live in. And, you know, and to do that, it, it, was, a, it was a thing about how, what are the tools? How, how do we do that? And it led into all kinds of things that had to do with, you know what? You are allowed in your article to say I. <laughs> you, know, you are allowed to express yourself passionately. You are allowed to throw in a little poetry. You are allowed to do all of that. So for me, the lasting legacy of it is I think I, it, it, uh, being a part of this collective helped me to find my voice and my passion and to develop that 
and to do the work that really has become and did become my life work. And for that, I mean, nothing beats it. it was, I'm just eternally grateful and humbled uh, for that. So I think I'll end with that as my five minutes. And I just want to make sure that uh, at some point I can show the, show, show the images. Thank you. Thank you. My life seems to be an increasing revelation of the intimate face of universal struggle. You begin with your family and the kids on the block, and next you open your eyes to what you call your people, and that leads you into land reform, into black English, in Angola, leads you back to your own bed where you lie by yourself, wondering if you deserve to be peaceful, or trusted, or desired, or left to the freedom of your own unfaltering heart. And that is 1980, from the forward to civil war next one is, in this world, it is dangerous, very dangerous to be female. And that's from Notes Toward a Model of Resistance. Once again, let me thank you all for honoring us and welcoming us and um, staying here to hear us. Uh, I'm honored to be on this panel with women I have known <coughs> since the 70s. One, like Paula Giddings, whom I've known since 1965. Uh, I believe that June Jordan's legacy is as alive in Black Lives Matter as Kambahi is alive and Black Lives Matter and all the rest of us who are still working out of a radical black queer polity. So I still like to say I am a Manish Dyke muff diver wool dagger butch feminist family. <laughs> of our politics makes us concerned with any situation that impinges upon the lives of women, third world and working people. We are, of course, particularly committed to working on the struggles in which race, sex, and class are simultaneous factors of oppression. Uh, I would probably still be stuck in Highland Park, New Jersey, had I not met Barbara Smith at the Social Feminist Conference in Yellow Springs, Ohio, in 1975. You wouldn't have been laughing if you had been there. <laughs> Were you there? Oh, no. Miss <laughs> Barbara was just a representative of yes. us. Uh -huh. yeah. Well, 
I ran into Barbara in a similar way that Akasha ran into Barbara at the MLA. Um, you know, we were wandering around. We had just been to this meeting where uh, homosexuals were being bashed, and Barbara came out and wiped her head. <laughs> and I said, I've never heard of homophobia like this. And she said, neither have I. And I said, are you gay? <laughs> she said, yes. So um, that's how we met. And um, after that, uh, I, don't, I think it must have been 1978, uh, she invited me and uh, a friend of mine from New Jersey, lived in New Jersey, you know, I still live in New Jersey, um, to a black feminist retreat. Somebody had a That was the first one. The, the picture, uh, is my mic on? Yes. The picture that uh, Margot had was of us within the Boston-based collective retreat that we had. So the thing is, in 77, we started having retreats to try to connect black feminists up and down the East Coast and also with representation from Chicago and eventually California. So I, you know, I was under the impression, I was under the impression uh, that I was attending a black feminist retreat. Um, well, which I was. Uh, I, I, I didn't think that I had become a member of the Comedy River Club. Y'all were laughing. But anyway. Um, but I first encountered uh, the Black Feminist Statement by the Comedy River Collective at the second first retreat in New Haven or South Haven, South, South, South Haven, Haven. Uh, as it was about to be published in Eisenstein's Capitalist Patriarch. Mm -hmm. And the case for socialist feminism. And the case for socialist <laughs> feminism. Yes. Yeah. Uh, she, she had to put that in the second edition of uh, Capitalist Patriarchy in case of social feminism. Uh, Barbara read it to all of us assembled there. Uh, and then soon after, as we all know, it went viral in many black feminists, women of color, and women's studies texts, including Conditions, Five, the Black Women's Issues. The black Women's Issues. No, it was not. But it was in home. It was in uh, a break. Why, why are we doing this? <laughs> I just, I just want, okay. It was in it was a brave and it was in homegirls. It was in some of us are brave, homegirls, this bridge called my back. It was. And many other texts after that. Um, I even taught it as literature in 2004 in a civil rights course I co-taught at Rutgers. Um, and uh, the experience in the Black Feminist Retreat and the experience of Black Feminism, uh, very similar to uh, Akasha's experience, uh, confirmed me in my uh, desire to study Black women texts, uh, but, and it also helped me or conditioned me to being involved in the Conditions Editorial Collective for nine years, uh, New York Women Against Rape for a number of years, New Jersey Women in AIDS Network, which was the first organization in New Jersey to be a resource Organization for Women with AIDS, um, 
uh, and the Center for Lesbian and Gay Studies and the Estrella Lesbian Action Foundation. Um, this paper was going to put June Jordan and Audrey Lord in conversation, but um, I sort of backed down from that. Uh, both wrote numerous poems and articles against police violence in black communities throughout their lives, especially June, whose gift uh, to us as a writer was uh, her journalistic approach up until she died. Um, she claimed to be willing to lay her life on the line, taking on all comers, especially those who threaten the powerless, uh, that is, women, children, Nicaraguans, Palestinians, South African freedom fighters, young black teenage women below the poverty level. Um, when she began to teach at City College, she formed uh, relationships with Others who were teaching there, like Tony K. Bambara, Audre Lorde, Adrian Rich, Barbara Christian. Uh, she said that Tony K. Bambara walked with me to my first class. Are you nervous? She asked. I laughed nervously. <laughs> Anything you have to give, just give it to them, Tony said. They'll be great. Um, just to stay with the two of them for a while, um, Jordan and Lord were emboldened by the Combahee River Collective Statement. We can see its influence on uh, Jordan in, well, at least one passage from Where is the Love, quote, as a black woman, as a black feminist, I exist simultaneously as part of the powerless and as part of the majority peoples of the world. Lord gave us one of the early theorizings on what he came to call intersectionality in her famous poem, who said it was simple in 1973, quote, but I, who am bound by my mirror as well as my bed, see causes in color as well as sex, and sit here wondering which me will survive all these liberations. Now, I met uh, June uh, and Audrey when I was working on the Political Defense Committee for Asada Shakur in New Jersey. Uh, I don't have to go into who Asada is. Say, the one sweet sister, hands off of Sada Shakur. Um, <laughs> she was involved, she, she even gave a, a reading at Woman Books for Asada, and a thousand women people came. Um, but my sharpest memory of June Jordan is as she stood the, stand, the storm at Howard University with Barb Smith in 1978. That's why it was important for me to get those dates because I was really trying to get the, those dates uh, straightened out because uh, whatever. Um, you know, it's better to get your dates straightened out than to try to look back and do it by what love are you doing. <laughs> Still um, but as, as June and Barbara stood the storm at Howard University in 1978, when uh, Barbara asserted that the making of a black feminist criticism had much to do with lesbianism. 
And this experience links, this historic experience links a number of us who are here. Um, when she opened the session, June said to the audience that it was like 500 people, you know, Crampton. Crampton Auditorium. No um, she said uh, that she had been raped. And that was one of the reasons why feminism was so important to her. And um, I wrote about this incident in my book, After Mecca. I'm just going to read a little. June Jordan writes about this conference in her book of essays, Civil Wars. In her introductory remarks, she went out on a limb of her own. She told the audience that she had been raped during the previous fall, and on that very basis understood why she needed feminism. Howard's Crampton Auditorium, which held at least 500 people, was filled to capacity. Audrey Lord was in the audience along with seven or eight other lesbians, including me, who had come to see and support Smith and Jordan. The emphatic hostility astounded both Smith and Jordan in the midst of the lecture, uh, in the midst of the lecture, Jordan and Smith continued to field all the questions, comments, sermons, and rantings. <laughs> Many people stayed to talk and argue through the vexed questions of sexuality and lesbian identity with Smith, Jordan, and Smith's lesbian supporters. Um, while she was defining feminism to her audience in her introductory remarks, uh, June said, when I speak of black feminism, then I am not speaking of sexuality. I am not speaking of heterosexuality, or lesbianism, or homosexuality, or bisexuality. Whatever sexuality anyone elects for his or her pursuit is not my business, nor the business of the state. I'm not talking about sexuality. I'm talking about love a love that can only derive from a secure and positive self-love. He thinks thou dost protest too much, but anyway, I'll go on. Well, I still find this statement problematic and a little insulting. I'm sorry. Let me just remember, I knew this was going to happen. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I just wanted to give examples of June's sense of humor, but I'll just wrap up. Um, with uh, another statement from Kambahi. As black feminists and lesbians, we know that we have a very definite revolutionary task to perform, and we are ready for the lifetime of work and struggle before us. And June completes our circle in her article about the LA riot after the not guilty verdict in the case of Rodney King in 1982. And as the graffiti proclaimed on the long wall still standing after the flames gutted an L.A. bank. La revolution is la solution. Good afternoon, sisters and brothers. Uh, my name is Barbara Smith. Um, this is a wonderful experience for me. I didn't think I would be able to join you in person, given that I did actually have surgery last Thursday, March 17th. Uh, great woman surgeon, 
laparoscopy, that's the way to go, if you can. Um, I want to uh, follow up on something that Cheryl said, which is uh, to describe, it's, you know, if you want more details about what happened at Howard in the spring of 1978, at Crampton Auditorium. It was a National Black Writers Conference. There used to be regular National Black Writers Conferences. I don't know if there still are. They shifted from Howard to Mega Evers College, and I've attended uh, those conferences, well, at both places. But I was invited to speak at uh, the uh, one in 78 because I had recently published Court of Black Feminist Criticism. And Ethelbert uh, Miller, and uh, I can't remember the name of the other wonderful brother there, but they had, uh, they had been made aware, actually by Bernice Johnson Reagan, that this essay had been published and, re and then existed, had been recently published and existed, and that was the basis of the invitation. But what I wanted to say is um, the level of hostility toward uh, me uh, and to all who were like me, but I was the one who was on the stage, you know, asserting these things, particularly that you could actually do a lesbian reading of, uh, of Sulla, <laughs> Tony Morrison Sulla. Um, there was a guy there who I knew, um, and I'll say his name, Clayton Riley. He used to write uh, and was a critic uh, for the New York Times. Um, and uh, when I was talking to him, and he was, as I said, someone I knew previously, when I was talking to him about what I just experienced and how incredibly upset I was, you know what he said to me? He said, well, at least you weren't lynched. Mm -hmm. Now, what does it take for a black person to say another, to do another black person, well, at least you weren't lynched? That was the context of the time. Those were the stakes. So when uh, all of these sisters have given you pieces of what comedy he was. It's just like, you know, the, uh, 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 the sightless person and the elephant <laughs> trying to say, well, oh, okay, just calm down, calm down, Lord. Uh, <laughs> I, I said a magic word. Uh, but it's like, you know, trying to say, what is the elephant actually like if you can't see the whole thing? What was comedy he actually like? It's not possible, and even in the amount of time that we have here to describe that. But um, as um, you know, Sharon already said, it, and also others, Demita, all of us, I think, in different ways, it was no joke to be out as a black lesbian at that time. But you know what else was no joke? It was no joke to be a black feminist. Yes. And the thing is, black feminism is a politic. It always was a politic. It got confused at times with our sexual orientation and our sexual identity. But it was not an accident that at that historical period, those of us who are most willing to actually uh, embrace the politics of black feminism were also those who were not uh, subjugated to patriarchy. So what well, it was a structural thing. It wasn't like a by definition you have to be one thing or another in order to assert these politics. You didn't even, you know, we began to understand eventually you didn't even have to be uh, a cisgender female to assert those politics. But the thing is that uh, we were the people, the outlaws, who were most likely to be able to grasp all that. I just want to say a few thing, more things about the politics of the uh, Combahee River Collective and uh, to respond to some of the questions that uh, Professor Bracey had uh, given to us uh, prior to uh, the uh, symposium. And one of the questions was, why did you decide to form an organization? And what were the uh, obstacles you had to overcome? I did mention one of the major, well, two of the major articles, homophobia and anti-feminism. <laughs> Hard to tell them apart often. Uh, we decided to form the Combahee uh, River Collective, as uh, Demita uh, mentioned, because we had been involved with uh, feminist uh, organizing, specifically through the National Black Feminist Organization. And we really felt dissatisfied with where our politics were and where theirs were. And one of the things, if you haven't quite grasped it yet, we were a part of the left. Some of us are still very much a part of the left. Consider ourselves to be radicals, revolutionaries, committed to revolution, etc. And that was also a point of departure for us as far as like how were we viewed and how much respect did we get and how much respect do we get even to this day for giving this part of the 21st century their politics. 
I mean, I really feel that, and maybe, and please correct me, um, and you'll have that opportunity, but the thing is I really feel that the Black Lives Matter movement and other movements, the Dreamers movement, uh, what's going on in North Carolina with the Moral uh, Mondays, etc. Uh, I feel like all of those kind, uh, all of those movements that really do embrace the complexity of human uh, experience and human identity is in a direct line from what we asserted in Kambahi. So I think that's really important uh, to understand. I have a friend in uh, Albany, where I live, Albany, New York, uh, who was a part of SDS and then eventually of the Weather Underground. And when I used to talk to her about, her name is Naomi Jaffe, <laughs> and when I used to talk to her about things that I would individually get excluded from and feeling just so hurt, like the biggest conference, the black, biggest black women's studies conference that had happened to that point, which I think was in the 1990s. It was at, uh, was it at MIT? Uh, I was not invited to that conference. And I was just like, really? Uh, there was a major black women writers conference at NYU that I had to, uh, you know, bogart my way into. But whenever I would talk to Naomi about this, because we share politics, she said, Barbara, it's your politics. You know? And that always made me feel a little bit better because the thing is, I stand by my politics and I think it's really important. If, if my actually believing that capitalism needs to be eradicated and that it will never provide freedom and justice for all people globally, if, if that's what I have to give up in order to be invited, then that's fine. Don't invite me. I'm really glad to be here today, by the way. Uh, and. Um, Another obstacle that we had to overcome uh, during that historical period in Boston of the uh, mid and late 1970s, Boston is, yeah, it's still racist, but uh, in that period, it was undergoing racial warfare. There was racial warfare going on in Boston because of court order, school desegregation. And for us to be doing the kind of uh, intersectional politics that we were doing, re reaching across identities, reaching across communities, talking about issues that people didn't want to talk about in a context of actual racial warfare, that was more than a notion. So it was really something then that uh, we were, as I said, doing the kind of politics we were doing and also beginning to do anti-racist trainings for white feminist organizations. The first one that we were asked to do that for was the Transition House staff. Transition House was one of the first uh, shelters for battered women in the entire United States because there were virtually no shelters at that time. In fact, when I started teaching uh, Black Women Writers in 1973, I had a magazine that had an article about shelters in the United Kingdom, and I had my students read it even though it was a Black Women Writers course, and this was a white feminist magazine, I wanted them to know what does feminist writing look like that's explicitly feminist. There was an article about uh, the shelters. We had nothing like that in the United States. It was one of the most profound discussions that I had during that course because it brought up people's uh, own experiences of uh, violence. So as I said, we were doing organizing at a time where we were persona non grata. Firstly, everywhere we, can meet, uh, we, uh, we created community for ourselves, and that was such an important thing to do. Uh, since we've gone uh, over uh, time, I'm going to uh, stop now, but I think that um, we'll have an opportunity to dialogue more. Yes. November of 77, Dorchester, Massachusetts, March of 78, Hamlin, Connecticut, July of 78, uh, Boston, Mass, July of 79, Cambridge, 
in Marshville, September 79. And the last one was in Washington, D.C., February of 1980. All right, I'm just going to go through these. You're going to get the visuals, and I'm not going to try to uh, talk about this. That'll be enough. Sorry, 
Um, Frances Cress Wellesley, whom Dr. Wellesley just died recently, and she was at the event yeah. and was fomenting an extraordinary amount of homophobia. At Howard. At Howard. And one of the things that was, it wasn't as if we weren't used to dealing with homophobia in many settings where we were. It was that when you go to a black university, and I remember us always having these moments of hopefulness about in our African American community, we may find succor, we may find some place where we can be respected and seen. I know John's like, forget it. But, oh. but June, June really put her in her place. Well, she did. Not to even be dissecting that whole event, it was a nightmare. And for many of us, it was very, very frightening because what we really saw was what we were up against. It, it didn't matter that the white community was homophobic towards us. We really weren't studying white people. We really weren't. We were more interested in how we could be effective change makers and revolution makers in our own community. And it was a stunning day. The, we, I can't explain it to you, but it didn't stop us in any way. We redoubled and retripled our efforts. We were going to continue doing what we were going to do. But sobering to realize the struggle that we were going to be dealing with was exactly at home, first and foremost. And, and a year later, ironically, when you think about it, so that was the spring of 78. A year later, in early 79, 12 or more black women were murdered in Boston um, in a three-month period. Some people know about the organizing that we did. Kambahi was the bedrock of the organizing that was done in the entire Boston area. When the first um, bodies were found at a stride right factory in the south end of Boston, uh, the stories uh, are the story about uh, the murders. They were two teenage girls. Uh, they said they were runaways or prostitutes, and the story was on the page of the Boston Globe with the race where the racing forge was. That is buried in the back, very back of the newspaper. By the time we were done, it was a front page story on the Sunday Boston Globe. Yeah. So that was just one of the things that we did, and yet those people at Howard were acting like we weren't about anything. Right. Uh, and I just want to add about that organizing. This is really important. Um, as Barbara mentioned earlier, Boston was one of the most segregated places. Um, and even within the feminist movement, there was certainly those, those kinds of dynamics. So when we organized the Coalition for Women's Safety to deal with um, those murders, there were local Boston people, human service you know, providers, and I just want to call out Katie Portis, who was the director of Women Incorporated, which is one of the first residential treatment facilities for women, and they could bring their children. So a lot of our meetings happen there. But also, I think because um, the white feminists also understood the racial politics, what they did in Cambridge was organize a group called the Support Group for Women's Safety. Right, And a couple of the members are there in the back of the room. So there was a moment of, of kind of racial, class, gender solidarity in around those the, the tragedy of those 13 murders. And I think that needs to be really um, uh, um, recorded. Right. Well, and remember, we're doing this organizing when there's no social media. We're practically Xeroxing and mimeographing things. We started out in the first, the first brochure, the first, two, the first pamphlet, two black women killed. Then we put another one out to scratch out the two and made it four and eight and finally 27. Uh, I, I think it was not, I think the math was 13. Was it 13? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're so poor, so sorry. Well, right. it was the tremendous but, number. But one, you know, good grief. That's exactly but right. But I can literally type that on my selective typewriter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. And I think one other important thing right around that time was also, um, a little bit later, was also when Rhodesia became Zimbabwe, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, you know, you, you see the, the confluence of these kind of events kind of coming together, and some of the members of the Coalition for Women's Safety were also involved, you know, in that, in the Zimbabwe. 
Right. And then the thing is, I think we're just going to be off and running. We're just going to free associate, you know, one person going to say something. You say, Rhodesia will be coming to Zimbabwe. I will never forget going to the Amman La concert yes. at uh, Har Harvard Stadium. Stadium. Right. And it was in the summertime. It was a benefit to, uh, uh, to uh, destroy uh, apartheid in South Africa. And who was the headliner? Bob Marley. Marley. Yes, thank right. you very much. Patti LaBelle was there. And we were there. Comedy was there. And the thing is that I think that people don't understand the depth, you know, of our commitments and the depth of our politics. Wherever there was injustice, we made it our business to try to be on the same. Yes. And one and, other one that was important at the time was the Committee to End Sterilization Against oh, Women, yes. which was around the sterilization, the forced sterilization of Puerto Rican women. And, and, and Native American. Yes. Yeah. 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 Just to notice something, despite the fact that we were dealing with homophobia and anti-feminism, one of the cornerstones of how we organize ourselves is we believe in coalition building and working in a coalition no matter what. We walked picket lines for the African-American men who were picketing um, to, be get, to be allowed to the union in Boston, to the trades unions. We did that. There were, I mean, there were just so many events where we show up, and we showed up, and we didn't get too much pushback all the time. We didn't know people were showing up for us, but we were committed through our politics, our politics of coalition building, not for the purpose of flattening out our own radicalism, but showing up and saying who's useful, who's not. We're here. And one, of, and one of the best examples of that uh, coalition perspective was, uh, what, what was his name, Willie Sanders? Yes. Uh, there was a black Willie man Sanders who was accused man. of raping some white women in Alston. And this is again in the context of complete residential and neighborhood segregation. So he was a painter in an all white section of uh, Boston. Uh, white women were raped and uh, he was accused and I remember people from, uh, was it City Life from, uh, in Jamaica Plain, they talked to us about would we be supportive of his defense and his case, and we say, yeah, That's hell yeah, in fact. Exactly. And the thing is that, uh, I can't remember how that coincided with the uh, murders of, uh, the, of the black women, but I do remember that we actually changed, we got the, the Take Back the Night March, we got them to change the route of the march based upon what was going on in our community. Yes. Instead of um, starting down um, in, on the Fenway or wherever they had started before, we actually had feeder marches, uh, some of which started like in, Rock, uh, in Roxbury where I live, Jamaica right. Plain, Dorchester, and they converged. So we actually changed the politics of something you know that was a bedrock uh, issue within the uh, women's movement, which was violence against women. Instead of starting in the white part of town, people came from other neighborhoods, and we uh, we lifted that up as well. I, I, I hate to end this without at least a few questions. Do you know what it is? You've been sitting a long time and we're tired. Let's admit that. It's been a long day. But please, your questions would be so well, they, well. Well, this is this is what I thought that we would have several people come up with questions. We'll write down the questions, and then we can answer what questions we would like to, et cetera. And that can kind of extend the conversation as well. Instead of just one question, one answer, and maybe if we can take maybe ten minutes, John. What do you think? Ten minutes. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. So maybe we have time. Questions? No, no. Questions? Are, are, I think there are questions on the, the microphones here. Yes. Where are the microphones? Maybe so the lights could come up too. So, yeah. so let me say while people are getting to the microphones, um, I do want to thank my cousin John Bracy for gathering us all together here. And I have to say, John Bracy's, John Bracy's mother was the sister of my grandmother. And he and I are cous no, first cousins once removed, for those of you who are keeping score. Um, you know how sometimes you kind of take your family for granted. It's like, oh yeah, John, he's over there in Amherst doing something or another. Um, 
I didn't really understand the scope of what was going on here and what kind of relationships he has built in this university community, in this geographic community. And I have to say, I'm extremely impressed and um, we're very proud of you. Write down, they're going to ask, we're going to write down, so we're not just question answer, question answer. Ah, okay. okay. Is, is, that all, is that all right? <laughs> <laughs> all right, just really quickly, I'd love to hear your recollections of the very voices of Black Women Tour, 1978. Yes. Uh, very, Where's Conda, right behind you? <laughs> very, very voices. Okay, thank, thank you. Tim, say it again. Oh, good. Good. I'd love to hear your recollections of the tour. I know the Comedy, um, I believe, co sponsored or sponsored bringing the women to Boston. And I'd love to hear about that. The importance of women's culture of the time. Thank you. I just want to say that what I was going to talk about, thank you for asking that. Um, I, I, it wasn't a question, I just wanted to presence the music behind all that was happening at the time. I was thinking about Sweet Honey and the collaboration with you. And sweet honey and the music that was a part of all of this and just so that people know who, who the young people who don't understand and weren't there to really understand the importance that the music also played at this time underscoring all the politics that was happening and particularly sweet honey and thank you for bringing up uh, the very voices of black women tour as well and in case anybody wants to know the questioner who's there right now was the music producer in LA for Great Voices of Black Women, Condon Mason, give it up. Yeah. Yes, thank you. So exciting to be here with you all. Um, so I actually have a few questions because I'm using the Combahee River Collective Statement to frame my thesis. So please answer whatever you'd like. Um, the first is, what was, so, I guess Zami, um, Audrey, in Zami, Audrey Lord talks about the importance of having a place, a place to check your flaps, um, and be whole, to collect pieces of yourself. And I imagine that these retreats were a space for you all to do that, but I wonder what it was actually like to be, um, in that space on a day-to-day -day basis. So was there a set an agenda, um, what did that look like, and then what was it like to leave that space? What was it like to kind of re-enter the world after being together? Um, and at the last retreat, did you all know that it was the last retreat? Um, was that a plan? Maybe why have you all met again since then? So that's a lot. But another separate question is that um, in the statement, you all point out that there are certain ways in which all black women experience their lives. And the fourth point that you make is that all black women, and maybe in general women of color, um, before becoming politically conscious, feel crazy. Um, and so I'm using that idea in my thesis, and I just want to hear a little bit more about it to make sure that I have it right. Um, by the way, the name of my thesis is We Are Here, But Where Does the I Belong? And I'm so inspired by all of you, so thank you. Thank you. Could you explain what we're doing with these questions? I don't understand. <laughs> 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 Maybe the last one for this series, so we, so we can get this straight. Okay, um, again, thank you so much for being here. You guys have really inspired me so much in my life. So my question is about working in a collective and if you could speak to how you um, negotiated difference and conflict within the collective. <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. 
anyone want to take on any of the, those questions? No. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, let's finish that. We must have this question. We must have this question. Hi, sisters. I'm so sorry I was late, but I had to speak somewhere else on campus. Hi, so, Coretta. Hey. Um, I have a couple of questions that I hope that... As y'all know, at the same time y'all were doing Come By He, we were doing the D.C. Great Crisis Center. It's the first one in the country run by black women down in Washington, D.C. And so there's two things I'd like you to speak to. The relationship between the rabid reaction we got from the black nationalist, pan-Africanist movement, both the black lesbianism and black feminism. I'd like you to draw that out more. But I also see, coming from the legacy of the Kambahi River Collective, the misuse of the concept of identity politics today. And I'd like you to speak to that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are we, do we have all the questions? Yeah, for now. Let's, 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 so, so we can keep up with it. Right. The last question is a good one. I'm going to speak to it real quickly. I mean, from my just perspective, I have one of the things about um, the way in which Black feminist politics emboldened us. Once we got hooked into realizing that we weren't isolated and just these individual satellites in space, we were already a bold group of people, individual. I mean, we were bold individuals to start out with, along various lines of boldness. But what was really interesting is that because we were really focused in a practical way on liberating black women and men and children, we were focusing on the issues that were really having an impact on people. So people couldn't deter us. When we first joined the coalition to start putting together one of the first black, I'm part of the first better women shelters in New England, Casa Mena Vasquez, I'll never forget us, you know, we went to, we went to meetings where different, different representatives of the company would go. We were talking honestly about the need to deal with domestic violence and the importance. I think probably one of the most um, amazing things about those meetings is that we were able to work successfully in coalition with a group of people that was incredibly diverse and respectful. I had never seen such respectful communication around difficult issues like what it means to invade the home of people and get involved in personal family life and what does it mean in the black community to begin to raise the issue of violence because when what happens when you're in jail the industrial the, the, um, I'm losing my mind. thank you the prison industrial complex all those things came into play but we were very much involved in building coalitions just and with latinas and that's the other thing um we didn't deal, we were dealing implicitly with the role and the impact of anti-blackness. And now that it's a, become a very conscious part of what's going on politically right now, we're suddenly all over the place. You're reading about anti-blackness and about the role of people examining anti-blackness in Latin America particularly. I want to give a shout out to Nivia Castro. Nivia is here, she was a member of Comedy as, as a black Puerto Rican woman. This was not a popular subject. Back in the, I know, I'd be knowing. I mean, I know. But it was completely revolutionary to talk about the issue of race in relationship to Latin America, Puerto Rico also. So even, we, we were always pushing against those boundaries and always insisting that we had a right to stand where we stood. Can I ask you a question? Not really. I'd like to speak to that if I could. Um, the fact that the term identity politics has gone into the common you know, language, so to speak, um, I believe, and I've asked other people uh, what they think too, based upon their research and their living through uh, these historical periods. Um, 
I've asked, was the term ever used anywhere before it was used in Kabahi? Most people think that that's where it arose from, that the t putting those two words together, identity politics, came out of Kabahi. Now, I'm not convinced that the way that the right wing uses identity politics, I'm not convinced that they got it directly from Kabahi. Uh, you know, I, don't, you know, I don't really think that they were necessarily reading the statement or whatever, but the thing is, let's think about the generations and where these kinds of conversations take place. Um, a lot of this stuff does um, arise on college and university campuses, and particularly, uh, was it in the uh, late 80s into the early 90s, the right wing really was focused a lot on what was going on at, on these campuses and also started publications like the Dartmouth Review and other right wing publications, Denis, uh, D'Souza, etc. Uh, is that his name? Uh, you know, people, you know, who were on these campuses at that time, that time they really were building uh, an assault as Reaganism, you know, etc. Had, was, uh, was, were having their impact upon the political um, environment in uh, our uh, nation and, now, and other uh, nations too, they were building a, uh, a, an assault mechanism on the gains of the 1960s and 70s. So as I said, I'm not convinced that when people, and I won't mention his name today, so let's keep that nice, when uh, the clown who's running uh, for, uh, for president on the Republican side, and who's being very successful. Uh, yeah, well, you know, the major, you know, big clown is a big clown. Uh, the one who's being most successful at this time. When they use uh, the terms of uh, identity politics, as I said, I'm not convinced that they got it directly from knowing the politics of its origins uh, and its source, but they, there's been enough attack on it, there's been enough attack of it during these intervening decades uh, that they are aware of it because like they could have picked up a copy of the Dartmouth Review or the other many clones of that publication during that period and seen the attacks themselves uh, in the negative. So, you know, and also what we built, you know, women's studies, black women's studies, queer studies, uh, uh, third world, uh, you know, studies, etc. That's where they got the you know, got the, the inkling of it, and they have taken it and really uh, run with it. We didn't mean, by identity politics, we did not mean that only those who are like us deserve to have justice and, uh, and freedom. What we were saying is that as black women, at a time when black women and the lives of women of color were so incredibly devalued, that we had a right to build a politics based upon our identity and our experience of those multiple identities. That's what we meant by identity politics. Yes. Not that everybody else should take a flying leap and had no value, uh, or that we were at war with other people who had different identities. We were saying in a very hostile uh, context that we had a right to build our own political struggles. Yeah, and I want to just add one more piece to that, and I think when, Sharon, you mentioned, you know, black woman named Okazawa Ray and Alfonso, we didn't have an essentialist notion of who a black woman is, right? And we did not operate out of a politics of scarcity. You had to do, we didn't have a litmus, litmus test of blackness or black womanhood or you know any of that, right? We had political principles. We, you know, anybody who identified as, as black woman, you know, Part Come on, it, yeah. Part of the African diaspora, any of, any of that. So, part of the current conversation is about identity politics. I think what I noticed, on, especially on campuses, is essentialist, right? And it's not intersectional. Also, it operates from a politics of scarcity. Like we, we don't have enough of anything, so we're not going to share. And so no coalitions, you know, none of that. And coalition building was absolutely one of the key principles of the, of the collective. If we're done with that, I'd like to say something uh, to the question of how to be a collective. Mm -hmm. Don't worry, I'm not gonna try to answer that. <laughs> but what, what it reminds me of is our coming together made me thoughtful about a couple of things. Uh, one of them was a simple question of why did the retreat end? 
uh, at the beginning, they were uh, mostly grouped together in organizing the finding the venue, the deciding how much money we needed to have to be at the retreat. And it's really interesting. Uh, people were trying to keep the cost at $15 per woman per, per retreat. And so all of that was done by the court group. 15, 15. five. But anyway, so all of that work was done you know, from the, from the core collective. And so we then began to try to spread it around, but it ended. So it's like, why did it end? And I was also thinking, uh, we fell out of touch with each other. Mm -hmm. So that when John Gracie said, oh, I'm sure you all have, you know, had many reunions. It's like, no, we haven't. Some of us have not seen each other in 37 years, maybe we've passed and we're passing, you know, and it's been 40, 35 years since then. I wonder why was that, you know, and what does it, what does it mean? Uh, and that raises the question of personal relationships, mm. how to build a collective, that's all how the personal, and I think that's what the, per, the, the woman who asked the question was getting to, because it would not be easy mm, to have all the strong, beautiful, dynamic, uh, opinionated, <laughs> fiery women who were a part continue to work together. So we don't really have the answer to that, but what it made me think is I would love at this point if we could have a reunion, mm -hmm. and that part of that reunion be to talk about mm -hmm. those kinds of, of things. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think about this from a deeply personal place, because I was actually shocked when, this has happened during the last five years, I was standing in my living room uh, it was toward the end of the evening. I was getting ready to go. It was dusk, which is one of my favorite times of day. I was getting ready to go in the kitchen to make myself a cup of tea. And I felt a profound aloneness because what I wanted to do was turn to somebody in my house and say, hey, honey, I'm going to make a cup of tea. Do you want one too? And there was nobody in my house to turn and say that to. And what it caused me to reflect on is how in the work of Kambihi and in the work that I have called life work, uh, purpose-driven work, we were very clear about how to do that work. We were movement building. We were changing the world. We developed very profound and workable relationships with our work. Did we do that in our interpersonal relationships? What are the ramifications of that? What does that mean for how we need to think about what we're doing? And That becomes the question. Like, when we were doing it, we never thought to think about caring. Yeah, caring forward, all of that, and how to do it. And I wanted to just say that so that we could think about it as we think about what we did and what we want to do and how we want all of our work to be whole, to be organic, to be spiritual in the larger sense, and to go forward in ways that continue and that flower and that feed and that give us what we need on every level. Yes. I think that's a marvelous way actually to end and we will, we will talk among ourselves and ask them that, and that's a question to be. Yeah. And I got, can I just do a point of information, please? And I got a couple of announcements, a whole bunch of announcements, actually.
Oh, it's heavy. Oh, this help. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, the very voices of black women was mentioned and no response was given here. I, I can't imagine that everybody knows what that was. Um, there were women's record companies that were started in the 1970s. One of the most powerful was uh, Olivia Records. And um, they began, you know, as other um, aspects of the women's movement began to respond to being inclusive. Uh, of women of color, and so they were out uh, in the Bay Area, and uh, there was a wonderful uh, black women, both musicians and poets, who were uh, involved with Olivia. Olivia used to make records of poets reading. <laughs> so Judy Gron and Pat Parker had albums that were produced by Olivia. And so they came up with this idea then in the late 70s of doing a very Voices of Black Women tour, mm -hmm. in which they sent out their recording artists, including poets. There was Mary Watkins, an incredible composer, and pianist, um, Gwen Avery, incredible uh, musician. Um, who else? Linda Tillery. Yeah, yeah. Vicky, Vicky, Vicky Randall. Vicky Randall. Right, and, 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 and the poets as well. And one of the places that they wanted to have one of the concerts was Boston, so all of a sudden, Kamahi was challenged with becoming a music production. <laughs> <laughs> and we did it, we really did it. We uh, got, um, like, what's the name of that auditorium at Boston University, was it Hoover? Oh, Morris. And the thing is, that's a huge, that's a pretty big, uh, auditorium, we filled it on two nights. So the thing is that, as I said, we had a lot, but we also had a coalition group. The Bessie Smith Memorial Collective was the name of the group that we, uh, that we started to do the, um, you know, to do those concerts. So I just wanted people to know what that was. The history needs to be written. I know that there are a lot of people in this room who are looking for dissertation topics or, or their next book topic or whatever. You really do need, somebody needs to write that history, more than one somebody. But, um, but uh, other people brought various voices too outside of Boston. Oh, yes. Yeah, that was a tour in New York. They were in Chicago. It was a national tour. Yes. So um, I think it says something about the kind of uh, approach that Black Lives Matter is taking to the establishment of um, chapters, mm -hmm. or even the NAACP, the, the establishment of branches. So maybe, maybe that's one of the legacies of coalition building mm -hmm. is to Stratify the people who are involved in the effort. In the One of the other things I wanted to do, if we could, we've mentioned some of the people who were involved in Kavahi, who were really important in building Kavahi. I have a list that I made. I would really like us to say the names, you know, uh, like we do in our, you know, uh, various spiritual practices of people who made a real difference. Uh, some of them who are still on this physical plane, others who have, uh, as the term is used, transitioned. So my list is Sharon Burke, Helen Stewart, my sister Beverly Smith, Nivea, uh, Nivea Castro Figueroa, uh, Alice Adams, Eleanor Johnson, Shirlane McCray, people who came to retreats, Audrey Lord, Donna Kate Russian, Ceci Alfonso, Linda C. Powell, uh, and Phyllis Bethel and Lorraine Bethel were mentioned by some others. Mm -hmm. Any others? Carol, Carol, Carol Oliver, Carol Bristow. Mm -hmm. So these women are just foot soldiers in life, right? People who are on the picket lines, in the places, just doing the work but not famous, of which the numbers are legion. Um, one more thing about Varied Voices, which we need to say. We, I think, were the only production company that took Varied Voices to the prison. That's right. We, <laughs> we did, did three concerts. That's right. We, the, the women of Great Voices went in and did a show for MC Mass Correction Institution yeah. in Framingham. Yeah. 
um, which then led to us either before that we were doing some kind of I think before or after. But if, again, one of the differences between the way we were doing our business as black women and as black feminists was to really make sure that we always rooted what we did in a world that really mattered to black women and that was accessible to all black women. As broad a spectrum as possible. And I also want to um, also acknowledge one of our um, uh, uh, strong white allies, and that's Professor Jean Grossoltz, who was um, a barbarous professor at Mount Holyoke. I Actually, think. I never studied, I never took a political science course, but she was a wonderful political science uh, professor at Mount Holyoke, my alma mater, and uh, I got to know her uh, soon after I graduated. And that's where we had our first retreat, right? Yes, in, yes, in her house. And now that's where we heard at Mount Holyoke College, Meg Christian singing the gym teacher song. Yes. Um, I just wanted to respond a little bit to what Akasha said. I think, I don't know that we knew that, that February 1980 was going to be the last retreat. Um, it was a very different, economic climate in those days. Um, you know, I was living in Chicago. You know, I could fly Allegheny Airlines for real cheap from Chicago to Boston. And I was doing temp work. Um, so I could do temp work in Chicago. I could do temp work in Boston and stay at Tamita's house. I could do temp work in New York and stay at Liv Powell's house. So it was a much simpler thing to do than it is now. I moved to California. There was no Allegheny Airlines from California, and it was a much more expensive proposition. I think we didn't continue the retreats, but I think that, just to talk about what happened when we left the retreats, I think that we were energized to continue to do whatever work, you know, was our work in the world as responding to Audrey's challenge. Um, so I think that we continue to take that work out into lots of different places. You know, I feel like a lot of my political work was around dancing and working to expand people's ideas about what a woman looked like, you know, what a dancer looked like. Um, people came up to me and said, I'm so glad I got a chance to see you. My mother, my sister, my partner, is a big woman and she never saw anybody dancing that she, you know now she thinks well i could do this too um so i feel like he, there were lots of different things demita was continuing to do some of the you know the food and and farming work I, so we took that energy out to do our various different work so i think it does continue the legacy does continue it doesn't even though it hasn't continued in that particular crystalline form of the retreats, so. Yeah. Oh, absolutely, I want to say anything. Oh, and, and um, the other thing about the relationships, I, I think, you know, part of making it, part of it a more difficult economic climate means that you have to make choices. And as we get older, our energy has to be more carefully managed. And, you know, sometimes you make choices, am I gonna be in, a, in, you know, in an intimate relationship and take care of that part of myself? Am I gonna, you know, what else am I gonna do? How am I gonna balance all of the things that I need in a world where there's not necessarily enough of everything and I have to figure out, you know, how to, how to balance all of those things, um, so. One final thing I wanted to say, I realized, and I'm gonna stop, I am gonna stop. We were young. I was 23 when we founded Comprehend. Take heart. Take heart. Mercedes was 20. Um, so I just want to say your marching orders is to really recognize how powerful you are in your youth, in your energy at this point in time. And this is an opportunity for us to make a connection because now you can see what it looks like when you've been struggling for 40 years. We're still standing and still causing trouble. And we'll continue to cause trouble. Okay, let's give it up for the
like I got a few, few brief announcements. Uh, one, one little last personal since Sharon complimented me. Sharon never told me she was a member of the Kabahi River Collective, ever. Right? I found out she was a member because I opened up, you had, I bought the Village Voice one day, and there's his sister on the front doing this belly dance. And I said, that looks like my cousin. <laughs> and I looked at the article and I said, that is my cousin. What is she doing belly dancing on the front of the Village Voice? Well, it's a women's conference in San Francisco. And it says, Sharon Page Richie is doing belly dance to everyone. And I call her mom and says, when do you know Sharon does belly dance therapy at women's conferences? She said, oh yeah. I said, well, how come nobody told me? <laughs> I mean, she never, ever, ever, she would stay in her house on the way to Boston. Never say why she's going to Boston. Not, not, a, not a clue. I had to read it in newspapers. <laughs> you know, but that, that was the nature of a lot of the, the, the women in that group. They're not, it's not an ego thing. It wasn't about like I'm going to be famous. It was like I'm doing work. And I'll, get, I'll tell you when I get around to it. Uh, but it, it, it's, that's why we had a hard time getting them together. You don't realize how hard it was to try to convince some of the, the people on the stage how important they were and how they should come so people could honor them. Because they, they said, well, you think it was that important? I said, yeah, it was that important. You know, but nobody, you know, if I said Black Panther reunion, everybody would say, can I be on the program? Can I make this? No, no, no. <laughs> this was like, we did this not because we wanted to get patted on the back for doing this. We did this because this was right and it was necessary. You know, and we're glad that you think it was important because they, they were not going to blow their own horns. You know, they were not going to announce themselves. They're not going to make a movie about themselves. And I think that speaks to the, the quality of, of, of politics that they had. You know, that it's not about the self. You know, it's about a collective movement forward where egos can get in the way and so you kind of subjugate the, uh, uh, the egos. And I think it's extremely uh, valuable lesson for young people when you move into a movement. Uh, like, why are you there? You know, and, and you know, kind of pull your ego back if it hurts the organization. A uh, couple other things. The, the Howard Conference, the proceedings of that Howard Conference have been published. Uh, I think I had a copy of I think I, I gave Jim a copy, you know, the, in the memory of Zora and so forth. Did, it's bone chilling to read, to read that, you know, to read what supposedly intelligent black people are saying to, uh, to black women. I mean, it, I mean, it, it's, you just said these people cannot be saying this. You know, homosexuality is genocide, the destruction of the black community. Uh, I mean, it was horrible, it was horrible kind of stuff. And these were people who you know, whose names you recognize, you know, whose work you read. You know, and this was a public gathering. This wasn't some private meeting. This was like Howard University cramming on a toilet. You know, and it was horrible. I mean, just horrifying kind of, kind of, uh, just madness. And Francis was leading the pact with us. So, you know, I mean, it was just horrifying kind of work. Uh, short announcements. One is, when we have the dinner, please let the panelists get the food first so that y'all don't be grabbing all the food for the panelists. Gonna. But the, the, the upside is everybody gets to stay and eat whether you have a name tag or not. So that should, so y'all can chill, you still get some food, free food, you know, so that ought to hold you for a while. And we want them to, photographers want to take pictures of the Kabai Group Collective, so I'm going to ask them to just stay on the stage a few minutes. So any of you who want a picture of them or your posterity or whatever, uh, whatever. Anyway, I just want them to just, you know, hang around a few minutes so you can come up and take pictures of that kind of thing and then we got a break. And Thank you very much for, for holding on this time.
open party, an open-minded collaborator in this event. It's been so wonderful to work with you and put this event together. It's been inspiring and instructive for me, and I've learned so much from this opportunity to work with you in making such a fantastic event and evening happen. Buenas noches. I should have picked this phone in Spanish then, right? Uh, well, first, uh, thank you. It's an incredible honor, incredibly humbling and empowering and enriching and healing to be part and to lend my labor to making this day what it's been. So thank you, Dr. Sullivan and uh, uh, Dr. Bracey and everybody. Um, I did get permission to do a quick plug for another symposium that WGSS uh, the Center for Latin American, Caribbean, and Latino Studies, and a number of other organizations on campus, including the Graduate Student Organization, which I'm a part of, uh, putting on a symposium on black women territory and peace building. We have sisters from Honduras, the Garifuna community, from Africa coming up, Carla Garcia from New York. We have Francia Marquez coming up from Colombia, um, and Dr. Carol Zippert from the U.S. Federation of Southern Co-ops is also coming, um, and Drs. Uh, Tiana Pachel from Berkeley, and Dr. Keisha Camperi from Brown University are also coming for that first day. And that is Tuesday, April 5th, from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. in the Cape Cod Lounge. And on the second day, we're having uh, Dr. Piedad Cordova, uh, one of the first black uh, women senators in Colombia, who is going to be keynote speaker in a little space to discuss about black women and, and the peace building process in Colombia and the peace talks that are going on in Havana. So we want to just share that information with you. Um, the, the poem that I, that I picked uh, is, is a bit related to the theme of the, the symposium that I just plucked. Uh, on, earlier this year, I got word that a paper that I submitted to the American University's International James Baldwin Conference was accepted in Paris. So, <laughs> Paper examines, looks at Baldwin and how, and how can Baldwin speak to the current situation of African-American communities being displaced from the rural lands into the, into the cities. Um, but being from the Dominican Republic, I learned that I needed a visa to go to France. And I felt some type of way about that, and I wrote a poem about it. Uh, this is dedicated to Carol Boyce Davis, and with love and respect to, to Saki Shane. Why do I need a visa to go to France? I have a sister in Mozambique and a brother in Angola. So tell me, man, why do I need a visa to go to France? I have a sister from La Habana and a brother in Guyana. What, I gotta pay you? I, 
again? Did you forget that I squared that debt? I have a brother in Trinidad and a sister in San Juan where the Spanish fled to and would kick their ass. You don't remember. Is that why I need a visa to go to France? Did you forget the debt? Did you forget the debt? Did you forget the debt that you placed on Haiti? And now you charge me for a visa so I can go to France. Surely you remember. You do remember the debt that you placed on Haiti. When I lifted your border from on top of me and threw your geographies into the sea. Surely you remember the debt you placed on Haiti when you saw me shine whole, black, and free, drumming the world from the Caribbean Sea. Do you not remember that I spoke French, Patois, and Spanish too? That I still do? Don't you remember Petit Trou? Or your brother renamed it Barahona in the South? No te acuerdas. Don't you remember 1822? Do you? Do you? Do you remember 1822? Did you forget that Haiti is an island that you split me in two, that you ran train with your brothers and left me with someone else's wallet and someone else's passport, and now you dare smile and charge me for a visa so I can go to France. Thank you. talking about and thought it was pretty important so um, most of my work is about love so I thought it fit. Out of season. I'd like to think that our relationship held meaning in its impermanence. I mean I witnessed my mom kill five hibiscus trees for their fleeting beauty and things buried in soil are supposed to give life. You lingered like mango and cayenne pressed to the skin, spiced sticky mess between fingers, spiced sticky mess between people. Um, the second one is not really related to the first one, it's just about the same person. <laughs> <laughs> this one's titled Watering Can. One, I like to think what attracted me to you was the wilted way you walked, like a potted fern at its half life. Two, you held onto my hand so tight that I imagined your digits planted between mine, tendrils of ivy rooted in my palm. Three, I have always loved the color green, no matter how dim the shade or unhealthy the hue. Four, you smelled like rain. Your voice felt like damp soil, cool and stagnant soft and calm. Five, my mom always said I'd inherited my grandma's green thumb and her savior's complex. Six, we didn't use pet names because they felt inorganic, but you did call me flower once. Seven, I read you that poem by Tupac. 
the one about the rose growing from a crack in the concrete. After I finished, you told me you hated metaphors. Hate. And I hated how you bit your nails until they bled, pruning your fingertips until there was nothing left. Nine. We spent all of our time together in the winter, and all I wanted was spring. Ten. My watering can's empty. Thank you. I know uh, Jim Jordan and Bernice Johnson Reed were quite prolific collaborators. And um, I just want to say that um, I want to thank everybody today for your sincere and thoughtful and intimate portraits of June in honor of that painter of words. June Jordan will live forever, and they all will. I promise, because every time we call her name, she lives. Every time we read silently or aloud, she breathes again. And they all will, I promise. June would write the words first, and then Bernice would write the music. Most times it turned into a Sweet Honey in the Rock hit. <laughs> I'm going to do first, Ought to Be a Woman, which June wrote after Bernice talked to her about her mother. And Bernice said that she never knew whether her mother slept or not. Because she was sewing when they went to bed, and she was already cooking when they got up in the morning. Then I'll read a song of Sojourner Truth. Washing the floors to send you to college, staying at home so you can feel safe. What do you think is the soul of her knowledge? What do you think that makes her feel? 
Biting her lips and lowering her eyes to make sure there's food on the table. What do you think would be her surprise if the world was as willing as she's able? She's hugging herself in an old kitchen chair, listening to you hurt. She hears your rage. What do you think she knows of despair? What is the aching of age? The fathers, the children, the brothers turn to her, and everybody white turn to her. What about her turning around alone in the everyday life? There just ought to be a woman can break down, sit down, break down. Sit down, just like everybody else, call it quits on Monday, blues on Tuesday, sleep until Sunday, down, sit down, break down, sit down, oh, way out of nowhere is flesh out of flesh. Courage that cries out real late at night, away out of nowhere is flesh out of flesh. Bravery kept just a little out of sight. Oh. Too much of a task for anyone The trolley cars was rolling and the passengers all white. When Sojourner decided it was time to take a seat. The trolley car was rolling and the passengers all white. When Sojourner decided it was time to take a seat. It was time she felt to rest a while and eat up on her feet. So Sojourner put her hand out, tried to flag the trolley down. Sojourner put her hand out for the trolley crossing town. And the driver did not see her, the conductor would not stop. So Sojourner yelled, it's me, and put her body on the track. It's me, she yelled, and yes, I walked here, but I ain't walking back. Mm -hmm. uh -uh. The trolley car conductor and the driver was afraid to roll right on over and leave a line dead. So they opened up the car, and Sojourner took a seat. It was time she fell to rest a while and eat up on her feet. Woo. Well, Sojourner must have been just crazy talking all that kind of truth. I said she must have been plain crazy, cause they say she was uncool. Talking loud to any crowd, talking bad instead of sad. I said she 
you must have been plain crazy, talking all that kind of truth. I said she must have been plain crazy, talking all that kind of truth. If she had somewhere to go, she said, all right. Uh -huh, yeah. If she had somewhere to go, she said, all right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Jim Crow and no, she said, I'll go anywhere, anywhere, just like the lady that she was in all the knowing darkness of her pride. She said, I'll ride, she said, I'll walk, she said, a righteous mouth ain't nothing you should hide. She said, I'll walk, she said, I'll ride. Just like the lady that she was in all the knowing darkness of her pride, she said, all right, yeah. They say she's black and ugly, and they say she's really rough. If you say, if you treat her like a dog, well, that'd be plenty good enough. And Sojourner said, all right. Sojourner said, I'll go. I'm a woman and this hell has made me tough, thank God. This hell has made me tough. I'm a strong black woman, thank God, yeah. So Jenner had to be just crazy talking all that kind of truth. I said she must have been plain crazy, plus they say she was uncouth. Talking loud to any crowd, talking bad instead of sad. I said she must have been plain crazy, talking all that kind of truth. Talking all that kind of truth. Talking all that kind of truth. Acknowledges that uh, we are all collectively struggling for liberation, organizing against racism, exploitation, and injustice. And all of that's all right, but somebody come and carry me into a seven day kiss. Somebody come and carry me into a Somebody come and carry me into a seven day kiss. I don't need no historic, no national, no family bliss. I need an absolutely one to one, a seven day kiss. Help me now, I can read the daily paper. I can even make a speech. <laughs> but the news is stuff that tapers down the salt board in the breach. I've been scheming about my people. I've been scheming about sex. I've been dreaming about Africa and nightmare in Oedipus the Rex. But what I need is quite Pacific, Woo! terrifying, rough stuff, and terrific. I need an absolutely one-to-one, -one, a seven-day kiss. Help me now. Thank you very much.
I can sing a solo, solo you can't hear me. Oh. <laughs> Very much. Well, of course, this is not my time anymore. It's your time. All right? So I need uh, at least 13 part harmony. You can divide yourselves as you see fit, however your voice carries you. But uh, just sing along, feel good about it, and do it. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine. for this room, okay? So I hear the soprano, I hear the higher harmony line, but I need you to own it, okay? One more time. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine,
Uh, we know we know we it's been a long day. Eight hour day, you'd be getting overtime or double time by now if you had a union job. Uh, since you don't have any union jobs, you know, you just get the fringe benefits of having a great part of the program continue past the eight hour day. Uh, as you can tell, I'm filibustering a little bit, waiting to see Gloria walk through the door, which she hadn't quite got to the door yet. But I will begin just by giving a uh, the reason why this last panel has the configuration that it, that it does. Uh, I met Sonia and Gloria here in the Pioneer Valley 40 years ago. Uh, Sonia was the head of Black Studies at Amherst College. Uh, Amherst College seems to have forgotten that. Uh, they don't tell anybody about that. They don't mention that. There's no poster of saying that. And I met I met Gloria, who was at uh, Hampshire College, uh, teaching uh, what they teach at Hampshire College, which is what they teach at Hampshire College, uh, which is what everyone how you doing? Yeah, yeah, then no, no. And what the two contributions that they have made in, in both in the valley and in the uh, development of kind of black women's thought, black women's thought, and in the shape of black studies in the valley. Uh, and I'll start with Gloria and Sonia. I could, you know, we've been in trouble the last 40 years together, so that could everybody take a while. Uh, Gloria bailed us out. In 1980, I think it was 81, 81, 82, we had a two year uh, seminar, Black Studies, Women's Studies, Overdue Partnership. The seminar consisted of uh, about, I don't know, about a third black females, about a Another third, maybe, maybe two thirds. Anyway, there were only four men there, four black men. They didn't have any white men in the thing. Uh, so they said they didn't want to start any trouble, so they figured we'd get along with the women. The enemy wasn't in the room. And so for two years, we had this kind of knockdown, drag out discussion about the foundations of feminist thought, which at that point was pretty much white feminist thought, uh, and how that related to the African American experience. And after this, people go on and on about Freud and Monique Fatigue and Eva Gray and Nancy Chatterall and people talk about their mothers and all. I'm thinking that you know, black people don't have no problem with their mothers. Uh, we like our families. And we don't feel trapped in our families. I like my family. I don't want to escape my family. And Gloria wrote this wonderful book with Jill Lewis called Common Differences. Right? And what Common Differences did was it laid out in alternate chapters a white feminist point of view and then a black feminist point of view. So I could keep my sanity because when we got to Gloria's chapter, she very effectively said all the things I was thinking but didn't have any language for and didn't have a familiarity for. And so in a sense, that enabled the, the, the intellectual kind of product of the seminar to be at a more, much more solid and sophisticated level than it would have been if we were, I think the men were me and John Walters, Joe Scarrett, and Horace Boyer. Uh, me going off our gut feelings, I just don't feel right. You know, you read Mary Daly, you know, God Ecology and God the Father, I just don't, just don't, like, just don't feel like me. Uh, like, I don't see no, my people are not in that language, you know. Uh, and so it's a glorious book that, that enabled us to move through those differences, you know, what she called common differences. Uh, that gave us, you know, us, us black men a kind of uh, solid entry point into into black, uh, into, you know, kind of white, prominent white feminist thought. Uh, and of course, the other the other piece was was the, the Audre Lorde piece, where she took on Adrian Rich, because you know I was a bit annoyed when Adrian Rich started talking about her Mary and all, and I said, this one is talking about her Mary, uh, and I don't know what kind of feminism you got if you're talking about your black Mary, uh, and that's what she was talking about. Uh, and Adrian Rich just 
kind of said what we were thinking, but she said it in that beautiful you know, Audrey Lord, that beautiful Audrey Lord way where she said, like, I'm tired of being the only black woman at these things, standing up here speaking for all black women, so I ain't coming back to this crap no more. And I said, I like that, you know, and Audrey was always cool anyway. Uh, and so this area has a special kind of relationship to the development of, of feminist thought, black feminist thought. Uh, and from that two-year seminar, it was kind of a knockdown drag out. Some people actually quit. You know, uh, we had a definition in those days that a liberal was a person that left the room when the argument turned into a fight. <laughs> well, there was a whole lot of liberals because after about three or four weeks of hold, there was a lot of vacant seats because people could be, you know, you want to argue, come bring it, you know. Uh, it's an argument. It's not, you know, ain't quite a fight yet. You know, we're doing academic stuff, but some people didn't want disagreement with their paradigms and all like that. Uh, and I disagree with everybody's paradigm. Uh, so we, I don't even believe in paradigms. Right? So it was, it was touch and go there. But from that, from that experience, you know, and from the reality of the experience of, of uh, black women in the valley, that we forged this relationship that has kept us together for the, for the past 40 years. Uh, it's one of the few campuses where you can't divide us. You know, the dean can't say black studies got it. I would have gave it to women's studies. The women's studies got it. I could have gave it to black studies. No, no. We both call up the dean and said, "Why did you say that to women's studies?" They said, "Well, this is what you told black studies." You know, and we, we had that that bond. And the people that went to, at the foundation of that bond were people like Gloria Joseph. You know, uh, she's a very very important uh, a, a figure in in the. Uh, development of the valley, uh, and Audrey came through the valley, you know, uh, we were glad to have her here, it, it was, uh, uh, and to support her, you know, I was quite shocked when, when she passed that uh, some reporter called me up from some news station and said that uh, they wanted a black male academic to say something positive about Audrey Lord, and they hadn't found anybody yet, and I'm saying like, well, how many people have you found? And they said, well, they worked out a list of black literary critics and black, you know, prominent political people. And I'm saying, you know, the race is in trouble. Uh, and I said, well, why wouldn't they talk about it? They said, well, you know, they said Audrey Lord wasn't, wasn't really black, that she was actually a lesbian. And I said, <laughs> I said, well, you know, I've been knowing Audrey Lord a long time, and she looked black every time I saw her. <laughs> and, you know, there's 30 million black people, there's 30 million ways to be black. Mm -hmm. you know, That's right. There ain't no one way to be black. Exactly. You know, and if we don't acknowledge all those 30 million ways, then we're not going to get nowhere. Yep. You know, we're not going to begin to get anywhere. And so, of course, I, I talked about how important I thought she was, and, and the, uh, her poems were, were great, you know. Uh, I like Zambia. You know, that was a great, one of the greatest autobiographies I ever read. Uh, and, I mean, it's absurd. How do you say a black person is not black? You know, it's just you know, it's stupid. You know, and but a, a lot of black academics and black political figures thought that that was the case. You know, and even before she had died, when I saw her at a meeting and people were saying that, I said, "Oh, you look black to me." You know, so the things you know, you haven't got you know, you haven't lightened up any. You know, uh, so you, to get past that foolishness, we did that in the valley. We didn't have that nonsense. Uh, and we couldn't have that nonsense because there were strong black females who would call you out. Uh, don't think that we black men got off easy in this. I'm trying to give you the good side of the, the fight. Uh, the other side of the fight was after we had finished defeating the white women in the seminar, the black women would dream us out after we go have a drink, after things, say, okay, you really were pigs today, but we weren't going to say that in front of the white women. And so, but y'all better shape up. So it was a wonderful learning experience because they, they, they call you out. They didn't let you slide. But they weren't going to break down that solidarity, you know, it's that kind of configuration of nationalism and feminism that the black community is very strong with. You know, my sisters will call you all kind of names, you know, at home. But when you hit the street, they're going to back you up and white people come after you. And that's the one thing that white feminists had to learn. You know, the sisterhood doesn't get into the race, they can pull people out of it, you know. Uh, and Sonia, Sonia uh, was at that first generation of people that when Amherst College let in uh, females. Uh, my uh, sister-in-law was in the first class and she hates Amherst College to this day. She won't give a penny. She doesn't want her name listed on the alumni list. Uh, it was so bad. And Mike Delwell and I, in order to get black studies at Amherst College, basically went to a meeting 
where Sonia would be, you know, I had, you know, a demand or so and an outlet for the program, and the white guys would sit there and just, like, she wasn't even talking. And then she would hand me the paper, and I would read the exact same words. They said, oh, John, great idea, let's talk about that. That was Edmonds College. That was Edmonds College. You know, the sexism was built into the DNA of that place. You know. Now it's majority female, but they're afraid to tell their alumni because then they don't know what to do with the Williams Amherst football game when all the guys show up with the, the sweaters around their neck, thinking it's the old days. You know, so they actually advised the women not to uh, to show themselves too much and to kind of hide a little bit during alumni weekend, so that the guys from the boys and fifties won't feel kind of scared with all these women running around. When they probably think of Smithies who come to hang out with the Amherst men, uh, but Sonia built black studies at Amherst College. Uh, she used her poetry to get the cultures in the name after a young black man drowned. You know, she wrote a praise poem to Gerald Penny. You know, young man drowned taking the swimming test because the lifeguards weren't paying attention to him. You know, and it's Sonia that made that school acknowledge his death. You know, pay for his burial expenses. You know, take responsibility for that. You know, and what made that important was she did that with the poem. It's a very moving, powerful poem. You ought to, you ought to read it sometime. Uh, and so they're here because they are the, the foundation here in the valley. We, we had the theoretical foundation. We know the importance of Audrey and June, but the embodiment of those values that were here in the valley for a long time were in Sonia Sanchez and, and in uh, Gloria and Joseph. Uh, and that's why I wanted them to, to be the evening, you know, to kind of wrap up the evening and kind of, you know, uh, you know, talk about the people that they knew well who were the foundations of kind of modern black, uh, black feminism. Uh, you know their, their autobiographies and their biographies. Uh, Sonia, of course, as I tell everybody, is one of the greatest living poets uh, in the country and in the world. <laughs> and I point out also that uh, if Sonia hasn't gotten a MacArthur Award yet, they're probably not worth having. Uh, Stanley Crouch has a MacArthur Award. Now think about that. Stanley Crouch. <laughs> Sonia doesn't have one. Obviously, MacArthur people don't have no values, right? So don't even, don't even think about that stuff. Uh, she's a Port Laureate of Philadelphia, right? She's now the Port Laureate of the Park Service. I didn't know they had one, but Sonia's the Port Laureate of the Park Service. Uh, she's a major force, a point as citizen, a point as uh, community activist, a point as one beloved by the city of which she's a member, you know? Uh, and I tell everybody when we go to work in Philadelphia, working on books and so forth, that to take a break, and someone would say, well, I need to go to the grocery store, and we're going to take a 15-minute break. Uh, I'll close up for the day, because right? there's no 15 minutes to the grocery store with Sonia in Philadelphia. That's a two-hour trip, right? And, it, it's a, and it's only two blocks from my house. Uh, and why is it a two-hour trip? Because every single person on those two blocks, knows her and she knows him. And it's not like just how you're doing, it's like, how's your son doing? Does he have the job? Did he get that, you know, he's in school now. Tell him to stop by and I'll help him with his papers. Uh, you know, give me a call when your daughter gets in, because I know somebody at that school I can get them in. Or brother just got out of the joint. She's like, you know, have you got the steady work now? Uh, there's, a, there's a love and adoration and, and affection for Sonia in Philadelphia that's palpable. You know, people stop cars and jump out when they see her, you know, like, uh, Professor Sanchez, Professor Sanchez, you're Sonia Sanchez, my wife loves your poetry, I love it too, and they want to give her a hug. And you're just trying to walk to the grocery store. Uh, you get to the grocery store, and every single person in the grocery store, she knows by name, and by family, and, and by, you know, uh, feeling, you know. So you can't just get something off the thing and put it in the cart, it has to be, no, 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 that's one day old, we're going to get you something from the back that's fresh. You know, uh, then you have to talk about the food and what you're eating right and so forth. So it's two hours to get back home. Uh, and uh, if we walk on the other side with the Chinese place, the brothers have a dojo where they're teaching uh, karate and all, and they, that's something that's back up, back up. Uh, and if she's not doing well, they want to know who do they get to go, like, mess up, you know. Uh, but they, it's, it's, uh, you have to believe it. You know, most, you know, most boys don't walk through the streets and have people stop them. You know, most, most people don't know the poets that live among them. Uh, but Sonia is part of the fabric of the city of Philadelphia. You know, there's a political force in that city. Uh, 
And it's because of uh, a life of integrity, you know, a life of, of, of developing skills. She wrote in the 1960s, but she's still writing today. You know, she's not writing the same thing, but she's still a poet. She's still a very good poet. Uh, and I'm kind of proud to have both of these uh, women as my uh, kind of friends and, and comrades. So I'm going I'm to go on and, and Gloria has a wonderful uh, new book on uh, Audrey Lord, and Sonia's going to talk a bit about June, you know, point to point. And I thought there was no better way to wrap up today than to have, you know, two of the founding sisters of modern black feminism. We'll talk about two other founding sisters of modern black feminism. So now we're going to have Sonia Sanchez and Gloria Joseph. <laughs> Well, good evening, and I am so glad to finally have arrived. <laughs> and uh, the and are you all, the people in the state say how it's a warm winter. It, it was not warm to me at all. <laughs> Coming from the Virgin Islands with 80 degree temperature. <laughs> but I adjusted because that's what we have to do. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to start by um, welcoming all of you. I love the crowd. I can feel your energy already. I just want to pick up on a few things that um, Professor Bracey said. One of the things is if you go to the grocery store with someone, you bring a folding chair. <laughs> <laughs> I had that experience. I know exactly what he's talking about. <laughs> but it's a wonderful thing. And a, a few things I want to, tidbits I want to add to what Professor Bracey said in terms of uh, black feminist input. And they're little things, but they're important things. When I taught at Hampshire College, I would say to my students, I'm teaching from a black perspective. And the white students were, you know, they, they really didn't know what I was talking about because they didn't realize that they were, all their teachers were teaching from a white perspective. It may sound like a little thing, but it's not. And it made a big difference in my teaching and re reaching the stu students students of color. Another tidbit is what um, Grace was talking about, um, writings and black feminist thought and writings. There was a book out called The Unhappy Marriage of Marxism and Feminism. Mm -hmm. And I was asked to do a piece. And the piece I did was entitled The Incompatible Menage a Trois with Racism <laughs> as the uninvited member of the wedding. <laughs> that piece really reached a lot of people's mind. In fact, I was at home and I called from my friend, Jill Lewis, who was at the Marxist conference in Paris. And she said, Gloria, they're pulling from your piece. <laughs> So that's just really an indication of what Professor Brace was talking about. We as black feminist writers, we have to inject that all the time. And it, it comes naturally, it's part of your DNA, you know, it just, you know, it's, it's um, instilled, you know, it's inculcated. You don't have to think about it. And, um, okay, those are the tidbits I want you to think about. Now, I know um, you all would expect something for me to read something about the book. The book is called a bioanthology because it is just that. It's a biography, but the anthology part, it consists of over 50 persons from many backgrounds, all ages, um, age, sex, race, class, etc. I just want to briefly read to you why the book came about, how the book came about. A few months prior to Audre Lorde's death in 1992, I conducted an interview with her and we discussed her biography. I promised her that I would write it and asked the question, what is it that we want this biography to do? Her response was, and this is verbatim, to leave a story of who I am and all my complexities 
and to make the quality of my life so irresistible that other people will share my visions. I really want people to know how hard I tried with what I have. I also want them to know that I play with toys in the bathtub and can be as stubborn as a mule, which sometimes puts me in good standing and other times not. I'm talking about enabling people to be the best that they can be, to use themselves the best that they can, and to show them, here's the way I did it. It's not a question of following. It's like a poem, and I believe passionately in the power of poetry. A poem doesn't tell you how to act and how to feel. It inspires something inside of you. So I would like my life to inspire black women, all people in actuality, in a particular way. The autobiographical part is my input. The other part of it, you have to tell, because I'm telling my part of it, and you have to tell the other part. Now those words were mandated to me, and I concluded that the most effective way to fulfill the wishes would be to ask contributors from people whose lives were impacted and influenced by Audrey's words and her turbulent and triumphant life. So I selected a diverse number of people to submit materials as personal stories, dissertations, recollections, poems, and memoirs to share their interactions and knowledge of Audrey. Now the, the contributors make up the bulk of the book. I like in the uh, book to a symphony orchestra in this sense. The participants are the musicians, a variety of musicians, all sorts of musicians. I am the conductor, and it's my job to meld those voices into an enduring symphony, hopefully a classic. And the, the publishers, the Villarosas, are the producers. So that's how I like it in the book too. Now the, um, there were three major um, memorials following Audrey's death. The largest one was at the Cathedral of St. John of the Lion in New York City, with over 4,000 people attending. The other one was in Germany, where she spent a great deal of time dealing with her cancer. And the third one was in St. Croix. And in the one in St. Croix, the opening ceremony was given by um, Reverend Cynthia Young. And in her talk, she said, you know, she could feel Audrey's spirit. And she said that she's now in the city of light, but people will call upon her and see her, and she will be there for them. And it's so, you know, the spiritual part of it the impact, it was so very real because in so many of the, con of the um, contributions, they speak in terms of how Audrey impacted them. They could feel Audrey. There are many people who have told me that they have a poem that leaves a survival on their door and on their wall. And when they go out in the mornings, they read it depending on how they feel. And they are, uh, I won't have time to read too many of the stories, but there's just so many enduring stories of people. There's one particular one from a black businessman, heterosexual male, who ran a, the major eco-tourism resort in Dominica. And to hear him say how Audrey impacted his life is just, just sensational. Because he said she, he shows how she taught him that to just say words is not enough. He has to, action is necessary, action is necessary. And so many um, contributions, you can see how this book did fulfill Audrey's wishes. Because people use her visions, they use her words. And one of the, let me just, one of the, um, not a tip, but something I want you all to know, is that, um, well, let me just backtrack a bit in terms of input. You all know that James Baldwin was a writer in residence at one time at Hampshire. 
at the same time, um, Audubon came to give some talks, and I, um, many of you heard about Essence magazine putting out the still blurb. But I just want to, as I like to do, tell the truth about that whole story. That was just a little snippet. In actuality, when I was at Hampshire, John Salterberg from Essence was there, and I said, John, you know, I think it would be a great idea to have a conversation between Audrey Lord and James Lord. And he jumped on it. Essence agreed. Norton paid to have the transcript. It was four different sessions between the two of them. And Norton paid the transcript, and I did the editing, and we were ready to pu publish it. And it's called Revol Revolutionary Hope, and in four sections, they talk about the children, they talk about education, male-female relationships. And the reason why the, I have the entire manuscript, and the reason why it's not published is because the Lord of State has yet to give us permission to publish it. I just want to set that record straight. So the, the, the snippet you see in well, Essence is just that, a snippet. And uh, let's see, what else do I need to say? Oh, this is my final statement, initial statement. In this book, I want to, and I think I have succeeded, in projecting Audrey and letting people see and know that she is more than those six words that she uses to describe herself. Mother, poet, feminist, black, lesbian, thousands of people in the world, women in the world, fit that description. Audrey is unique. She is a philosopher, a sage, a poetic genius. Mm -hmm. yes, I think was. I put her in the realm of male icons, Martin Luther King, the Dalai Lama, Mahatma Gandhi, and Malcolm X. And incidentally, Desmond Williams from Grenada wrote a wonderful essay in the book about Malcolm and Audrey. So what I... Um, in terms of why I put her in that realm, if you think of some of her quotes now, your silence will not protect you. Mm. And you think of the men that I mentioned, and you say, okay, Dalai Lama, what does he stand for? Mahatma Gandhi stands for this. Okay, when you hear Audrey, Audrey Lord's name, should be right there with the uh, Now, my, um, in the master's house, will never dismantle them. That's just the, Yes, it's tools. Tools, right. You know, those, those, those are philosophical. They're spacious. They're, they're, they're deep. My favorite is, my favorite quote from Audrey is, wherever the bird with no feet flew, she found a tree with no limbs. Mm -hmm. And that is as deep as you can get. It, it, it talks, you can do a whole course on that. It talks about so many things in terms of finding a place in the world using what you have in spite of what you don't have. And those are all lessons that poetry has given us. In the beginning of the book, we have is a forward. And there's no one in this world who could have written a better forward than my dear friend, Sonia. And I'm gonna ask her to read that forward from the book. Calling all women, men, children, calling all oceans, skies, clouds, butterflies, this is a love poem. I am still learning how to take joy in all the people I am, how to use all my selves in the service of what I believe, how to accept when I fail and rejoice when I succeed, for dear Lord. My room and a monastery 18 years ago was named St. Augustine. St. Augustine, in reflecting on the mystery of time, said that he knew what time was but did not elaborate. We live in two basic dimensions of time, Kronos and Kairos. Kronos time is mathematical time, measured and calculated, the time of clocks, calendars. There is also Kairos time, which is the time of the sacred, the holy, 
the inbreaking of God in the affairs of humankind. Sister Audrey, when you walked into Kairos time in the 1960s, you became holy with your love for our people, women, children, truth, and activism. You and your congregation of sisters and brothers fighting for freedom, jobs, sexual and racial and economic justice became a force of truth and encountered God. Sister Bernice Reagan told me one day about the great blues singer, Brother Montgomery, who said, we all come here naked. Black folks know it, but white folks don't know it because they come here white. White people don't come here naked. Their skin is an additional currency, puts them far ahead. He said, we all come here naked and must make arrangements with someone else while you're here, not just do for yourself. And my sister, how you made arrangements for us. We saw it in your eyes as they carried life to the people. We saw it in your hands as they revived the dead in our northern and southern moorings. You stood tall as lightning as you responded to the trumpeteers of death called colonialism, sexism, segregation, homophobia, imperialism. And your mouth caught fire as you moved us away from graveyards to our own births. You told us, reminded us of the killings of grandmothers, young women, teenage boys in America. You reminded us of our names deleted from history and history. You told us what you saw, felt, you gave us truth and called it art. James Baldwin wrote, the purpose of art is to lay bare the questions which have been hidden by the answers, and you, my sister, brought forth the questions residing in the past and present about lesbians and gays in our communities, and your answers gave us a new name, zombie, for women who work together as friends and lovers. You helped us to understand that we had to drop our twin seasons of privilege and inferiority so we could see a world free of myths and social ills. You helped us to discover not what was, but what is ellipsis, where a battle is being fought, there are hearts beating. We heard your heart beating and hearts of women beating. We heard your words that you shared with younger black women writers, not to be afraid of difference, to be real, tough, loving and to recognize each other. I can tell them not to be afraid, to feel and not to be afraid, to write about it. When you are afraid, do it anyway, because we learn to work when we are tired, so we can learn to work when we are afraid. Silence never brought us anything. Survive and teach, and that's what we got to do, and to do it with joy. Amen, a woman, amen, a woman, amen, a woman, <laughs> someone said. There's a dance, each one of us. I would say there's also light, moon, prayer, rain, ash, and river. And your dance, my sister, a river of castanets, feeling the pulse of women. And your dance, my sister, moving in and out of our American dreams, bringing bamboo laughter, lighting our eyes, our memory against peacock catastrophes. We, black women poets, you and I and others, became traveling museums a dictionary of culture and love and beauty. You, frontier woman, became the rhythm of women as you helped to erase this country's dead prints against women, blacks, children, gays, lesbians. You are morning air. You are morning air on our breaths, my dear sister. You black nightingale singing yourself into the scenes of our lives. Toni Morrison said we die. That may be the meaning of life, but we do language. That may be the measure of our lives. And my dear sister Audrey, how you did this thing called language, the measure of our lives. Picture a woman singing butterflies. She turns at her waist, surprising life. Mm. Mm. You know, 
Prophet Jimmy Bowen said, and it's a quote in, this is the beginning quote in my memoir, for while the tale of how we suffer and how we are delighted and how we may triumph is never new, it must always be heard. There isn't any other tale to tell. It's the only light we got in all this darkness. And that is what we truly understand, the kind of light that this dear sister gave us, um, this amazing light. I was remembering today they talked about um, 1968, uh, taboo, they neglected to say, towards a black university was the name of that conference. And all the people were invited to that conference. And I remember I was on the road and I came in to take my luggage to Howard University. And um, they didn't have rooms ready and I had to schlep. At that time, we didn't have rollers. So you had to schlep, you know, we carried all the way from, from the hotel, Howard's Hotel, all the way to that big hall. And I got there early and nobody was there, so I kind of got in the back. And those of you who know, I always try to sleep whenever I can get a, a little snooze. And I slouched down in the back and went to sleep. And all of a sudden, about 20 minutes later, the door opened, and in walked Audrey. But she wasn't by herself, she had a posse. And that was before we had the word posse. But she had her posse. She had 10 sisters with her. And I looked up and I said, hey, how you be? And she, yeah, no, it was, well, both, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, um, <laughs> and she looked at me and didn't say anything and kept going down. So I wiped the sleep out of my eyes and I checked my bags. And when I went down front, Audrey was sitting in the middle and her posse on either side was sitting on either side of her. So there were empty seats, but you know me, I, I got, I went in front of the sisters, right? And I said, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. And I said, so, I mean, you don't speak to me anymore? And she said, oh, Sonia. She said, you know, it, it came out yesterday, you know, that I'm a lesbian. I don't want you to get in any trouble. So I said, where do I come from? Where do, you, where, where, where do I live? She said, New York. I said, where do you live? New York, you, you think that I don't know you're a lesbian by now? <laughs> And do you think it matters? Because it's only people who really don't understand the love that some of us have for each other that it matters. Yeah. You see, like, you can't possibly love her because you ain't like her. Yeah. What kind of fool are you? I mean, what kind of nun writer are you? What kind of artist are you, huh? You know, who are you really? You know, where are you living, you know? You know, I could go down and stay with them and get into bed with them and laugh, watch the idiot box you know, together, you know, and just say, you know, like, whoa, someone carried me to bed. You know, I mean, you know, at some point, we've got to really begin to ask the question, what does it mean to be human? Yeah. Right. What, what does it really mean to be human? Not like, what do you wear? What armor do you put on? You know, what shit, excuse my French, I know I don't curse anymore, but what shit do you have on, you know, that you put on, whatever, to say, that's how I go out into the world. But I'm talking about, what does it mean to be human when you love people, you know, when you don't care, you know, I don't care who you're sleeping with. What I want to know is that, do you love me? Will you have my back when we go out into this world and fight, okay? You're going to be there for me, right? You know, that's what I'm talking about, you know. You know will you sit down when I ask you a question, when I call and say simply, whoa, this thing is really tough, but I'm going through it right now, you know, you know, and I'm really in desperate need at this point, and Audrey would send me money. Yeah. She didn't say, Sonia, you know, have you converted? <laughs> <laughs> and when I went down there, as we did on many occasions, and as we talked and laughed, and laughed at people who didn't truly understand, really, what it means to, to have begun that search for our humanity. That's what we did, you know, sitting down talking, laughing together, 
hugging each other, holding each other, saying simply, at some point, people have got to understand truly what it means to walk upright as a human being. Yeah. I mean, these are the things. So, you know, so I stood there with her and I watched that complete massacre, supposedly, of people. But, you know, I listened to our dear sister Beverly talk and some of the other sisters talk. But what they really didn't say is that, yes, it hurt what people said, but they survived it. I mean, they really did. And they came out strongly strong. I'm, I'm, I'm not just saying that, you know, as if someone, you know, but they really did survive it, you know. And people who had never even thought about it began to think about it. Oh, yeah. And began to have conversations, private conversations with each other. Did you see what happened there? And is this correct? Can I go on stage in the mall when someone talks about people who are gay or who are lesbian? I can't snicker anymore. I can't laugh. <laughs> ain't that funny? No, it ain't funny. You see, that became a conversation amongst people at some point because nobody wants to see anyone treated in that fashion, in that way. And that is very, very real. And, you know, so many of us, you know, I was saying to someone in an interview just recently that that we were I had gone to a, um, I had gone to a conference and I said I hadn't been to this conference in about 25 years I hadn't been invited back in 25 years and I mean and I knew why um, and I said because I was doing a paper you know some of you might not understand that people didn't teach black women's literature. Yeah. You know, I mean, they really did not. And when I when I was being hired, and I said what I wanted to teach, um, the professor, the chairperson said, you know, I don't know. Uh, uh, I mean, who would you teach other than Richard Wright um, and uh, it was um, Ellison? And I did this litany of names, right? And they, he said, I don't know them. That's that's it. I don't know them, whatever. And that was the key thing that was going on there. I don't know them, so how can you teach? But at some particular point, when I got out of a place called San Francisco and went to a place called Pittsburgh, one of the things that I took with me were all the poems that I used there in my, um, in my poetry classes. And I went to a place called Pittsburgh and I had people, young writers that's, uh, very, um, uh, that you all know uh, today. And I'm just, I'm, it's late, I'm having a real kind of strange moment, I'm tired. So the names are disappearing. Um, but some of the uh, younger writers who came behind us were my students there. And one day they just stayed in my office at 7.30 and I said, you know, you need to go to your dorms, I need to go home. And I said offhandedly, I think sometimes we need a course on you. And never say that to young, 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 young women at all. And this is in 1969 at the University of Pitt. And the next morning I came back, they were lined up 14 strong, said, yes, Professor Sanchez, and you should teach this course, and you know, it should be on us. And what do you think we should call it? And I said, oh, honey, we should call it the black woman, ah, huh? you know. And that was the first course that we had in a place called America on the black woman. But it didn't come from me, it came from my students. It came from their needs in a place called the University of Pitt because they didn't know what to do. They didn't know how to navigate that place. And so they needed a place to talk about that. They needed a place to be reaffirmed, you know. They needed a place to read people like Audrey and June. And they needed a place to truly understand at some point that there were women out there looking at them, looking at their problems, knowing that they have problems, and saying simply, this, is, this could be a way for you to move and walk and be. And the first, second week, I'm in that course, a young black woman stood up and said, there were 25 women in there and 25 men. I didn't know men would come, you know, to be frank, but they came. Um, and she said, I hate all black men. I was a young teacher. I've been teaching, what, three years, right? I had a syllabus that was like, you know, like, you know, set in ink. 
I went back around the desk and looked and there was no place in my syllabus that said simply, I hate all black men. <laughs> so I got from the desk, went around and I hugged her. The whole class hugged her. It was incest. I came back and wrote in the margin, incest, go to the library. You spend the whole weekend in the library because you have not put that in this. You learn so much by the teaching. That happened in a place called Pitt. That happened in a place where you began to go and say, I'm going to teach a course and you have a syllabus that is just perfect. And then students make it imperfect. And then you then go to a library and then reinforce it and say simply, these are some of the things we must talk about in a class called The Black Woman. And this is, what, this, this is the kind of thing that, that, that many of us did at some particular point as we looked at the world. This is the kind of thing that we talked about when we said, what are you going to do? This is the kind of thing that when I go to a place called Hunter College to give a lecture, and Audra's just sitting right down front, and she comes up, she said, well, you must come to my class, Sonia. <laughs> and I said, Audra, I'm going home. I'm tired. She said, oh, no, 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 you must come to my class. I told my students you were coming to my class. And so I went to her class. And all those students there were people who loved the ground that she walked on. Every time she opened her mouth, it was like, you know, they were there sucking it up. But three women came and sat in the back of the class, and I said, come and sit in our circle. And they didn't come. They wouldn't come. They would not come. So I said, okay. And so we had a class. I went home. I, when they took me to the train station, I went home to Philadelphia. And then... Two years later, I'm in a place called Washington, D.C., and I recognized one of the other sisters. Oh, you came to Audrey's, Sister Audrey's class. And she came over and hugged me, and she started to cry. She didn't cry, she sobbed. There's a difference. Mm -hmm. And I said, I must come. Let's get away from the rest of the people. And I told them to hold my books. And I went, and she said, I just have, and she sobbed, and she collapsed. And I had to hold her up. You see how big I am. And I held her up and I sat her down and I wiped her face. I said, what's, what's the deal? She said, I was sent into that class to spy on you and Sister Audrey, to tell them what you did in her class, whatever. And I said, my dear sister, if you ever, ever let any kind of ideology or philosophy make you become a spy on your own people, I will shake the living life out of you myself. I said, now, get up and know that that's not anything that you do. And that was part of that living hell that she experienced at a place called Hunter College uh, when she was teaching people literally coming in trying to see what do you do in a class where Audre Lord teaches, and what do you do when the Sonia Sanchez comes to the Audre Lord's class, and what do you do when they're in there laughing and enjoying each other, and what do you do when students are learning, women are learning, and what do you do, and what do you do, and what do you see, and what do you say, and what do you report? Sometimes we deserve what we get, you know? Yeah. And we deserve, we deserve what we get because at some point we don't break out yeah. of that crap that we've been taught already. We mouth the words, but we don't really believe the words. Yeah. And for you to mouth the words, it's got to come from the gut. You know that? Yeah. From the intestines, you know, from the heart, from the toe jam. It's got to come all the way up to here, to the mouth. And you've got to really say, I am really trying to walk upright yeah. as a human being. So therefore, as a consequence, I will look at people and see what good is in them. And if I don't always see good in them, I would then try to talk to them about why it's much better to walk upright as a human being than to slither in dirt, you know, and disrespect, you know. And it's better for us not to talk against each other. That is the reality. And you never, never in any way could understand. I don't think it's possible for you to understand at some point that when you have dear friends, when you have people who truly have looked into your heart, and seeing that as we walk on this earth, you change, you evolve. As you walk on this earth, the whole point of this is to look into other people's hearts also, and to say simply, you're my sister, you're my friend.
You know, you are the person that I have been looking for so I can tell you my dreams. So I can tell you my sorrows. So I can tell you, so you can wash me clean and say simply, we are one, we are two. And we will walk upright on this earth as human beings. When you read Audrey, you've got to see that. When you read Audrey, you got to know that because she was calling out to you, her children, her sisters, her brothers. She was calling out to you to say, simply, come on, come on, come on. You know, this is a world. It's a rough world. But you ain't got to be punks about this world. You know, this is a real world. You don't have to be gossipers about each other. This is a real world. Yeah, this is me. I told you who I am. Now, who are you? You hidden all the time with your words, with your intersections, huh? You know, you know, come on, tell me really who you are. And when you really say who you are, then we'll have a conversation about life, about love, about what it means to be human. What it really means to say sister, not just like sister, but sister, sister, sister. I dreamt about you last night. Sister, 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 I'm calling you this morning because I dreamt about you last night. Are you okay? Just listening to Sonia, we just, what came to my mind is this quote, political consciousness is knowing which side of the fence you're on. Mm -hmm. Political analysis means knowing who's there with you. much what she is talking about. People just come out with the words, oh yes, oh yes, that's wonderful, wonderful. They're just words. You know, your political consciousness, they, you know, they sound like they're on the same side of the country, you, but the political analysis, knowing who is there with you. And that's the key question. Who is there with you? You know? Lip service, lip service. As we put to action, put to action, as I frequently, frequently say, you know, change is, does not come about through meditation and prayer alone. It takes action to bring about change. And that's, you know, a play off of what uh, Sony has said. It takes action to bring about change. You know, students who, uh, and I've had a similar thing happen to me in giving a talk at a college, and these students were sitting in the front row with their notes, and uh, as I started talking, you know, they were writing notes, then I started talking about Malcolm X and different stuff, and they dropped their pencils, and they stopped taking notes, and next thing you know, they were sharing. And their professor had done the same thing, so he sent them in there to see what I was going to talk about, what I was going to have to say. So it's just a question of, uh, Having your integrity, you know what you stand for. Exactly. There you have your philosophy of life, which you have to project. And as teachers and as elders, you know, it's our role and our job to pass on this knowledge, this information, to teach the young. And another phrase I use frequently is always a learner be. Mm -hmm. Whoever is talking, they're the teacher and you're the listener. You can, no matter how ridiculous you think someone sounds, at least you, you're learning something, even if you're learning how ridiculous they are. <laughs> <laughs> can I see if anybody should get locked up in Philadelphia? I'd like to tell it. Thank you so much, sir. This is uh, uh, Sonia was part of a group called Grannies for Peace. And they decided to go into the Army recruiting station in Philadelphia to offer their bodies in exchange for the young black men and women who were going to be sent to Iraq. And so they go in 11 of them. And the people panic. They, first of all, they ask for the forms to fill out so they can join the Army. And some clerk, without thinking about it, just gave them the forms. So they proceeded to try to fill them out and say, well, what are you doing? So we're filling out these forms to join the Army. He says, no, 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 you can't, no, 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 we're gonna join the army. 
At this point, they panic and they say, we have to go and leave, and they don't leave, so then they call the police and have them arrested. Uh, I think this is kind of funny. Some of you don't think this is funny at all. Uh, so then she called up and said, when you come down, I'm having this trial, and I want your support. Now, if you only think about Philadelphia, there is no way on God's earth that they're going to lock up Sonia Sanchez, right? But Sonia wasn't so sure about that. If I'd been by myself, they would have. Yeah, 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 they weren't sure. So I go down, and it go down the night before, right? And again, we're walking down the street, you get the Chinese food, we walk past the dojo. And so he just casually mentions that, you know, I have a, you know, how's it going, sister? She says, oh, you know, I have this trial tomorrow down at the city court. The brothers got that look. You know, they were smiling, and they got, hey, this, this was the look. It was like, trial, what time? And I said, oh my God, this is, this is, We'll be there, right? These are five brothers who could kick a hole through these walls, right? They coming down to see Sonia's truck. Uh, we get there in the morning, and Mavani, Sonia's son, and I, uh, we have massive demonstrations of people all around the courthouse, uh, long lines. Uh, no white policemen in uniform, uh, black plain clothes policemen. Uh, we are blocking the sidewalk across the street and the police will walk up and say, would you please move up a bit because people want to pass on the sidewalk. So if you just move up a couple of feet, that'll be okay. I've never had a policeman speak to me with that kind of politeness in my life. Uh, and so we moved up a little bit. Uh, then we go into the courthouse and I'm, you know, Marani and I are standing behind Sonia and we go to the metal detector. You have to go through, you can't bring weapons to the courthouse. The brother running the metal detector says, Ms. Sanchez, can you wait a minute? My wife is on the third floor. I want her to come down and take a picture. <laughs> right? We the, there's a lot of people behind us waiting to go to the metal detector, and they have to wait so his wife can come down from the third floor so he can take a picture with Sonia going through the metal detector. Right? She is not going to jail in this court. Right? Uh, we get into the courtroom. Uh, we have to walk across maybe uh, you know ten rows of people who are already there. There's this buzz. Why are you here? So I saw you supposed to reach everybody. And brother said, We're criminals. We're supposed to be here. Why are you here? Right? And so you get this undertone of hostility kind of building in there, like, why is she here? Like this something ain't right, you know. So the, there's already this buzz of, of you know people that are very upset that Sonia's even in the courthouse. Uh, and so we sit down, uh, having a look at the boys from the dojo and the rest of the court. I said, Mariah, we're going to sit in the back row. So when all hell breaks loose, we'll be in the back. So you be up front with the granny, so they'll probably be safe. But it was not a very pleasant possibility, right? Uh, black woman walks out as the judge. I said, Mariah, put on your coat. We'll be out of here in 10, 15 minutes, tops. Right? Sister comes out, turns to the prosecution. Then asked him anything. Asked the defense to state why do they think they are here? It's not the way courts work. So they got to state why they were arrested. And then she turns to the prosecutor and says, Why did you arrest them? And she said, They were trying to join the army. She said, Was it an army recruiting station? She said, Yes, it was. Was it doing office hours? Yes, it was. And what law did they break? She said, Well, they left some leaflets on the floor. She said, well, that's, that's literary. And dismissed it. And the poor prosecutor was a woman who was about two months out of law school, who was at the bottom of the prosecuting thing, because none of the real prosecutors were going to stand up in any court and say they were, you know, persecuting some of those So they, they sacrificed this poor, you know, I felt sorry for her. Because she was trembling the whole time, and she would, couldn't make a case. She didn't have a case. And the judge dismissed the thing in about, you know, what, about 15 minutes, 10, 15 minutes. Uh, and when we started to kind of make noise, she said, shut up, you're not on TV. Uh, and then we proceeded to walk out, and as we were walking out, two things were kind of interesting. One is the brother sitting across the aisle from Iran, and he said, uh, can you stay? Because I've got my case covered, and I can use some of this help, too. <laughs> uh, and the second thing was, when we walked out into the hallway, after everybody was leaving, this black policeman walked up again in plain clothes, and said, are you satisfied? Are you satisfied with the way things went today? And I said, yeah, like Sister Sonia and the women are free. Like, I'm, I'm having to say, good, this is, what, this is what we wanted to have. 
We didn't want anything. We, want, we didn't want anything to happen. You know. Uh, and that's that was nice. That was yeah. nice, John. But also yeah. in yeah. the city of Philadelphia, yeah. it's an amazing place that yeah. they, you know, stop and frisk and they yeah. lock people up. Yeah. And also when when there were three people who went in to speak for Brother Mumia. Yeah. The rest of the city did not say a word in defense of Mumia. Mm -hmm. um, I went in to speak <coughs> for Brother Mumia, and for one year, I was followed by police. Every place I went, a police car followed me, and they usually stopped me, and they would ask for my license, and I would give it to them, and they would, I would sit for 15 and 20 minutes, and they'd bring it back and hand it to me. You know, so I, my experience with police and being out demonstrating also when they came and rushed us was a completely different experience, uh, period. But I also know one night when I had my children coming from Temple very late, and I came up with the Hickett Avenue there in Philadelphia, and I was pulled over again, and the children were sleeping in the back of the car, it was so late. And I rolled down my windows, it was a black policeman and I looked up and said, you know, you really should be ashamed of yourself. I mean, you really should be ashamed of yourself. You know, do you really get great fun, kicks, jollies, you know, out of, uh, you know, looking at my license every time that I'm stopped. Every time I go out, I go out of my house, you know, I am stopped. And so he walked away, went into the car, sat for 10 minutes, drove away, and they stopped doing that, they stopped following me at that point. But it, that was a whole year. So yeah, when I, when I said to you, you know, uh, we have a case um, that they said, that simply the lawyer said that, you know, you all could get a year for this, you know? So I mean, I, I take policemen very seriously, you know, being in, in coming out of New York Corps, I take them seriously. I don't doubt that they can do some stuff. So I, I assume they can do the worst, whatever. I'm very happy when the worst does not happen, people, okay? And I was very happy at that particular point that nothing terrible happened, right? But the point is simply that in the midst of that, um, uh, you know, with the, with the judge that was there, with the good lawyer, you had one of the best lawyers in the city of Philadelphia, um, and with this young lawyer at some particular point, it was a possibility at some particular point maybe that um, they would let us go, but it also had to do with the rest of, you know, we had a, 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 a woman who was in her 90s there, you know, and then the rest of us, you know, were, you know, in the 70s, 80s, you know, 90s, whatever. So I assume that at some point they figure they get really bad PR locking up, you know, grannies at some particular point. Um, but, you know, I, I guess one of the things, shall I read what I did at the, at the, yeah, at the um, since Audrey had this memorial in, in New York City, um, at uh, St. John's with the Vine and, and on Amsterdam Avenue, that's where Jimmy also had his memorial, his, his burial. Um, and uh, Sister Angela and um, Audrey's daughter and myself, we spoke there. And when we finished speaking, all of the people in that church, it was packed, had a candle, right? You know, and the candle was lit. and it, it was a most amazing moment, you know, you could you could just um, hear Audrey saying, you know, yeah, this works, you know, this is good, whatever. Uh, because if it hadn't been good, it would have stopped, by the way. The candles would have gone out, and I would have known that she blew those bloody candles out because she didn't like the way it went. But it went, it went well. I spirit was there. Yeah, because in the beginning, um, when I... <laughs> You read in the book that the, you know, the wind came from the Hudson right up to the building and went into the church and it blew down the picture of Audrey on the altar. Mm -hmm. So the wind, that's why the book is called The Wind of Spirit because there's a lot of um, incidents in the book with the different sto stories that people tell which reflect the wind as being spirit. You know, and it, the postscript is an amazing story, which is it's a true story. The, um, a box, the trunk that Audrey had brought from Staten Island to St. Croix was on the porch. And just to make the long story short, the way that box was blown open as a psychic and a healer, uh, 
and energy where we finally came to look at it. We called them over because we couldn't understand how this box had moved and the side of it was totally blown out with the force that the nails were still out and it was facing where her grave site is. And um, as he finished, as he looked at it, he said, there's no question about it, that's a spirit. It's a spirit. And um, the way it was blown out, it was facing the grave site that um, where some of all these ashes are spread. So um, back to now, I just want to tell you that part in terms of the wind being spirit, the wind, the wind, it just comes through a lot. So um, yes, at the celebration, some and, and we took, took it, and uh, we took uh, some of the ashes of Hawaii. Oh, that right, oh, yeah. yeah. It's just scattering the ashes. It's another <laughs> amazing stories because Audrey said she wanted, when we visited Hawaii once, she said she wanted her ashes stone in Pele's crater. And you know, and I said, okay, just like that, as simple as that. And sure enough, we went, a group of us went back to Hawaii and we were, had the, um, we were very fortunate to know a Hawaiian kahuna named Don, Don Watson, and she, conducted a ceremony, we did a ritual before, and early in the morning at dawn, we went to the Pele's crater and spread some of her ashes. And did, we did a ceremony. And then we, oh, this was the other one. Mm -hmm. We went to, there's a place in Hawaii called the Women's Place, and it's used for birth, for healing, for meetings. And this uh, Women's Place was in the path of a new highway that was going to be built in Hawaii, but the women protested and they were successful in getting the government to redirect the highway around the women's place. And this is another place that we spread some of Audrey's ashes. And again, Sony was one of the participants in that also. And um, it's a very, very dramatic, very meaning, meaningful, of course, and spiritual. And um, back now to Sony reading at the um, ceremony celebration at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine in New York. <clears throat> Sonia, mm -hmm. can read that please. Death is a five o'clock door, forever changing time. I wrote those lines for Shirley Graham Du Bois in 1977, Audrey, and now I lend them to you, my sister, these words with no eyes, these words with no nostrils, these words with no ears. Now I dress them up like a musician so they can see you home, so they can accompany you as you move surrounded by village voices among the scent of tongues singing, hey, 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 you, 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 you. What to say to you now? Tommy in the soft afternoon air, as you hold us all in a scene of death, only that we are always trying to return to her, our mother, this earth woman. We are always trying to plant our blood in her soil. We are always waiting for her song. We sing, will you let me in today, mother? Is it time? We sing, mother, maha, ma, madre, mea, mama, sita, mama, 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 ma, let me in. I have finally come back to you. We say today is today. I see you. I see you whistling your tall walk. Son, you, warrior of the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, you, philosopher of our blackest politics called life and literature. interesting thing, it is late. And one of the things that I did in this book, everyone knows I write longhand, right? Mm -hmm. And in this book, I, that was the first version, isn't that amazing, of the piece I did for her. And then I changed it. And so I need very much, if you don't mind, to start again. And it's an amazing thing when you're tired. For Audrey Lord, 
born February 18, 1934, died November 17, 1992, at her memorial, June, January 17, 1993. Woke up this morning with my eyes on Sister Audrey. Woke up this morning with my eyes on Sister Audrey. Woke up this morning with my eyes on Sister Audrey. Gonna live, gonna love, gonna resist just like her. Death is a five o'clock door for ever-changing time. I wrote these lines for Shirley Bam the Boys in 1977, Sister Audrey. And now I lend them to you, my sister, these words with no eyes, these words with no nostrils, these words with no ears. Now I dress them up like a musician so they can see you home, so they can accompany you as you move surrounded by the voices of village women, as you move across the scent of tongues singing, hey, 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 in this soft afternoon air as you hold us all in a single death, only that we are always trying to return to her, our mother, this earth woman. We are always trying to plant our blood in her soul. We are always waiting for her song we sing. Will you let me in today, mother? Is it time? We sing mother, mama, madre, mama, mama, sister, mama, 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 let me come sleep in your bed. I have finally come back home to stay. Mm -hmm. We sing, today is Tuesday, and I have passed by my life on my way home to you. I have walked since midnight, and my eyes are anointed with indigo. We sing amen, amen, a woman, a woman, a woman, a woman. Yes, I see you, Gamma Adisa, measuring your death, head cocked, warrior of the word, philosopher of our blackest womanist literature, mechanic of our sanest dreams. Yes, I see you representing our tribes, inciting all women to rise against oppression sexism, alibis, homophobia, showing us women mutilated from an embrace, women and children's faces dead on our living streets. Yes, I see you, sister warrior of the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 20th century, dissolving the pain that breaks women into children, coming towards us with love from the deep eyes of our women, coming towards us with butterflies coming out of your womb, and spring will come again out of this cold winter, my dear sister Audrey. I shall honor you well, as all sisters must do as we live. I shall bring peace to your ashes as I carve above your head your name, our names, our living ago resistors. Hey, 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 oh, yeah, yeah, Toussaint, Fanu, Pena, Nat Turner, Sojourner, MLK, William Nelson Mandela, Sweet Honey in the Rock, Martin Delaney, Queen Mother Moore, Lamuba, Sister Angela Davis, June Jordan, Nkrumah, Ida Wells Barnett, W.B. Du Bois, Shirley Graham Du Bois, Paul Rosen, Alice Walker, C.L. James, William Brooks, Chancellor Williams, Cheryl Clark, Paula Giddings, Akasha, Gloria Hull, John Killens, Margaret Walker, Septon Clark, Funda Ella Baker, Barbara Smith, Tony Morrison, Betty Shabazz, Tony Camp Barbara, Gloria Joseph, Janetta Cole, Bernice Regan, Audrey, Zami, Gamladisa, Olakum, 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 prepare the morning next to receive her. Gamma Adisa is returning. Sister, we will continue to improve this earth, make it better in your name, in your spirit. We will carry you always in our eyes, and it'll get better. Because they are still there, our children, our women our girls, our boys, young men oppressed and killed, listen to their cries. Baba, Baba, Mama, 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 they have me in this detention center. They have killed one of our comrades and no one knows we hear Baba, Baba, Dada, Mama. They are sending electricity to my private parts and I am dying and I move like a marionette. He, 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 da, 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 da. Mama, 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 Mama. I am only 13, 14, 15 years old. Someone please remember.
like me here in South Africa. Yeah, yeah. Mama Sita, Mama Sita, Mama Sita, they have stretched me out on the ground. And I think, I think, I think, maybe yes, so I think that it is the 12th one who has entered my, me, me, and my blood. Blood, blood spills on the ground, and the soldiers are eating and singing and dancing and laughing. I don't want to die. Mama Sita. I think maybe it's so, maybe it's so. It is the 33rd one who has entered me and I cannot move and my bones are growing in the soil. And I'm only 12 years old, 13 years old, 14 years old, 15 years old. <laughs> daddy, 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 mama, 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 where you at? They are fired on us in the basement and the fire is moving towards us, burning our skins. And I cannot breathe here in Philadelphia and my locks are burning. Philadelphia, I don't want to die. I'm only seven years old, eight years old, nine years old, 10 years old, 12 years old. And we must turn the cries of our young sisters and brothers into green laughter. So come on, brothers and sisters, in the spirit of Audrey, for the love of Audrey and respect for her work and her life. You say you love her, then do the work. Organize and unite. Come on, African Americans, Latinos, and Asians, and whites, and Native Americans, Chicanos, and gays, and bisexuals, and, 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 and unite lesbians, and, and unite transgenders, and unite and organize because, because, because it will get better. Because Audrey helped make it better. It will get better. Organize. Unite. Organize. Unite. Love yourself. Love each other. Organize and unite and it'll get better. eBay! eBay! Gamda Adisa, 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 Gamma, Adisa, Audrey, Lord. We love you. Church, we would say the spirit is in the house, and we had service today. Yeah, because uh, Howard Thurman once said, "The place where men and women meet to seek the highest is holy ground." And for 12 hours a day, we are in the holy ground. Uh, it's hard to see how you can listen to what you listen to today, and learn what you've learned today, and then walk out and go back to doing things that don't make any sense, or go back to negativity or hurting people or uh, petty kind of silliness that don't help the world move to a better place. Uh, and the purpose of gatherings like this, the purpose of why we pull together uh, all this amazing group of uh, women and men to talk about the importance of, of feminism, black feminism, and the history of, of black feminism is that it's the, the way forward and the uh, for years I've been telling people that this is, to me it's a simple kind of mathematical question uh, the majority of people on the planet are women of color then if you believe in democracy then the planet ought to be run by women of color you know it seems very simple right? but it's not complicated about that to me uh, and if we're not moving toward that, then what are we moving toward? And it certainly can't be democracy, right? And so you measure that by how you increase, you know, the power of uh, women and women of color to make the decisions and decide how the planet will be governed and how resources will be used. 
uh, and anything short of that is not going to get it. You know, uh, and Du Bois said that in 1922 in the damnation of women in dark water. He said that you know, women ought to take over the world because men have had it for 10,000 years and look at what we have done to it. So this is not altruism. This is to save the planet. If we're not doing this as a favor to nobody, you know, this is the way to save the planet. You know, the the, uh, the people who do the work and who uh, set the paths forward, who move things forward, should be the ones to make the decisions about how we move. Uh, and it means that, that men should just get out of the way. You know, uh, I know it's hard because we think we should be in the front, but we've been in the front and we headed over a cliff. So uh, maybe we should get in the back and maybe not go over cliffs. Uh, and it, it's, it's, it's hard, but that's, that to me is what the future of the world is going to be. If we're going to have a future on this planet, that, that, the, that what we're doing now, the, the, the structures of, 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 of uh, oppression and all their multiplicities, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're in a pretty critical kind of stage right now. And so the, the not so hidden agenda of pulling together all the, the people that we brought today was to, in a number of ways, try to make that point and have you see that and feel that uh, and hopefully start to act on that. If you are, you are a woman, you'll be energized by the fact that women, you know, uh, this is your charge, this is your responsibility, this is your world, you have to make it what you want. Uh, and to get enough men to start to do that so that you don't have to do it by yourself. You know, and it's our responsibility too. You know, uh, and uh, the salvation of the planet for women is not just for women. You know, that's a cop out. You know, well, it's just going to take all of us, and we just have to know who's going to lead and who's going to follow and how we're going to move forward together. And that's what we hope the day uh, they accomplished. And if we did just a little bit of that, we, you know, we are, we are satisfied. And so we've been going on. This has been a 12-hour day, as far as I like to tell them. Uh, and so we gotta, where's Mecca? Mecca's somewhere out there. Come on. Come on up. And, and before we go, you know, Mecca and I did the work, but the audio document is out here. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, the, the seed came from Arlene's not here. Arlene Abaki, who was one of the active in women's studies on this campus for years, after June had passed and would come every year and say, We have to do something about June Joy. We have to do something about June Joy. Uh, and then she retired and said, You're going to have to do something about June Joy. And so Rebecca showed up and I just said, Ah, I got somebody to help me with June Joy money. And so I just mentioned it. Next thing I know, Rebecca's in my office. When do we start? I said, Whoa, I was just like, I did. Uh, it wasn't like I was going to do it right away. And so the process speeded up drastically. Uh, and 